honourable senators, the president. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Senator Minchin. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Thanks, Minchin. Mr President. I wish to inform the Senate that the Coalition has decided to appoint a second Deputy Whip and I'm pleased to announce that Senator David Bushby has been elected unopposed to that position. Clark. Government business notice the motion number one, standing the same in the name of Senator Ludwig for the second reading of a bill. Senator Ludwig. The question is the motion moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye, against say no. I think the eyes have it. Oh, you're supposed to be speaking to. Oh, I, I looked and no one stood. Send a Bernardi. Oh, well, well, I, I, I shall. I, thank you, Mr. President. It, I shall be very I brief. I wasn't uh, trying to deny you the right to speak. Send a Bernardi. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, I shall be brief because we have uh, visited this legislation before. Um, the coalition stands by its previous comments in that we have grave concerns about the watering down of the compliance measures and mutual obligation requirements for employment services. Um, no doubt the, uh, there will be some amendments being moved during the committee stage, and we'll have uh, a further contribution to make in that regard. All right. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Ludwig be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law related to social security and for related purposes. In committee. Yeah, I can't tell you. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. The Greens have amendments. I, just see what I, like to... I understand that there are amendments from Senator Seawood. Senator Seawood. Do you, you are going to propose an amendment? Yes, I am. I've got the amendments have been circulated. In the previous amendments were circulated. I understand a previous uh, revi uh, Sorry. Uh, pre an Further revision of amendments have been circulated in the chamber, or just about to be circulated in the chamber. Yes, I, I believe they have been. Uh, I don't yet have that running sheet in front of me. Do you, do you wish to move your amendment, Senator Seward? Uh, you wish to move your amendment? Uh, sorry, Chair. There's a series of amendments. I'm looking at sheet 5655, revised 2. Um, just to clarify what uh, amendments we are referring to. Yeah. As I said, I'm hoping they have been circulated in the chamber, and I propose moving them in a series of amendments. As I said, there's a series of amendments. Yeah. I understand Senator Xenophon has amendments also. Yes. Well, we have Did, not yet got revised 2, we have two. Not yet got revised two Senator Seward. So. Perhaps she'd just like to speak to her Would, would you like to, to speak to your amendments in general and we will await the arrival of the running sheet? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, these, as I, I think I should remind the Chamber as to um, where we were at during this debate because, quite rightly, we've jumped to committee as a whole rather than revisiting our second reading speeches. Yes, that, that um, so, and I, I anticipate that the um, Chamber assistants thought that we would do a little bit more second reading than we did. Um, so, if I can just recap where we're up to, um, the Greens in general are supportive of this bill. We are, I articulated that um, during the second reading speech. 
Um, this bill makes what we believe are very important amendments to the previous uh, welfare to work arrangements. It actually is, we think, bringing into, putting into place a uh, much more fairer approach to people um, that are on a new start and are also looking for work. It improves the compliance um, regime, we believe, um, for people on new start. Um, it, it puts, I think it's in place a potentially much fairer system. However, there are some issues that during the committee inquiry um, came up, such as, well, for a start, um, the Greens are still um, very deeply opposed to the eight-week breaching process. But there are a number of issues that came up during the, during the inquiry process which um, were, um, uh, I think, uh, very important suggestions, um, such as, for example, how we deal with homelessness, um, the timing of uh, deductions when there's a, what, what's going to be put in place is no show, no pay. Thank you. We now have a running order. Um, uh, no show, no pay. The implications that, that brings, um, the discretion around um, the discretion that job link, the job uh, network and uh, pr and pr uh, providers uh, can apply. Um, the discretion of Centrelink, um, hardship provisions, uh, reconnection, um, the compliance, uh, the comprehensive compliance assessment, when that kicks in, how it will be carried out. Um, the, what, uh, and if people will recall during that debate, we were also talking about the fact that there's now f about four different uh, compliance, uh, compliance approaches or disconnection of, of approaches, and we wanted some. Uh, continuity or some, some refinement there. So the Greens are proposing a series of amendments um, which we believe deal with some of the thank you, more serious um, aspects um, it, or what we see as, as flaws in the legislation. I did at the time congratulate the government and I do still congratulate the government for a moving this bill in the first place and making what I think and what the Greens think are very important amendments. But also I'd like to comment on the fact that I appreciate the interaction that we've had with the Minister's Office on this. Um, the Minister's Office has been very open um, to negotiation to discussions over concerns that community have raised. The issues that we raise are in response to community concerns both raised during the committee inquiry but also in correspondence and I believe, uh, in, in correspondence to both my office and um, other offices and I do appreciate the fact that there's been meaningful engagement with the minister's office and um, I, I understand they'll be agreeing to some of our amendments, but I also understand that we're going to agree to disagree on a number of amendments because the Greens do strongly believe that the, the number one foundation, the number one point here with, where the government and the coalition seem to agree is that is it's acceptable in this country to have an eight-week eight -week breaching process um, where uh, people um, have no income support for eight weeks. We don't think that's appropriate. Um, and we'll continue to um, try and get changes there. Um, so, under the running order here, the first I'd like I'd now. Get, uh, it's actually uh, not my amendment first. Yes, that, that's correct, Senator Seward. The first amendment that I have on the running sheet is opposition amendment, and I will ask um, Senator Bernardi to move that, to, and we will deal with that first. So, Senator Bernardi. Um, Chair, thank you for the call. Um, I'm waiting for some advice in regard to uh, this amendment um, because my advice was that we were to expect an earlier amendment to come along. Um, I'd request the Chair's indulgence, and I'm not sure where we should proceed from this point immediately. Madam Chair, in which case they are amending Schedule 1. Well, yes, the, the difficulty is, Senator Bernardi, that your amendment is to oppose Schedule 1, whereas the Green amendments in the first instance um, want to amend Schedule 1. Senator Xenophon. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, if I could make some general comments, I was of the misunderstanding that there would be a, uh, an opportunity to, uh, uh, to give an effect a second reading uh, speech again. Uh, if, uh, May, with your indulgence, to uh, give an outline of, of my position, because a lot's happened when this matter was last before uh, the Senate last December. Uh, can I indicate uh, 
that previously I did not support the second reading, and I outlined those reasons. Since that time, I have had extensive opportunities to have uh, discussions with both the government and the opposition uh, and the Australian Greens in relation uh, to this. Um, that, uh, my position is that uh, changes are necessary to the current legislation, that the legislation introduced by the Howard government, um, some would say it was anomalous in parts and relatively inflexible, particularly in relation to the three strikes and you're out for eight weeks provision. There was a concern about that, uh, and I think it's been acknowledged uh, fairly broadly that it was anomalous that if you were breached uh, and lost your benefits for the equivalent of eight weeks as a consequence of failing to participate uh, in a job-seeking program, for instance, there was no requirement in that eight-week period that you were breached to actually continue to participate, and many saw that as an anomaly. And I also think it's uh, important to note that the job market has changed, and that is something that uh, no one would have foreseen uh, a year or two years ago, or even six months ago, uh, with forecasts of 300,000 Australians losing their job as a result of the global financial crisis. And I think it's important that there's a, gra a greater degree of flexibility uh, and um, uh, that there is a more nuanced approach with respect to employment services. And that's why I am grateful for the time that I've spent uh, both uh, with the minister uh, and his advisers and also, uh, uh, and indeed, uh, I've had a number of good discussions with the opposition shadow uh, on this and his office. Uh, I'm concerned, the principal concerns I've had in relation to this legislation uh, are as follows. Firstly, in relation to the requirement that, uh, that uh, there, be, there are six failures rather than three before there is a comprehensive compliance assessment. Um, I believe that is simply too, uh, that simply is, is uh, too high a threshold, uh, that it is not reasonable for there to be six uh, failures, uh, six no-shows um, in the course of six months before there is a more uh, a comprehensive compliance assessment. And I can emphasise as, as, as to how I understand it, this is quite different uh, from automatically losing your, your benefits for a period of eight weeks. There will be an assessment process where there will then be a decision as to whether you lose your benefits or not. And I think that it's important to have that uh, nuanced approach in the context of uh, a worsening job market. But I also think it's unreasonable for there to be six failures in a period of six months. That simply uh, seems quite extraordinary. If you fail to attend six uh, uh, job interviews or, or six uh, meetings with your employment service provider, um, um, then that to me doesn't seem to be an incentive for those that are deliberately uh, trying to uh, rort or, or play the system. Uh, and having also said that, there is support amongst uh, welfare rights groups uh, that uh, having the threshold cutting in at three uh, failures in a period of six months is, will also help those who have a genuine problem, who aren't deliberately uh, avoiding or shirking their responsibilities in the system, but who may have a mental health problem, a substance abuse problem, um, a gambling problem, uh, those people that clearly need some help. And uh, I've been heartened to hear from uh, a major welfare rights group in this country to advise my office that they believe that, that it would be a good thing to, to have that comprehensive compliance assessment being triggered off at an earlier stage. Uh, and I think that it's important uh, that uh, that be considered. Now, as I understand it, there was discussions with, with the government, uh, with the, between the government and, uh, in relation to this. Um, I'll await to hear uh, as to what the minister will say about this. As I understand it, the government is, uh, has considered this issue that the threshold be reduced from six to three. And I think it will have the the combined effect for those that are deliberately avoiding their responsibilities, uh, and there are some people, there are always some in the system, any system that try and, and, and rort their uh, uh, responsibilities, uh, rort the system, they will be picked up earlier. But to me, more importantly, for those that have a, a mental health problem, a substance abuse problem, or other problem, uh, they will be able to be assessed uh, and to be given a hand up as a result of a comprehensive compliance assessment. Uh, and I think that. Uh, um, uh, given the rising uh, tide of unemployment, I think it's important that that, that approach be adopted. There's also the, there's also the issue uh, of the uh, legislative instruments, and I understand the opposition's uh, had some significant concerns with respect to uh, giving this broad discretion, if you like, to uh, 
uh, to the government, to the department, to deal with these legislative instruments. My concern has principally been one of scrutiny. And in relation to this, um, as I understand it, and I'll, I'll await uh, the minister's undertakings in this regard, that in relation to the, the changes to, to the participation regi uh, regime, there will be uh, uh, at least uh, some two months' notice to have those uh, instruments uh, tabled or presented so that the Senate has an opportunity to see them uh, and to scrutinise them before they are due to come into effect, uh, because they will be disallowable instruments. But the other aspect of that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, is that uh, my preference would be that there be enshrined uh, in legislation an opportunity to, uh, um, uh, to ensure that a legislative instrument doesn't come into force until there's been an opportunity for at least, say, six sitting days to ensure that uh, it's uh, appropriately scrutinised. Now, I don't, as I understand it, that's not the government's position, and they say that it would be relatively unprecedented, and we'll hear from the minister on that shortly. But my view is that it's important that there be a, uh, a degree of scrutiny, and I look forward to the government's undertakings uh, in that regard. The final matter that, uh, that uh, I have uh, uh, to deal with relates to that of a review. There will be very significant changes as a result of what the government is proposing uh, with respect to, uh, uh, to the way that uh, job seekers are treated in terms of the sanctions and the like. Uh, and I agree that there is scope. There is certainly need for change, uh, particularly given the inflexibility of, uh, of some of the measures uh, uh, of the previous government, and also acknowledging that the job market is, has significantly worsened since uh, the previous regime has been in uh, the previous uh, set of rules have been in place. Uh, that's why I'll be moving an amendment uh, uh, shortly, and hopefully will be circulated shortly to the effect uh, that there be a comprehensive review. I understand uh, the, the Greens uh, will be moving for review. I think it's important that there be uh, a review about, in respect of these changes and also broadly looking at the interface between state and federal uh, agencies. There's a concern uh, that's been put to me by, by welfare and other groups that there are people that fall through the cracks. And they fall through the cracks because, for instance, of substance abuse, because of a mental health problem and that uh, there, there is still work to be done in relation to the interface between state and federal government agencies. Um, and I agree uh, that uh, what, needs, uh, what needs to be done here uh, is there has to be change, but I think it's appropriate that there be a thorough review of these changes, uh, which are very significant changes, so that we can see how the system is working and how it can be improved. And that, uh, will be, that essentially is a thrust uh, uh, of my amendment. Uh, but if I can say in summary, Madam Chair, that, uh, that um, uh, if people are willfully and deliberately avoiding work, then we need to be firm. And I think that uh, going from six to three uh, failures in a six-month period is fairer. And that doesn't mean that someone will lose their benefits. It simply means there will be a comprehensive compliance assessment if, as I suspect, there will be many cases of people not complying because of their, uh, because of their individual circumstances. Uh, then I think it's important that, uh, that there be a process in place to assist those people. Um, and uh, uh, I would like to think that a review would be an integral part of ensuring that this legislation is appropriately scrutinised by uh, an independent panel uh, with expertise in these matters and to report to the parliament uh, in the latter part of next year. I think that's, uh, that would be a fair uh, and robust way of dealing with these important changes. So that's a summary of my uh, position, Madam Chair, and I look forward to the uh, uh, committee deliberating on this matter. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, listening to Senator Xenophon and uh, Senator Seward uh, um, reinforces the coalition's concerns that this, uh, this bill has a number of very deep flaws in it. Um, our original proposal was to excise the bill, um, and we foreshadowed these amendments, and indeed they are circulated as, uh, as um, on the notice paper um, which has been circulated through the chamber. Well, after consideration of um, Senator Xenophon's and, uh, and Senator Seward's um, foreshadowed amendments, uh, the coalition uh, will not be proceeding with moving this amendment, uh, the first amendment, um, on the basis that we are prepared to work to uh, improve, um, some would say salvage, um, a bill which is uh, deeply flawed, and I think that's been acknowledged by 
um, the cross benches and the opposition today. So we will uh, consider. Uh, we withdraw uh, Amendment One, standing in our name, and um, we'll consider the other amendments on their merits. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you. It's uh, pleasing to see that the opposition are now constructively dealing with this legislation, and that uh, it appears that they are moving towards supporting the legislation. Uh, in terms of uh, responding to uh, Senator Xenophon, it, it may be worthwhile putting down uh, a range of issues uh, now. Uh, if I could say it this way, the new compliance system recognises that job seekers are not always solely responsible for their circumstances. It does not seek to punish job seekers unnecessarily. Rather, it will uh, maximise job seekers' participation in activities that will help them get a job. And of course, while these, uh, while these changes to the compliance regime were drafted uh, well before the onset of the global economic recession, it is more important uh, now uh, to than ever uh, to keep job seekers actively engaged in activities that will help them find and keep sustainable employment. The bill. Uh, does introduce a more work-like uh, no-show, no-pay penalty that will apply when a job seeker fails to comply with training or work experience without a reasonable excuse. It does retain as a deterrent eight-week non-payment penalties for persistent and willful non-compliance. Uh, the current system uh, has not uh, improved compliance. It does not provide a timely uh, and proportionate response. It makes it harder for people to find employment and the lack of discretion in the current system means an uh, inevitably, uh, inevitably harsh outcomes. But if I could put it in this framework, the compliance system proposed by the bill allows us to distinguish between someone who does not want to uh, meet their obligations and someone who cannot meet their obligations, unlike uh, the present automatic uh, three-strike rule. A job seeker uh, and this goes to the heart of I think what Senator Xenophon was uh, referring to. A job seeker will trigger a comprehensive compliance assessment when they miss three appointments or three days of activities in a rolling six-month period. An eight-week non-payment penalty will apply only, only if the prior failures were intentional, recklessly or negligently. This, of course, means that a serious failure will not apply based on a prior incident of non-compliance for which the job seeker had a reasonable excuse. Uh, Centrelink and employment providers, and I think this also goes to what uh, Senator Xenophon was seeking clarification on, will have discretion in how to respond to job seekers' behaviour. A provider can report non-compliance but can also use alternative means, that is, alternative means of maintaining participation. Ultimately, it is about ensuring people get a job and stay in it. If they, and of course, it means uh, if they reasonably believe that there is a better way to ensure a particular job seeker is moving towards employment. No failure will apply if the job seeker has a reasonable excuse for their non compliance. The impact of the job seeker's personal circumstances on their capacity to comply will be considered in determining whether the job seeker has a reasonable excuse. Uh, this would, of course, include homelessness, as defined by the Australian Bureau of Statistics mental illness or caring responsibilities. And in particular, uh, in response to the Senate Committee's recommendations, the government will review the effectiveness of vulnerable vulnerability indicators and associated guidelines to ensure that they protect uh, the most troubled job seekers. And of course, uh, the Senate Committee, and can I say the uh, government appreciates the work of the Senate Committee, it uh, has uh, examined that report in detail and uh, thanks the, both the chair and the committee for the work that they have done. The Senate committee also emphasised the importance of job seekers understanding their obligations under the new compliance system, and the government will ensure appropriate levels of training for Centrelink and employment service providers and adopt a strategy targeted at communicating changes to all job seekers. The government does believe uh, strongly in an evidence-based approach to policy and therefore will collect a comprehensive data to monitor and report on the effectiveness of the new compliance system. The government also appreciates the broad community interest in the effects of the compliance policy. For those reasons, we will conduct a review of the impact of the new compliance system after 12 months of operation. Just on that point, though, it would be helpful if both 
uh, and forgive me for putting it this way, if the uh, Greens and Senator Xenophon can agree on a, a, agree on a set of words, if that's possible, uh, it would then avoid the uh, government trying to pick and the opposition being placed in that position of trying to also choose. Uh, we have outlined that we do accept a 12-month review. It's the uh, detail that might go into it. We do uh, prefer the Greens, but I didn't really want to say that at this point. Uh, so I don't want to disappoint Senator Xenophon in respect of that, but uh, it, it, it may be worth making it at least plain uh, what, what the government's view is so that there is no uh, confusion. Uh, in con in, uh, in uh, wrapping up at this point, the new employment services will provide uh, job seekers with the right mix of training, work experience and other support they need to find and keep work. The new compliance arrangement and other measures proposed by this bill uh, will, of course, form an important part of the new system. It is a, uh, a key component of the government's important participation agenda, and, uh, and I know we're going to deal with a range of amendments at this uh, point, but I hope that provides uh, some outline of the government's uh, position in respect of the broader uh, number of amendments that we'll deal with in committee and the response that we've made uh, to those as a way of uh, at least opening the uh, committee stage of the bill and providing direction. Senator Seawitt. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I thank the Minister. Um, I have a series of general questions following on from the Minister's response there that I would like to ask prior to getting into the detail. Perhaps I would um, just clarify the position on the review that the Minister just asked the question. Um, the Greens have been talking to Senator Xenophon. Um, Senator Xenophon, as I understood it, has slightly modified his amendment, and we are happy to support Senator Xenophon's uh, review. So, so <laughs> you were seeking clarification, Senator uh, Minister. I don't think you like the clarification that much, but there you go. <laughs> um, perhaps I could now ask um, some questions, and maybe I could go to a couple of the issues that were at the end of my list that, in fact, the minister has just touched on just then, and ask questions around them, those issues. And one is the education. Um, uh, campaign or the issue around information provision that the minister um, touched on um, in terms of making sure that the um, job service pr the providers and Centrelink were well informed of the amendments to this legislation. But also it's very important that um, job seekers are also well informed. And I'm wondering at how the, or the level of resources the government is going to commit to that education, when it is going to start and how it is going to proceed. And uh, I will just also indicate now, I appreciate the minister may not have all those details, but the Greens want to be assured that this is in fact going to happen and I am wondering what mechanism can be undertaken to ensure that there is that we are informed of, what's going, of the education campaign that is going to be undertaken. Minister. Thank you. Just a, a clarification might be uh, helpful, uh, uh, Senator Seawitt. When you uh, talk about the resources, um, and I guess you might say both, but are you specifically uh, trying to identify the resources that go into education and training, or those resources which go into advising job seekers of uh, the availability of and how this system works? I'm after what what particular resources are being committed to to information provision around these specific uh, changes because it is a, it is a quite it's still a complex piece of legislation. There are various compliance mechanisms or non-compliance and, and failure mechanisms. Um, so perhaps so we're after what's being done within for the Centrelink, um, the job network providers, and job seekers. So uh, across the board. Um, in terms of particularly understanding what their new, requ what their new um, requirements are on job seekers and compliance requirements. Because, as I said, it is a quite a complex piece of legislation um, and it, there's various ways that people could in fact be non-compliant. Minister. Yeah, thank you for that. 
But uh, thank you, uh, Senator, Zen uh, Senator Seward, for that clarification. What I'm advised is there's a comprehensive training strategy has been developed for delivery uh, to departmental and Centrelink staff and employment service providers. So it's across the chain. Uh, this training includes the objective and features of the new employment services model, operational policy and IT systems training, and training will be delivered through a variety of mediums, including through uh, both face-to-face uh, -face information sessions, web conferencing and self-paced e-learning options. Internal and external stakeholders are also actively uh, involved in the development of training materials. The training will be undertaken in partnership with a broad communications campaign that includes specific information for job seekers, employers and employment providers on the new employment services arrangements. So it is both. Uh, and, and if I can just add that from uh, the human services portfolio uh, with the agency Centrelink, when these uh, occur and when the legislation is obviously uh, passed, but as part of the implementation, Centrelink uh, supports the package by providing its staff with and I think it's highlighted in what I've just said, both face-to-face, -face, internal uh, ways, web-based uh, uh, packages, because what it wants to do is ensure that the, the front of uh, staff, that is the customer service officers, have a high level of understanding of what's required of them and how to implement the package, and also the interaction through, I'll use some more technical language now, the EA3000, because we talk to the job providers as well, the job providers will need to have a high level of understanding of how the new system will work. And of course, what I then finished with was that to include uh, information to job seekers so that they have a high level of understanding of what the obligations are and what the uh, new system will require of them. Uh, and of course, uh, I'm not saying that the system will always be perfect, but there also we support the appeals process uh, as well, and we usually, um, I should rephrase that, we do provide that information as well uh, for when uh, there are uh, issues that can arise about how it's interpreted. Senator Seward. Uh, um, his answer, and I'll also just put on record that he can be guaranteed that we will be pursuing this um, ongoing issue through estimates to make sure that this in, the in education information is being provided. Um, I'd like to move on to data um, provision. and. This was a very, very significant issue under welfare, uh, the welfare, welfare to work regime, where community, um, anybody, outside, anybody outside Centrelink couldn't get access to data. And, and senators may recall, in fact, I was in the chamber on a number of occasions raising this issue, and, and we also had the fiasco where data was actually taken down from the website. Not only couldn't we get the community. Um, or anybody else for that matter, get access to data. Um, the data that was up there, when we raised the issue that we couldn't get access to up-to-date data, the previous data was actually taken off the website. So this is quite a very important issue. It is, is, it is um, data that community organisations um, use very extensively. And so I'm, I'm looking at what the government's commitments are for provision of that data. and. Also, it's very important that data is available in a way that is usable. Um, and it's particularly important because this is new legislation, because the, compliance uh, the comprehensive compliance assessment is a, uh, is a new way of approach, and I, and I um, understand why this new approach has been taken. So you know, we're not com we're not, we don't have an issue with that specifically, but there is a potential here that people could, could in fact particularly with the changes that are being suggested by Senator Xenophon, going from six to three um, uh, no-show, uh, uh, three to six uh, provision that's being put in place to, to kick off the CCAs. It's important that, that the data is available that actually allows uh, a comprehensive assessment of this new approach. So I'm wondering what approach the government is taking and commitment the government is is giving to the provision of data, timely access to data, emphasis on the timely, um, and, and also in what way that data is going to be broken down in terms of um, the number of penalties that's provided, and the type of payments, uh, the type of breaches, the number of people being breached, age, gender, uh, in, you know, indigenous status, um, 
all those issues, number of no-show, no payments, uh, uh, failures, number of reconnections, etc., is all that data going to be made publicly available? And I, I don't want to tie up a lot of Senate, the Senate's time. I have a list of areas that we actually are seeking for data uh, assessment to data and the way the data is broken down. And I'm wondering how we can work, we can, to, how the government is going to be providing that data and an ongoing discussion about that provision of that data. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. If I can start up by saying I think uh, if I can turn the question around slightly, it's the intention of the government to ensure that we provide at least quarterly reports about uh, the operation uh, of the job seeker compliance arrangements. Included in that uh, will be material such as numbers of no show, no penalties numbers of uh, reconnection penalties, numbers of eight-week non-payment penalties, number of comprehensive compliance assessments. The reason I've turned it around in this way is that we should also look at uh, the way the system is working positively as well, and, and that, uh, in that data should also be available. But, and why I say at least quarterly, because obviously there will be an opportunity during estimates perhaps to extract uh, data as well. There will also likely to be a lag because it will take some time in the compilation, but we will work very hard to ensure that the lag, uh, we can at least identify the lag uh, at, uh, and the dates that the information is available for, uh, but at least if it's provided on a quarterly basis, uh, uh, my, uh, and, uh, my, my uh, Centrelink and I'm sure the, uh, uh, the Minister O'Connor will work very hard to ensure the lag is not uh, going to provide data which is unhelpful. Uh, the other part, of course, is dealing with uh, the way—I think you also expressed the males, females and, and uh, number of people who might be Indigenous. The only caveat I would put on that is we will provide as much information that we possibly can, except—and of course it's de-identified, uh, but if it provides to such a level where it might identify where the groups are. My, my example, so don't hold me to this, but where it might be 20 in a small town, it, it may not be provided because it may actually identify uh, the individuals. and It would be our preference not to do that. Of course, you will have uh, clearly the opportunity estimates to be able to examine some of that, and we could always uh, have that discussion. Uh, the other uh, point I'd make in a lot of this is that we will uh, have to ensure that the, because uh, some of this bill is contained in the legislative instrument, uh, and it's critical that we get that right as well. Uh, and this requires a due consultation before. Uh, well, we will need uh, the legislative instrument will obviously come up in April, and we'd ha have to have that. Uh, the first set of legislative instruments. Um, as I understand, will be introduced before April, and that will give adequate time uh, for the instrument to be disallowed before the legislation comes into effect. Although I wouldn't encourage you to do that, uh, Senator Seward. It's a matter of process uh, more than anything else, but that will also provide a bit more uh, information about uh, how the bill will operate in detail, and, uh, and that will be contained in there. Uh, and of course. That doesn't. Uh, it will also the data will be provided by employment services stream and by failure type, as well. So that will provide additional information. Uh, but of course, with all of these, uh, it is uh, it is a matter that we will uh, have a discussion with you in due course. I suspect of estimates about the type and nature of the data, and if we can always look to see how we can improve upon that from feedback from uh, the Greens or the opposition. Uh, we are keen to take that on board because we do want clarity and transparency around this. It is about uh, getting people jobs. It is about getting people into jobs. It is about uh, ensuring that jobs is the focus. Senator Seward. Um, I thank the minister for um, his response. And again, he can rest assured that we will be pursuing this issue through estimates. Um, and I do take on board the point about measuring the positive changes out of this um, legislation. Um, he raised a point that I was going to raise, in fact, get to at some stage, and that is the issue around the draft instruments. 
Um, and I have a question specifically about whether um, exposure drafts of the instrument will be available. The minister um, is keen to ensure that he has the support of this place. Um, it would probably make life a lot simpler if they, in fact, did have exposure drafts. So I'm, I'm asking whether the uh, government does plan, in fact, to have such an exposure draft. The, the long answer is that the government has been consulting with uh, stakeholders through the development of the new employment services and the new compliance system. The short answer is the government will provide drafts of key legislative instruments to key stakeholders for consultation, and they will be provided very shortly. I'm told I can say that, so uh, we're keen to uh, make sure that's happening. I, I um, thank the minister for his answer. I will note that I, I am aware that there has been uh, consultation being undertaken, um, but I will also note that there was a specific request from community organisations to ensure that we did ensure that um, uh, ask the question about the. Ex uh, exposure draft, so I thank the minister for committing to that. I'd like to now go to some general questions. This sounds silly, I know. General questions that are more specific before we get into the amendments, if that's um, acceptable and if, Senator, any, and if anybody else doesn't have any more broader general questions. <laughs> um, I'd like to clarify, please, um, what activities will attract a no-show, no-pay penalty? Is it um, more than um, the work experience and training activities? And, and if it is, what are those? The, uh, the activities that will attract a no-show, no-pay penalty uh, is uh, a job seeker may lose a day's income support for each day that the job seeker, and it will go through a couple of dot points, file fails to participate in an activity, that is, work for the Dole, Green Corps, other work experience activities or training, without a reasonable excuse. Second dot point, engage in misconduct, and we could say disruptive or uncooperative behaviour while in an activity. Uh, third dot point, fail to attend a job interview without a reasonable excuse. Uh, or a fourth dot point, intentionally behave in a manner uh, intentionally behaves in a manner during a job interview that results in an offer of employment not being made. And uh, medical, psychiatric or psychological treatment is not an activity for the purposes of no show, no pay. It's worthwhile adding uh, that. Uh, Senator Bernardi. Just on that um, response from the uh, minister, Chair, what constitutes a reasonable excuse? Minister. There's, uh, what we haven't done is define it. It is the usual uh, what constitutes a reasonable excuse is uh, what the ordinary person would consider under the current determinations of what would be a reasonable excuse. So it's not secured as the current um, legislation provides for a reasonable excuse. There's current determinations of what reasonable excuse is. They will obviously be circumstances that will apply uh, at the time, depending on the nature of the the issue and part of those, uh, as I said, failed to participate in that activity uh, without a reasonable excuse, as the, they, will, they will hang off each individual type of occurrence. Minister, uh, Just, Senator Bernardi. Further to that, uh, Chair, um, will there be guidelines um, uh, published uh, and available to those who will be determining what a reasonable excuse is, or will this be simply at the discretion of? whomever is making the final arbitrary decision. Minister. Uh, maybe I could, I could shorten it. The current legislation provides under the administrative, uh, under the, uh, under the administrative instruments what reasonable excuse is. It will not change. The, the uh, draft legislative instruments that we will bring in will reflect the same as what's currently in the, uh, in the legislative instruments now subject to, uh, and I've committed to consultation. So uh, that's the current position, but it will be subject to consultation. Senator Seward. Um, thank you. 
And I, I thank the minister for his um, previous um, answer and clarification on the no show, no pay, and I'd like to pursue a few more details around that, please. Um, could a person who's subject to no show, no pay, a no show, no pay failure, um, could they be subject to that and a reconnection failure on the same day? Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the question is, can a person be subject to both, really, a no show, no pay failure and a reconnection failure on the same day? The short answer is no for the purpose of calculating a penalty. The one-tenth uh, would apply both, however, could be taken into account. So let's not, uh, let's not uh, be obtuse about this. Both could be taken into account for the purpose of a comprehensive compliance assessment. Senator Seward. I uh, thank the minister for the answer. Um, will it be possible for a person to lose more than three days' income in a payment period for no-show, uh, no-pay failures? Minister. So, for example, if a person missed three continuous days of work experience, something like that? No. Thank you. Um, for the purposes of um, calculating, if we're now going to three no show, no pay failure, or we're going for three failures and possible then CCA, um, if you have three no show, no pay periods in a row, is that th does that count as three for the purposes or one? Three, I'm advised. So I just want to clarify. So a person could miss could miss three in a row, and as long as they didn't have a reasonable a reasonable excuse, they would then automatically trigger a CCA. I can read four. So the implications of continuous no show no pay failure no pay failures. For example, if a person misses uh, three continuous days of work experience, that will count as three no show pay failures and trigger us a comprehensive assessment and possibly possibly an eight week non payment penalty or can that be counted as and so it, it, it has to be, if you put it in, in perspective, the new compliance arrangements are designed to be more work like and to encourage participation. Individual participation requirements and the consequences of not fully participating will be made clear to job seekers. If a person misses three continuous days of an activity, the provider will have the option to allow a job seeker to make up the time or to determine that compliance action is not the best means of securing engagement. Should the provider report the non-compliance to Centrelink, they will then carry out their own investigation. So it, it doesn't happen as, as without us looking at it, because of course uh, you do need to look at the investigation of the circumstances surrounding each day of non-attendance. This investigation would include, of course, speaking of the job seeker and considering any vulnerabilities the job seeker may have to determine if the job seeker had any reasonable excuse, because you have to then, it hangs off whether there is a reasonable excuse uh, for not attending that activity in each day. If Centrelink, uh, of course, determines that the job seeker had no reasonable excuse and applied three no-show pay penalties, then a CCA would automatically be triggered. Senator Seward. I thank the minister. With the new um, approach, I'm, I'm talking about going from six to three. Is the government anticipating that this will, in fact, require more CCAs and and more eight-week non-payment periods, penalties? Sorry. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's. Uh, can I say, Senator, see what you've sifted through this very carefully. A, a, I'm advised a shift from a six to three no-show pay failures is likely, is likely to result in more CCAs. I think that logically would, flow, would follow. Whether, and this is the dependent point, whether this is more eight-week non-payment penalties is quite frankly an unknown factor because of the matters that I read out. Uh, and, and provided before, because we won't know the basis of the non-compliance until the CCA has taken place. That's the importance of having the CCA uh, there. It could result, for example, in earlier diagnosis of uh, 
mental illness, which ultimately results in fewer penalty, or a range of other circumstances which flow from that. Senator Seward. Has the Centrelink, therefore, if we're doing, if we, the logical consequences, and, I, and, I, and I, I, the ministers confirm what we thought, the logical consequences would be is that you'd have more CCAs through this process. That is going to be more resource intensive um, by the very nature of the, the, CC, the CCA process. And has the government, is the government therefore anticipating increasing resources um, to deal with this increase in um, the compliance assessments? Minister. It, it tempt me here, but the, the, I'm, I'm advised, and this is in fact correct, and uh, the department and Centrelink have discussed uh, uh, the resource implications to effectively deliver comprehensive compliance assessments. Uh, Centrelink, uh, with my agency, have uh, confirmed their ability to manage and deliver the new CCA arrangements. I, I think, to put it succinctly, and I think I can say this on behalf of Centrelink, although I always err on the side of caution, Centrelink is looking to ensure this new system works. It's keen to work with uh, job seekers, particularly those who may be around, who are, job, uh, who are vulnerable job seekers to make sure that we do uh, assist them in getting back into employment, getting back into uh, work. Uh, that's the best outcome for them. And I'm, I'm confident that Centrelink will be able to work through the CCAs, uh, be able to work with their existing resources and work uh, to provide that outcome for uh, job seekers. Senator Bernardi. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my apologies to the Senate, but I'm just seeking a, a question of clarification. It may be that I was um, involved in a discussion with uh, Senator Xenophon when the minister outlined the change of plan. Um, can I confirm and ask uh, um, just for a commitment that the government is intending to um, reduce the number of failures before a CCA is implemented from six to three? Yes. That's right. Senator Seward. Um, once again, I thank um, the Minister for his answer. Um, when a uh, CCA has been triggered, will the person be able to commit further failures and thereby lose m in more income while the CCA is being conducted? Once the, as I understand it, once the trigger is reached for the CCA, will a person be able to, if I could uh, paraphrase, to commit further failures and thereby uh, lose income while the CCA is being conducted? Once the CCA, uh, which is uh, the way we will address it, once the CCA has been triggered, no further instance of non-compliance will be considered until the CCA has been conducted. It provides that uh, ability for us to respond quickly as well. I think it, it, uh, it does require uh, Centrelink to do the work as quickly as possible uh, because it will provide a much better official outcome. Can I also say, uh, with indulgence, uh, I've got a meeting I have to go to. Senator Carr will be able to provide, as uh, I'm sure, uh, confidently uh, Confident. uh, answer the questions that are being put. I will be back shortly. It is uh, necessary, given I think I'm going to talk about chamber management for the next couple of weeks uh, to depart. So if you could. Uh, uh, forgive me for that and excuse me, and I'll leave Senator Carr in place, but I will return as soon as I can. So if there are matters that uh, you did want to put back, uh, then I'd be happy to deal with them in a short while. Senator Seward. Uh, I once again thank the minister, and I think I'm supposed to be at the same meeting, but there's other people there. Um, after a CSA has been conducted, does the job seeker count um, the job seekers count of failures. Does it, is it wound back to zero then, and we start it, and they start again? I'm advised the answer is yes. Once a job seeker undergoes a CCA, the count of failures required to automatically trigger a further CCA will start again. Senator Seward. That's come what may. You, you've CS, you CCA, come what may, you go back to the start again. Yes. Thank you. And I, I beg the Senate's indulgence. I know I have a series of questions, but as I said, this is an extremely complicated piece of legislation that affects 
um, many, many Australians and, and unfortunately in the current economic climate is going to be affecting unfortunately a lot more. So I really want to make sure that we get an understanding of this um, legislation. Um, the, um, I just want to turn now to um, the amount of the penalty for no show, um, no pay, and reconnection failures. And explain, can you explain the, the the difference between the two, and why they're different? So, sorry, I'm just clarifying: no show, no pay penalty, reconnection failures, and and why those penalties are different. Uh, explain the difference and why the difference. The no-show, no-pay penalties mean the job seeker is incurring a financial penalty for every reported day of non-participation in an activity without a reasonable excuse. No-show, no-pay penalties are intended to instil a work-like culture and, as such, the penalty represents a working day's proportion of the job seeker's payment. This effectively means 10 per cent of the job seeker's fortnightly payment for each day failure. This does not affect rent assistance, pharmaceutical allowances or youth disability supplements, but it does apply to any supplement the job seeker is receiving for participation in Green Corps or work for the Dole. As is currently the case, access to health cards and family tax benefits will not be affected. Resuming participation will result in a resumption of income support and employment services. A no-show, no-pay failure means that non-compliance will have an immediate financial impact, but the extent of the penalty will be at the hands of the job seekers. Senator Seawitt. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I did miss one question going back to the, the specific thing about the triggers for no-show, no-pay. Um, the three, the three triggers rather than the six now for no show, no pay, triggering a CCS, CCSA, and the minister, um, in a previous answer, was um, tried to explain the fact that a CCSA wouldn't necessarily then result in an eight-week non-payment um, um, period. Um, I, 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 I recognise that, but there is a potential, by the very nature of CCS, CCAs, that they can result in an eight-week non-payment. Um, uh, period, and that given that the trigger is now half of what it was proposed, there's and we've already said there's a there's a expectation that there will now be more CCSAs. I'm wondering is the and and we've already discussed the fact that there's going to be an independent review in a year, but a year to me seems a long time to wait if it is in fact if the CCSAs are in fact then resulting in a large number of eight week. Uh, note payment periods. I'm wondering if the government intends to actually review prior to um, the, the, the year's review, um, whether they intend to review that, and if it is found that there is in fact an increased number of eight-week non-payment periods, um, whether the government then intends to um, look at any possible uh, remedy to that situation. Senator Carr. Thank you. I'm advised that the government has already indicated its view on this matter and has indicated that it is monitoring the situation with a view to actually doubling. Uh, on the, on the government wishes to actually reduce the level of, uh, of uh, the penalties. Um, if Centrelink determines that a job seeker has no reasonable excuse and applied three no-show day penalties, then a CCA would automatically be triggered. Senator Seward. I, I appreciate that. What our concern is, is, and we did touch on this in discussion earlier, is that, and I also understand the minister's answer, is that, yes, while they're expecting an increase in the number of CSAs to be carried out, you can't necessarily then say, Necessarily, there will be increase in eight-week non-payment period. In fact, there could be, you know, the 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 outcomes of those assessments could be different. The point is, though, is that there is a high potential that there will be more people following CCS, CCSAs, then being subject to eight-week non-payment period. 
Um, is the government intending to monitor that um, and to look at any potential negative consequences that's, um, that's having in terms of the increased number of people being subject to the eight-week no payment period and, if there is, um, possibly doing something about it? Minister Carr. The answer to your question is yes. Um, we have already expressed an intent for uh, the uh, for the these uh, what are they what is this thing? Oh, oh, the eight week no payment penalties not to increase. Senator Seward. Um thank you. Um, I must say um, I know that the government probably does want the eight week non payment period not to increase, but unfortunately, particularly because the number of the triggers have been hard, the number the, the number of uh, triggers are hard to three, um, there is a potential. Um, I, I will keep watching that issue very closely. Um, could the government also explain why preclusion periods are not able to be worked off when um, the rationale is supposed to be a focus on um, engagement? So we would have thought that being able to work them off would have actually been consistent with this, the whole philosophy that's about re-engaging people in the employment in employment. Senator Carr. I'm advised it's been long standing practice that there is a waiting period for people to leave employment of their own volition. It would no longer be viewed as a compliance breach. This is to encourage people to stay in employment until they find another job. Employment that ceases because of, uh, of, uh, of being the victim of bullying, harassment or any other such behaviour would not be subject to such a waiting period. Senator Seward. Um, uh, thank you um, um, for your answer. Um, that's the end of my general questions. Um, I would um, uh, move to um, start discussing and moving our amendments. Um, and I, ha I do have some more questions that are specifically relate to our amendments, including so the government and the government advisers know around. Uh, reasonable, reasonableness and misconduct, as we have some amendments around those issues. So I seek leave to move Green Amendments 2, 7, 8 and 11 together. Leave has been sought. Is there no objection? Leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. Um, these amendments um, relate to Centrelink um, discretion. This issue um, was discussed um, quite a bit during the Senate inquiry. Um, these amendments actually provide for, Cent uh, for Centrelink discretion in applying all the penalties in the new compliance regime. The amendments achieve this by changing the word must to may, so that in fact Centrelink can do some of the things that the minister was just in fact discussing um, in terms of the compliance assessment, etc. Um, this is an, it's a, we believe it's an important distinction in ensuring people, um, people's individual circumstances can be appropriately considered before Centrelink applies a penalty. Um, one of the most har harmful aspects of the current um, regime is the lack of discretion in breaching people for participation failures. This has been constantly identified as an issue okay. um, without the ability um, and the, doing that without the ability to take into account individual circumstances. Um, and We've always said, and I think the government acknowledges, that the previous system was harsh and rigid, and um, we believe this will allow the system to be much fairer, uh, applied in a much fairer manner. And I, I believe it's consistent with the intent of the government to make to get this system to work. Um, I've I did discuss this issue, if people remember, um, some time ago in our second reading speech, indicated we'd be moving um, uh, amendments uh, along these lines. Um, so I move the amendments. Uh, the question is. One minute, please. Oh. Thank you. Um, the government is supporting uh, these amendments. Uh, they are su uh, supported. Centrelink is the decision maker, and it's appropriate that, to, that they have discretion in dealing um, in this manner. Senator Bernay. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Coalition believes that there is plenty of discretion already built into this uh, legislation. There is, um, after a CCA, the number of outcomes can occur, including a job capacity assessment, an eight-week non-payment period or indeed no action at all. Um, we believe that there needs to be some certainty in this legislation and, accordingly, the uh, Coalition will not be supporting this amendment. The question is, therefore, that um, amendments uh, 2, 7, 8 and 11 on sheet 5655, revised 2, uh, moved by uh, Senator Seward to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Chair. I move Green Amendment um, 3, um, which deals with um, reason, reasonable excuse. And we did touch on this issue um, previously um, in, the debate, uh, in the debate, but um, I've got some specific issues I'd like to raise here in terms of um, uh, reasonable excuse. This provides for the secretary um, that the secretary can consider whether a person has a reasonable excuse for all ele elements of a no-show, no-pay no failure. The bill, um, as written, excludes the secretary from considering a reasonable excuse where a person has committed misconduct. There is a concern that, action, that actions that are construed as misconduct may indeed be because, for example, a person is suffering from a mental illness, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on that in a minute. Um, they possibly are not acknowledging um, their illness or for other reasons that would otherwise be considered a reasonable excuse. We see no reason why misconduct could be excluded um, in this way. Um, we also believe um, this, the, this uh, amendment um, addresses the issue of cons uh, is, is also addressing the issue of consistency. We believe um, the more consistent approach across the diff that we need a much more consistent approach across the different penalty provisions. We've explained earlier it's quite the different penalty provisions. Are, uh, there's a variety of them and they're quite uh, complex, and we believe it'll make it easier um, for uh, job seekers, employment service providers, and Centrelink. Um, that reasonable, reasonableness applies to, um, other, to um, other judgments as well. Um, the issue, this came was raised during um, the uh, Senate inquiry, um, and uh, it was raised, for example, on a number of occasions in the submissions, but also um, by um, Ms. Gill by Ms Gill, who um, appeared before the Senate inquiry. And she very clearly highlighted um, the issues and they would ex and expressed their concern um, about the fact, um, particularly around what's considered misconduct for people that are suffering from a mental illness. And some of the examples were used, for example, where a person actually forgets that they actually have, um, they have a, a commitment or an appointment, for example. And said that, and, and pointed out that the person may, in fact, not be acknowledging that they have a mental illness. That they think that they've forgotten the, the commitment, but in fact, they 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 never in, took on board the fact that they actually had a commitment in the first place. Now that could be construed as misconduct rather than a reasonable excuse. So what we're seeking to do here is to expand um, the definition to to um, ensure that. There is obviously there'll be there'll be times where there are quite clearly examples of misconduct, but sometimes there's grey in all of these. Oh, there's always grey in all these issues, and sometimes what may appear to be blatant misconduct may in fact not be, and there may in fact be quite a reason when you look into it, quite a reasonable reason for what would what would seem to be misconduct, and we believe that. That approach um, is, is again puts another element of fairness into what has what what has turned into a very punitive and harsh regime, and this just puts that little bit more fairness into this legislation to ensure that in those circumstances um, where somebody is suffering um, from mental illness, and I'm only using that as an example, there could be other examples. We don't. The point here is that we don't necessarily know. Um, that, and we don't necessarily have all the bases covered. So this provides for a case where, in fact, 
what would normally be considered or what could be considered misconduct, it, that there's an ability to look a little bit below that and actually um, see that in the circumstances it is what happened is in fact reasonable. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. The uh, government uh, will not support these uh, amendments. Misconduct is narrowly interpreted at common law. Reasonable conduct by its nature would not constitute misconduct. The Guide to Social Security Law will provide decision makers with further guidance as to what would constitute misconduct. These amendments are therefore superfluous. Senator Benoni. Uh, Madam Chair, the Coalition will not be supporting this um, amendment as well. We believe that already there is a, a once again a, um, a great deal of uh, discretion applied to uh, what constitutes misconduct and what uh, an inadvertent breach. Um, and I believe that, uh, notwithstanding the sincerity with which uh, Senator Seawitt uh, approaches this issue about those with mental illness, I'm sure that will be considered in any. Uh, response or any uh, punitive action taken against those who are in breach. Senator Seward. Um, thank you. Um, we do. We. We. I'm at least pleased to hear the minister. In fact, the opposition believe that it could be taken as as uh, reasonableness. Um, <coughs> it just makes that a little bit bit clearer. We believe, however, the more appropriate approach would be to include it in the legislation. We believe a specific re uh, reference to reasonableness is necessary, in particular for vulnerable job seekers, because these are the, the people that we're uh, specifically worried about. Um, that behaviour, as I said earlier, the behaviour that may, on the face of it, be considered to be misconduct, but which there are underlying factors such as undiagnosed mental illness, harassment at work, for example. In fact, does mean that we just we need to expand out what could be included as reasonableness just that bit more and to clarify it very specifically so that um, it is clear in the legislation that that is it is it is accepted as reasonableness the question therefore is that uh, uh, amendment uh, number three on sheet five six five five revised two moved by senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. Noes have it. Senator Seward. Um, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move Green Amendments 4 and 10 on sheet 5655, five, revised 2, together, please. <coughs> leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. These items are around the timing of deduction for, penalty, uh, for the penalty amount. These amendments provide that when deducting the payment for no-show, no-pay penalties or reconnection penalties, um, that the deductions can occur only in the ins instalment period after the first instalment period following the notification to the person of the failure. Um, so rather than the deduction happening immediately or in the period directly after the failure, this amendment gives people time to prepare for their loss of income. Um, we think this is, um, a re is reasonable. They still incur the penalty, but there's time for them to prepare for it. Um, a pen as I said, the penalty is still applied, um, and it also <coughs> gives time for Centrelink to ensure that they're in fact making the right decision. The, under the legislation, the timing's pretty tight. Um, this allows both Centrelink to make that decision and also for the person to, to prepare, and they still cop the penalty. Minister? The government will support both of these amendments. Senator Bernani? Um, the opposition does not support this amendment. We believe that uh, in the context of penalties, um, if someone um, is, uh, has conduct that is uh, worthy of a penalty, um, then they should have that as an immediate penalty. They've had plenty of time in which to plan and, uh, and um, uh, determine whether uh, they want to participate in this or not, and accordingly they should have an immediate penalty and it shouldn't be delayed, um, call it causing further distress to the people the Coalition will be opposing this amendment. The question is then that uh, amendments 4 and 10 on sheet 5655 revised 2, moved by Senator Seward, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. Uh, the question is that amendments 4 and 10 on sheet 56552 revised, moved by Senator Seward, be agreed to. Uh, the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Farrell, teller for the ayes, and uh, Senator Williams, teller for the noes. You with the ayes, Senator? Order the result of the division being 32 ayes and 30 noes. Uh, the amendments have been agreed to. Senator Seward, you'll be uh, moving your next set of amendments then. 
Yes. And I'm sure senators will assist you by leaving the chamber as quickly as they can. Thank you. Um, Chair, I seek leave to move amendments 5, 6 and 9 together from sheet 5655 revised 2. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. These uh, amendments relate to the issues around um, hardship. Um, they're about hardship provisions and, and working off the penalties. These amendments, in fact, do two things. Um, one, that they include hardship provisions for no show, no pay and for reconnection penalties. And two, they make provision for people to be able to work off um, no show um, and no, uh, no show, no pay penalties. One of our concerns um, with the bill is that there's nothing in the bill to stop people from having continuous no show, no pay penalties or reconnection penalties. Um, there, are, there may be circumstances where a person will miss a whole um, training course, for example, and potentially lose um, half their payment. In these circumstances, we believe there should be ability for Centrelink to not impose a penalty if it would cause um, financial hardship. Um, we also believe that, given the focus of the government's policy is on um, re-engagement, and I very quickly touched on this in one of my questions before, that there should be an option for people to be work off, to be able to work off uh, no-show, uh, no-pay um, penalties. Similar, similar. There is those provisions, um, or sorry, there are those provisions in the Act in other areas. For example, um, uh, similar to serious um, failures. This also touches on that issue about where there's there's different. Um, compliance um, regimes and different penalties. And so what we're seeking to do, we believe, is uh, making uh, the bill again that much uh, fairer and that um, these um, hardship provisions. I still think the intent of the legislation is made, but it does mean that in those circumstances where people are um, caught up um, in those uh, particular circumstances that I articulated, that in fact um, hardship provisions are able to um, be implemented. Uh, thank you. Uh, in respect of that, uh, the uh, hardship provisions, I can indicate the, the government does not support uh, the Greens amendment. Uh, the, these amendments are not supported primarily as the length uh, of a penalty is really in the hands of the job seeker and a job seeker who meets uh, their participation requirements will incur no further penalty. These matters, of course, uh, are then also kicked into the CCA eventually, so the process is there. It is, a, uh, it is quite frankly, a good process. It's certainly an improvement in, in the regime, and it's designed uh, clearly to encourage the job seeker to engage in seeking employment and remaining in employment. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Coalition does not support um, this amendment, this Greens amendment. Uh, basically, what I, I believe what we are seeing is a, a watering down of the, uh, um, the penalties in this, uh, um, in this bill, which are already uh, um, rather slight, and uh, to do any more and to, to consider hardship for people that know their obligations and their commitments um, and the penalties attached to that, uh, when there is so much discretion already attached to uh, um, the compliance regime. Uh, I believe is really um, a retrograde step, and so the coalition will not be supporting this amendment. Senator Seward, um, I anticipated um, that this would not get uh, strong support from the government or the um, coalition. I'd, I'd like people to bear in mind that, as I articulated earlier, unfortunately, due to the, to the financial crisis, there are going to be many more people. Um, on in these unfortunate circumstances and affected um, by this legislation. There are going to be many more people that will need and will be in that, uh, potentially um, requiring hardship um, provisions. Um, and while in the past I think the coalition has approached seems to have been that if you're unemployed, um, there's a lot of people that are purposely unemployed and in fact are not uh, willing uh, to, uh, are not willing to look for a job. As I understand this legislation, it's about re-engagement. Ab re it's about encouraging and helping people back into the workforce and not, taking, and not blaming people. Um, we believe uh, the, not only the hardship provisions but the issues about being able to work off no-show, um, no-pay um, penalties 
uh, is consistent with the government's approach about re-engagement re and is, uh, and I think um, would be a, an added benefit to this legislation um, to help people re-engage um, with the workforce um, and, as I said, is consistent with the government's stated approach in the way they want this particular piece of legislation to, to operate. However, um, I, I, um, it, um, however disappointed I am that the, neither the government or the coalition um, will accept these amendments. The question is therefore that uh, amendments 5, 6 and 9 on sheet 5655 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Chair. I move Green Amendment 12 um, on sheet 5655 revised 2. This relates to comprehensive compliance assessments. This amendment implements the government's stated policy intention in respect um, of comprehensive compliance assessments, CCAs. Um, we support the CCA um, assessment process, as I've articulated, but also, as I um, said in my second reading speech, um, we believe the details should be in the legislation. It provides more certainty for participants. Part of the problem with the previous legislation was a lot of it was either in instruments or in contracts with uh, job network <coughs> providers. We believe that's uh, an inappropriate way um, to uh, put in, to uh, implement this process, and um, we believe that it is um, important that um, this uh, the provisions are actually do have a legislative mm, base. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, in respect of uh, the item 12, which is the comprehensive compliance assessment, uh, it is uh, one that the uh, government is minded to, to support. This includes the CCA in legislation rather than a legislative instrument. Uh, it does not, uh, of course, affect the substance of the CCA. It's one of those areas where uh, uh, there's always on balance, decisions have to be made between what uh, is put in legislation and what is put in uh, legislative instrument. The uh, usual reason for legislative instruments, of course, is that the legislation will provide the framework and the legislative instruments will provide the uh, meat, uh, so to speak. But in this instance, uh, we, can, uh, we can agree uh, to your uh, amendment. Begrudgingly. Senator C. Uh, I thank the minister. Um, I've also, sorry, and, and uh, I need to clarify a, a point and seek the chair's guidance. Um, amendments 19 and 24 are also related to this issue, and there was it hasn't been included in the on the running sheet. And I'm wondering, um, seeking your guidance, whether we want to deal with those issues now or whether we'll just deal with them as they come up. Uh, on. On my running sheet, nine, uh, 14 to 19. I know. Oh. No, I'm halfway through my answer to Senator Seward. She ran away. So, Senator Seward, they are listed on the running sheet at the top of page two, but you could seek leave to move 14 to 19 now if you wanted to. Um, Chair, sorry, I apologise for leaving and seeking advice. I, I note I had was a little bit, um, uh, gave me a bit of a misdirection, so I apologise and withdraw my comment. That's okay. So, we're still just moving sheet, um, um, Amendment 12 on sheet 5655 revised. Is that where we're at still, yes. So, Senator Bernardi. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. The uh, coalition will be opposing this amendment. Um, we don't intend to divide on it if that makes it of any benefit to uh, those that are watching the broadcast. Um, uh, but uh, we just believe that ultimately, whilst we do support um, the, the principle of enshrining this, putting it in the legislation, um, uh, we just don't support 
um, the approach that's been taken on this occasion. So the question is then that uh, Amendment 12 on uh, Sheet 5655, revised to, moved by Senator Seward, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. And the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Chair. I move Green Amendments. 13 and again sorry I seek and 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 12 uh, sorry third green amendment 13 and 20 on sheet uh, 5655 revised 2 and I may sorry I'm I'm hesitating because of the way it, on on the running order is written um, I'm just seek clarification yes. from the chair that it's that it's okay to move those two together as one uh, yeah, Senator Seward, that, yeah. that is, and you can speak to both of them at the same time, but I will put them as two separate questions. Um, thank you, Chair. This relates, and I touched on these issues again uh, previously, um, this relates to the uh, preclusion um, period um, uh, for uh, serious um, failure for unemployment um, resulting from a voluntary act or um, misconduct. Um, uh, it's, um, we have some uh, concerns, as I uh, think I articulated in my second reading speech, around the, around, uh, the, preclusion, uh, the preclusion period and um, believe that um, again, these, amend these amendments deal with um, unemployment dealing from a voluntary act or misconduct. The concerns that we've had is that, um, again, um, the legislation doesn't adequately deal with the, with the proposition that there may be um, a, a reason, um, whether it's a direct or indirect um, result of a voluntary act, that the person has been um, unemployed and believe that, um, that the preclusion uh, period uh, needs to needs to be able to take that particular circumstances into account. So this amendment provides for particular circumstances to be taken um, into account, account and allows for a preclusion period um, or deals with that through this amendment. Minister, well, we don't uh, support the uh, the uh, position that's being put by the Greens. The government believes that it is important that people who voluntarily leave employment uh, should have to uh, wait before they receive income support. However, uh, I think it is uh, reasonable to say we will ensure that the eight-week preclusion period applies only in genuine cases of voluntary unemployment, not in cases of unfair dismissal or similar circumstances. So that, I, I think, takes into account, uh, in truth, what you're trying to put forward. Senator Seward. I thank the minister for that um, assurance. For that assurance, and and could you possibly um, point out at, at the mechanism that that will be taken into looking at the circumstances of someone's um, un, 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 unemployment status in terms of whether the voluntary left uh, a, a job or um, for, uh, allegedly for misconduct, what process will be used for ensuring, it, for ensuring that in fact um, you're satisfied that it, that it was in fact counts as you know, misconduct or, or there was no reasonable reason for them to leave um, employment? Subject to correction here, but my recollection is, is that there is a, obviously a separation certificate. It is in the social security legislation guidelines this action is taken as of course uh, to ensure that we do uh, the right thing around this because there is always if someone voluntarily leaves their employment there is that waiting period uh, and of course uh, you have to ensure that it is applied that is the legislation is applied correctly that is why we have guidelines in the social security legislation to ensure that we deal uh, with those senator seward thank you um I'll I'm trying not to delay, to delay the Senate too long, but I'm just really the answer to my question previously about why um, the same provisions don't apply across the board um, for dealing with some of the penalties in terms of being able to work off a penalty. 
um, if you could articulate a little bit more clearly why you don't think, and you did, I accept that you did touch on it just then, it's maybe I'm not accepting your answer, um, about why it is not possible for someone to work off that particular penalty as well as it is with other penalties. I, I think one of the difficulties that we're dealing with is now we're talking really about two distinct types of circumstances. Voluntary leaving a job means a person has made a conscious decision, all things being equal with no uh, other outside influence, to choose to leave, uh, to either do something else, to do something else, if I put it broadly, I don't want to the circumstances that might, uh, someone might envisage, uh, whereas, uh, and that then requires uh, the waiting period because those circumstances will be varied for each individual, but it is a conscious decision they make. Uh, in terms of uh, where someone is uh, in the, uh, if I pause into the uh, regime that we're talking about here, the no work, no show. Uh, those areas. This is about uh, activities designed for people to look for employment. We've got two distinct types and I don't think it's fair to try to bring them together and say we should have the system the same where we're really looking at two different types of circumstances. One is where someone is in employment. There is no reason to leave the employment. They are gainfully employed. They are receiving a payment the best thing we can do for someone is to keep them in employment. The best thing we can ensure for their long-term uh, benefit is that they stay in employment. We all know that a job provides self-esteem, provides outcomes for individuals. For the individual decision to consciously leave an employment, I think in these circumstances shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be juxtaposed with the circumstances where there is a person who is voluntarily looking for employment, who is in uh, the job seeker market. Uh, and is required to undertake activities and undertake uh, a range of uh, activities to find work uh, where they don't. Then there are, uh, then there are, then there are, is a system in place to deal with that, and they are uh, distinct. I hope that provides uh, some assistance. Senator Seward, um, thank you, and and I, I'm not saying I agree with your distinction, but thank you for providing that. Um, I, I just sort of then want to go quickly back to this issue about um, what's um, a, you know, misconduct or what's the reasoning behind what's vol voluntary leaving a job. And some of the issues that were raised during the Senate inquiry and also informally with me is what happens where someone leaves a job because they're uncomfortable, they haven't been able to get adequate childcare arrangements, for example, um, there's some form of they feel harassed, they don't want to take a case through the harassment process um, because they don't feel that they'll be able to um, actually prove a case, but it's just easier for them to leave work. Through the process that you outlined before in the guidelines, is that able to be dealt with so that people aren't, uh, have, have a, a, a basically a, a, a way of explaining why they left a job without copying the eight-week Payment the, the, uh, without copying the preclusion period. Sorry. Yeah. Minister. These are, um, and perhaps we can uh, deal with the DNA in this way. Uh, currently, unemployment due to misconduct is defined as situations where a person has contributed to their own unemployment, i.e. being dismissed or being given the option of resigning from suitable work because of their action as a worker. The intention, of course, for where that happens is uh, of this policy is not to penalise the uh, people for something over which they clearly had no control. The intention is primarily to provide a deterrent to those who might behave inappropriately at work in order to be dismissed and avoid a penalty by leaving employment voluntarily. And I think we'd all agree with that. A person who was dismissed for lack of ability to the job or even incompetence uh, cannot be considered uh, to be unemployed due to misconduct. So 
it, there are uh, graduations of that, and where uh, the government's happy to take you through the guidelines that uh, Centrelink uh, will use and the job uh, in dealing with these, because uh, I think what you've outlined <coughs> is one scenario. There are multiple. There are multiple in in this environment. The decide uh, the decision that government has, of course, with this is that you don't want. Uh, my advisers might correct me on this, but you don't want a decision maker with <coughs> examining a plethora of individual minute circumstances and applying in, it inconsistently because it's too discretionary. There is discretion, but the discretion is always narrow. So in voluntary leaving your employment, the discretion is narrower. It's designed to ensure that there's a deterrent there for a person to leave their employment. That's why it's there. So that the uh, decision maker doesn't have a wide variety to look at all the circumstances and try to make a, an assessment because invariably you get a range of outcomes that will be inconsistent. Uh, what is there, though, is a clear deterrent. What will happen uh, is that, that that deterrent will be applied. In circumstances where someone feels uncomfortable these are always difficult judgments because they relate to the individual. My strong advice to people is always, uh, and I'll draw on my earlier career in this as an industrial inspector, if uh, the advisors don't mind me talking for a second, is that if there is harassment in the employment market, you do not have to put up with that. There are a range of places you can go to seek redress. And the, the employment uh, market is such that between the Human Rights Commission, between the state industrial inspectors, between federal industrial inspectors. There is a range of support, and including unions, which is also part of my previous career, to assist those people to adequately deal with that. There is also complaints handling in many awards. In fact, I'm sure that in all awards about how you deal with these things in a practical way, it's about that rather than simply saying, I'm not quite feeling well today because of the circumstances and leave. It's decided to be a deterrent so that they don't do that. They consider their options, which are more practical. The practical options are complaints handling. Practical options are, if there are redresses available, use those because otherwise uh, you have a circumstance where someone may leave an employment where the next day, or using even your scenario, it blows over. Circumstances change, outlook changes, and they should have been in their employment, but they're not. And that would be a disappointing outcome for all. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the coalition uh, doesn't support this amendment by the Greens. I think uh, Senator Ludwig has outlined uh, a number of um, reasonable, um, uh, reasonable arguments about why it shouldn't be supported. And I'd, I'd like to just make the following observation, Senator Seward. That what concerns me with these amendments is that, that you're seeking to find, or appears that you're seeking to find an excuse, every excuse under the sun, why people shouldn't be penalised for failing to fulfil an obligation that is a very reasonable obligation, either to seek work or, in this case, to hang on to the job that they've got. You mentioned the matter of harassment, which arose in the Senate committee, um, and you know there are a number of forums and avenues in which people can can uh, try and redress. Uh, any difficulties in the workplace or if they're, uh, if they're forced out of work. Um, I, I agree with Senator Ludwig that, that um, there has to be very, very narrow parameters. And unfortunately, uh, in your amendment, um, you, you, the, the parameters are far too broad for me. Um, they're far too broad for the coalition. And also, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't reflect the coalition's belief that there needs to be some personal responsibility and accountability. Um, if someone is gainfully employed and they decide that they don't want to be gainfully employed anymore and they you know, uh, participate in some misconduct, um, I find it hard to believe that many people would support that as a reason or a justification uh, for them to be receiving some sort of benefit. Um, uh, I, I hope I'm wrong, frankly, about you and the Greens amendments looking to make excuses for everyone to get out of this. But, as we've been going, been going through this, this is a, a common theme and it, uh, it fills me with some concern. Senator Seward. 
Senator Bernardi, I think you, uh, whether deliberately or by accident, misrepresenting the approach the Greens are taking to this uh, legislation is completely wrong. We are trying to um, put in place amendments that make this legislation fair, that deal with real life circumstances. And while I fully know that there are provisions for dealing with harassment, in the real world, sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes people are just so over it, they don't want to deal with what is at the present time until the new IR legislation comes in place. And I realise we're not debating that now, and I have some problems with that. But under the current legislation, under work choices, it made it extremely hard to take uh, these issues, to, to address these issues. So in the real world, sometimes it doesn't happen that way. Sometimes people actually need to leave to, be, to regain their sanity even because they're in a dire situation they just can't deal with and it's easier to leave. And I find it incredible that the coalition is still trying to defend what was a harsh system that unfairly penalised people that ended up, that ended up breaching an inordinate number of people, in particular Aboriginal Australians. In my home state of Western Australia, I think the number of people, Aboriginal people in Western Australia the num increased by 300 per cent. And, and, and those figures are probably wrong because people just dropped out of the system. So I don't try and label the Greens as some sort, of, some sort of group that's now trying to get everybody out of having to take care of their responsibilities. We're trying to put in place a fair system that, in fact, needs to be uh, flexible enough at the moment to deal with the increasing number of people that we are going to unfortunately see on our unemployment lists. Quite clearly, Australians did not appreciate neither uh, work choices nor uh, welfare to work, both of which are puni punitive systems that punish people, and in particular Aboriginal Australians. Um, who, in particular, who uh, we're also particularly be, been reviewing this legislation with them particularly in mind. Um, however, having having uh, said that, I've said my piece in terms of we um, believe that this uh, that this uh, amendment makes the legislation more consistent across the different um, penalties. And in fact, if you actually think that the working off provisions are uh, I think it's a misconception to believe that the working of provisions in the other sections of the bill are somehow light on those that are um, unemployed and have been, and, and have been um, subject to an eight-week uh, penalty provision. I think you should um, try doing it yourself for a while and see if you think that it is, un it is uh, uh, a particularly light way of um, trying to survive. It's not. And certainly the um, the submissions that um, the Greens have had um, have, uh, I think, gone through both through the, Senate, through the Senate inquiry but also direct correspondence that we've had. Um, people have gone through this legislation very carefully and I think have suggested very fair um, amendments um, which um, we are, um, are trying to implement here. Um, so please, I'd urge the coalition to take another look at our amendments and look at how they're implemented in the real world, because that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at this through the eyes of the people that are going to be impacted by this legislation, not from above, not judging them, but from people who are actually trying to survive. And there's going to be more people in this situation. There's going to be um, more people that um, are going to perhaps fall through the system, perhaps um, uh, not willingly, uh, but may in fact be subject to this, that, that are there um, not deliberately. And so we're also keen to make sure that this legislation addresses where people are in the system, both if, if they're deliberately um, breaching the system, there's enough penalties there. We believe there's enough checks and balances to ensure that those people are dealt with appropriately. But we also need to make sure that people that are in it, that are vulnerable, in particular job seekers, <laughs> are not unfairly treated and that get the help to re-engage and to find a job that they need. And in some cases, some of these people need some additional assistance and we believe um, that 
that's, we need to ensure that that is built into this system. And that's what we're keen to ensure, that it's fair for all Australians and that some people aren't being blamed and penalised and demonised, which is what happened under the previous regime. Uh, the question is, therefore, that uh, uh, Amendment 13 on Sheet 5655, Revised 2, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. And then uh, the question is that div subdivision E in item one of part one of schedule one stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Senator Seward. Uh, I apologise, Chair. I just had to go and find a piece of paper. Um, I uh, move Greens Amendment 21 um, on sheet 5655, um, revised 2. This relates to a reasonable test um, for um, misconduct. Um, we believe um, that, and I, I, I think I um, have articulated our concerns uh, previously around. Um, what is what can be reasonably considered um, uh, misconduct? Um, this provision extends the reason. It goes back to this issue about extending um, the reasonable excuse to a person becoming unemployed through misconduct. Um, we believe, for fairness and consistencies, that there's um, that we don't believe there's a justification for a reasonable excuse not not to be applying um, to mis um, to misconduct. So we've got in place an alternative um, an alternative. Um, if for that that's provided for in the legislation um, uh, through this amendment. Uh, Minister? Thank you. I can indicate that uh, that item is not supported. Uh, Senator Carr uh, dealt with the reasons why earlier, and uh, unless there's any need, I won't deal with those again. The question is then that uh, Senator Bernardi, did you want to say something? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. We will be opposing this um, for the basis on, uh, outline, for the, on the basis of the arguments outlined previously. And I just say to Senator Seward, I seem to inflame you on occasion, Senator Seward. Um, I don't intend to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't. <laughs> um, but I, I would just, I would just, uh, uh, just say that you know we're talking about voluntary misconduct here. Um, they are the key words. And if people are are uh, uh, misbehaving. Uh, due to their own actions um, or their own choice, um, I think to, to make excuses for them is a very tough thing to do. And I say that not to badger you or to get you up here to attack me again. Um, I accept your, uh, your flame from the last time, but um, that, that's just our position. Senator Seward. Thank you. I'll respond briefly and I'll try not to flame. Um, the, the thing we come from it, and I, I accept that some people are, will and do voluntarily carry. Um, carry, you know, act in a, a, can get uh, um, carry out uh, misconduct, voluntary misconduct. I can I can appreciate that, but the, where we come from is that we need to not assume that in fact everybody is acting in that manner. Um, we come from the perspective that um, we need to look at if there is a reason for what is misconduct and it may be assumed that it's misconduct but in fact it is not and there may be a reasonable reason why what we see as misconduct is in fact not so we're not pretending that, that everyone's that everything's perfect in the world and we do acknowledge that there are there will be some people that carry out misconduct and we think that there's adequate provision in, in this legislation to deal with that but as I said we come from the perspective that we don't necessarily assume that everybody's carrying is coming from that perspective and it's all misconduct and that it's, there's no reason for it Quite often, what, you know, there, there may be circumstances where what is considered misconduct is, in fact, when you look beneath the beneath the surface and look at the circumstances, that in fact it is not misconduct. Or if it is classed as mis, if somebody thinks it mis, misconduct, there is actionable, there is in fact a reasonable reason. So that's where we come from. We don't assume everybody's bad. 
The question is therefore that uh, Amendment 21 on sheet 5655 revised, moved by Senator Seward, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Seward. I seek leave to move Green's Amendment 14, 19 and 24 um, together. It's 14 to 19, is that right? Senator Seward, we uh, just want to clarify with you. We understand that uh, uh, Amendment 19 and Amendment 24 seem to be exactly the same. Sorry, and I, that's, this is where I misread the note that I was provided before. 19 and 24 are the same. So I seek leave to, in fact, move amendments 14 to 19 and obviously withdraw 24 as it's the same as 19. Ah, right. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. So, Senator Seward. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you for allowing me to, to clarify that. Um, these provisions, um, pr uh, uh, these amendments, sorry, provide for where the secretary makes a determination that a person is unable to comply with a serious failure requirement and would suffer financial hardship, that this uh, serious period, uh, serious failure period, ends um, the day before. Um, the secretary makes the determination or the day before um, the request is made by the job see seeker to consider hardship. As the bill is written at the moment, the serious failure uh, period would end the day the secretary makes the determination, but it would take the secretary some time to make the determination with the, uh, and then the person um, uh, suffers a, a loss of income despite the fact that the finding would have put them, um, the finding that they would be put into serious financial hardship. Um, we believe it is um, much more appropriate for the person um, suffers no loss in these circumstances. So these series of amendments are to deal with, uh, deal with that uh, provision. Um, it's acknowledged um, that you know, we, the issues around financial <coughs> hardship are acknowledged in the bill and we believe this makes it um, a little bit more clearer and fairer um, for, um, for uh, job seekers. Minister. Thank you. Uh I'll be brief. We support the uh, the amendment. Uh, Senator Bernardi. I didn't hear what the government's position was on this. Be brief. We support the amendment. There, there are amendments 14 to 19. Yes. Okay. Um, Senator the, Bernardi. The coalition does not support these amendments um, on the basis that we believe it uh, it further waters down the um, the already watered down regime that's uh, going to be implemented under this uh, under this legislation. The question is therefore that uh, amendments 14 to 19 on sheet 5655 revised be agreed to, uh, noting that uh, amendment 24 has been withdrawn. Um, those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. We'll ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that Greens amendments 14 to 19 on sheet 5655 revised 2 uh, be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Farrell teller for the ayes and Senator Bushby teller for the noes.
Order. As a result of the division, there being 34 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. <coughs> Next one's greens too, isn't it? Yeah. So we're on to this one. Yep. Order. Order. Would senators please resume their seats or leave the chamber? We are going to proceed with the next Australian Greens amendment, which, as I read it, is amendment number 22, sheet 5655, revised 2. Senator Seward. I move Greens amendment 22 of the, the sheet 5. 5655 revised 2. This provides for discretion of employment service providers. This amendment, we believe, is one that is in fact consistent with the, the fact that the, um, with the government's stated policy. Um, it was discussed during the Senate inquiry. Um, the government um, made it clear that employment service providers will have discretion in providing um, particip participation reports to Centrelink. That was clear during the discussion. At the moment, however, that discretion is included in the contracts process with, um, participation, uh, with um, employment service providers. We don't believe that's an appropriate uh, place for that discretion to be. We believe it should be in the actual bill, the same way as you know, the Senate has now um, included provisions, uh, acknowledged and included provisions for discretion of Centrelink. We believe that should be in the bill. That, that should be part of legislation. That discretion for employment service providers, and the government's very clear that they do have that, as I understand it. And I'd, if it's different, if my understanding is different, I'd really like them to clarify that. So, but we believe that it's not appropriate. That, that, that it's very important. This is very important provision. And we believe that it's not appropriate to have it in fact con it, that that mechanism is, is delivered through a contract process. It should be in um, it should be in the, the uh, legislation. Senator uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, we've been uh, we've been uh, reasonable, but in this instance, uh, we're not going to be unreasonable. We're going to explain why we won't support it. The government believes that the appropriate instrument for regulating employment service provider is in the government's contract with the employment service provider. That, uh, the discretion that, uh, as articulated in the amendment, is contained in the contract, the appropriate place for it to be. So it does exist, but it exists in the contract. So we won't be supporting uh, your amendment. Senator Seward. The difficulty I have with that is that say you change your mind just or just that, that in fact you don't want or, or a particular job service uh, a, an employment service provider to have discretion there's no then guarantee that that discretion will be uh, will be given to service providers so my concern is that where it's purely providing it in a contract means that there's no legislative base for that. There's no requirement for that discussion. We've now given Centrelink discretion, which I'm really pleased about, but it's now not, it's not required. It doesn't have to be done because it's not in the legislation. It's not even in a legislative instrument. It's in a contract to that service provider. Now, this is very important for all the reasons that we've been talking about um, before. Um, and in, um, the, I'm, I'm a bit perplexed why the government supports, which I'm pleased about, the discretion for Centrelink, but not ensure that the discretion for the service providers or the, the um, employment service providers is actually got a legislative base as well. The Minister. Uh, thank you. The, uh, really, the short answer is this. Think of it this way. Uh, uh, for the Senate, the contract is how you manage the providers, the, the outcomes. And so if there is 
to be a change, if there's identified a change, then there's a variation to the contract that the parties agree to. So there's full knowledge about these types of things. It is a, a way of ensuring that the contract is the central part of it, because the legislation doesn't provide the framework. The contract is the system. It provides the, the, what, the, what the service provider has to meet. It provides what the government expects uh, the service provider to do. And of course, if there's, a, uh, there's a required to be uh, contract negotiations, then they will take place. If there's a required to be uh, an eventuality or a circumstance that arises, then it's dealt with by the parties through contract negotiations. And if there's a requirement to be a variation, then, then that will uh, also be the outcome. It's, 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 you've got to think of it in the way of it's around the contract. That's the instrument, if we call it that, but it's a contract. And the detail is in the contract. The parties will manage the contract. Senator Siebert. Um, I, I do understand what the government is saying. I, I disagree with it. Um, I do think it needs to be given a legislative base, but I seek a commitment from government that they absolutely fully intend that in all contracts with service providers that discretion will be provided, both any contracts now and in the future, that that is their intent. Minister. It's our intent, if I can put it that way. I'm not in a position to guarantee it, but I can say that it is our intention. The, the discretion, of course, uh, Centrelink will always retain about these things, but let me say the contract is a central part of the instrument that the parties will adhere to, be bound by, and, and voluntarily committed to, into, and that will then regulate uh, their arrangements between uh, the parties. That's what the contract is there for. Uh, but in terms of you know, Centrelink's discretion, it is still there for the uh, types of arrangements that will, will occur. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Against, I'll put that again. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Uh, we'll now move on to amendment number 23, 26, 27 and 1, sheet 5655, revised 2. Senator Seward. Thank you. I seek leave to move Greens um, amendments 23, 26, 27 and, and 1 um, together. Leave has been sought. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. These are a, a group of amendments that relate to inserting a definition of homelessness into the Social Security Act, a definition that's based on the um, ABS census definition of, of cultural homelessness. They um, also provide for the determination made with respect to reasonable excuse in reference to this definition of homelessness and also amend the current um, determination to that effect. The current definition of homelessness in the determination is um, what we believe is completely inadequate. Um, these series of amendments ensure that homelessness has a recognised place in social security um, law. The issue here, again, it came up um, during the Senate inquiry. Um, it it uh, was raised a number um, of times and the specific example of, of um, where homelessness, the definition, uh, uh, there was slippery. There was a, a slipperiness around the, de the definition of homelessness and the way it was applied previously. And we had an example given um, where somebody was homelessness but had a regularness, a regular homelessness address. In other words, they knew where the person was sleeping out of doors, so they were then classed as not coming under the definition of homelessness because they could be contacted. Um, that was a ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous um, interpre interpretation of homelessness. It was not the previous uh, government. I will very definitely acknowledge that. It was the, under the previous government's um, provisions, um, but it, it just raised very clearly why we do need a clear, consistent definition of homelessness so we are uh, seeking as I said to put that in the um, to put that in the legisl legislation and then make a series of amendments that would then relate to that um, definition
Minister. Thank you. Uh, I can indicate we're not supporting the Greens' position. However, we are ensuring, and I think this is the appropriate point, that the relevant legislative instrument and policy guidelines are broadened to capture those who would be classified as homeless according to the ABS definition, and more importantly, that will be available for consultation as well. Senator Seward. I thank the minister for that. I don't thank him for not including uh, supporting the amendment, but I do thank him for the um, for the uh, clarification. The minister, could you be clear about what instrument you're using to do, to determine the definition, and is it going to be? And I'm sorry if I missed this. Is it going to be consistent with the ABS, ABS definition? Minister. Uh, Chair, the legislative instrument is the one I think I've been referring to today that we're, we're currently working on, that they will be available, uh, and we want passage by uh, April. I'll put a plug for that in. Uh, and, uh, and, of course, they will, be, uh, be, uh, they will have, uh, and I expect that they will go through the consultative process. Uh, I'm advised that's right. And in terms of uh, the uh, issue around the ABS definition, uh, the guidelines will be brought to capture those who would be classified as homeless according to the ABS definition. So it's the guidelines within the legislative instrument. The question is that the amendment, Senator Seward. I'd, I'd just like to um, put on record that I, I appreciate the minister's clarification. I wasn't sure if the, if the instrument he was referring to or the mechanism was the legislative, uh, the, um, uh, the legislative instruments, so I, I appreciate that clarification. Thank you. Senator Bernardi. Um, Madam Chair, the, just to put on record, the coalition does not support this amendment. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator C would be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. We'll move on to Amendment number 25, sheet 5655, revised to. Senator Seward. Chair, uh, the Greens, I'd seek my intention of withdrawing um, Amendment 25. Um, Senator uh, Xenophon has a, 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 an am amendment very similar, so the Greens are withdrawing ours in favour of, their, of Senator Xenophon's amendment. Right, so, so you don't then move that. So um, we'll then move on to Senator Xenophon's agreement. Number, uh, uh, amendment number one on sheet 5710. Madam Chair, uh, I move the amendment standing, uh, uh, seek leave to move the amendment standing in my name. Um, this relates to a review of the impact of the compliance regime. Um, it is self explanatory. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that I have uh, uh, communicated openly with both the government, uh, the Greens, the, uh, uh, the opposition, and other uh, in relation to this. Uh, it will ensure that. Uh, uh, after a period of 12 months, there will be a scope for a, three, a review to be conducted within uh, three months uh, by an independent panel uh, chaired by a person with expertise in social security and employment services matters. Uh, and I think this covers, uh, covers the concerns that have been raised um, in, in the course of this debate, uh, both by the coalition, uh, by the Greens, particularly in, in relation to uh, the issue of um, vulnerable job seekers, including uh, uh, Indigenous, uh, indigenous people, and I've just seen a uh, what may be a typo in uh, 2B in uh, 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 it should be indigenous uh, job seekers rather than job people, and I don't know whether I can get. Would you agree? Yeah, if I could seek leave to uh, to uh, to amend that to substitute the word seekers. For uh, uh, instead of people, do you just move it in the amended form? Senator yes, if I can move it in yes, its amended in form, form, and I apologise yes. uh, to, yes. to the chamber for that. So uh, I think it's important that we get it right. These are significant reforms that the government is putting through. Let's see how they work. Let's have this independent review, and if the independent review uh, says that they're working uh, fine, then uh, then there's no need to further consider this. But I think it'll be a valuable exercise to have such an independent review uh, to cover the areas of concern that uh, uh, various non-government uh, senators have had in relation to how this legislation will work. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator 
Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, the government uh, wholeheartedly supports the idea of a review. It is uh, one of those uh, areas that, in opposition, we have argued for. They are necessary and they do provide uh, a worthwhile uh, check uh, to see how the matters are going. We do have uh, concerns, as not unusual, to then also express that when you uh, look at the breadth of 2E, uh, given that it is a review uh, regarding the impact, impact of the compliance regime, uh, 2E goes on to say the gaps between federal policy and state service provision for persons with non-vocational specific needs or barriers, uh, and 2F insofar as they have only, uh, which goes on to say the adequacy of non-vocational support services in regional areas, insofar as, as I've said, they only seem to have uh, tenuous links to the compliance system. Uh, we also have uh, concerns about how some of these matters will actually be able to be measured. And nonetheless, nonetheless uh, a review is a uh, matter that this government does support and we are uh, and will support, uh, notwithstanding uh, the concerns that I have raised. Senator Bernardi. Madam Chair, uh, the coalition also supports a review um, for slightly different reasons, I, I guess, than the government and, and perhaps some of the other parties. But I look for what we have in common. First amongst this is that uh, we all agree that this is truly significant legislation. Um, uh, some of us believe it goes too far and others believe uh, it doesn't go far enough. But what um, a review would provide is the proof um, and the evidence about the success or efficacy of, or otherwise of some of the measures that are going forward. Um, to have a review after 12 months, uh, particularly in the current economic climate, I think is uh, particularly timely given that you know, there, there does appear to be a deteriorating uh, economic outlook um, as forecast by the government and, and through Treasury. Uh, to have an independent panel to be assessing um, uh, the effectiveness of uh, these, this, these changes to this, uh, this legislation, um, I think, would be a very positive step. It is something the coalition does support, um, and uh, we hope that uh, the review, of course, will, will support the coalition's position on these, uh, on these, um, uh, on the amendments and uh, and the uh, problems that we've identified with this legislation. Of course, if it doesn't, and it shows that uh, there are other other issues that need to be addressed, we'll consider those um, on their merits at the time. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Xenophon be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. We'll now move on to the question that items two to five and eight and nine of schedule four stand as printed. Senator Bernardi. Madam Chair, uh, I neglected to uh, inform the Senate that when I withdrew Amendment Number One, standing in our name, I also wanted to withdraw uh, this amendment on behalf of the opposition. Okay. That's fine. Sorry, this is the question now. That the, well, the question then moves to that this bill, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Social Security Legislation Amendment Employment Services Reform Bill 2008 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. Move that the, committee report be, the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Yeah, I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Corporations Amendment Bill. 
Corporations Amendment No. 1, Bill 2008, in committee. The committee is considering the Corporations Amendment No. 1, Bill 2008, and Amendment 1 on Sheet 5705, moved by Senator Milne. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Senator Bernardi. Oh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. Um, in, uh, in, when this uh, debate com was completed last night or, or concluded last night, I hadn't had uh, an opportunity to put the Coalition's position in regard to this amendment on the record. Um, we, I do agree with Senator Milne's comments uh, of last night that um, indeed the Prime Minister has uh, talked a lot, but he hasn't actually done very much. Um, I do uh, not agree with her comments about um, that we should be modelling our legislation um, on, on American legislation. And then I'm paraphrasing Senator Milne there because she just did refer to, Senator, uh, to uh, President Obama um, and his position um, in regard to uh, similar amendments. And um, uh, simply because it's happening in America doesn't mean it should happen in Australia. There has been a bit of comment um, from the coalition over, over uh, the period of time, um, more recently uh, by the leader of the opposition, um, Mr Turnbull, in regard to uh, um, the payments of excessive uh, uh, benefits and things. However, Mr Turnbull's comments were constrained, I believe, to uh, CEOs. These are much broader ranging reforms and accordingly um, the coalition will not be supporting them. Um, because we believe that they, uh, they uh, would not be to the long-term benefit of the Australian corporate sector. The question is? Senator Marshall. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair. Um, it's unfortunate that Senator Bernardi makes those uh, very brief comments and starts to suggest that this government is simply talking and, and not acting. Um, I don't know where he's been. Um, since uh, we won government. I don't know how he can possibly misunderstand the very many actions that this government has taken to stimulate the economy. It is simply not talk um, through you, Acting Chair, um, from what uh, Senator Bernardi says. This government has acted decisively and early in the best interests of this country stimulating the economy at times when it needed to and presenting us and putting Australia in a position where we can continue to face the challenges presented by the global economic crisis um, in an effective way which benefits Australian businesses, Australian workers uh, and this economy in general. So on behalf of the government, I absolutely reject those very flippant and I think uh, ill-considered comments uh, by the spokesperson for the opposition. Um, you really should, uh, or Senator Bernardi really should, uh, take a deep breath and actually look at what this government is doing um, and to suggest that anything, that in any way this could simply be described as talk and no action, is uh, simply defies belief. Uh, Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I don't want to get into a, an extended debate with Senator Marshall, but you know, his uh, comments are uh, completely irrelevant to the debate. I was merely reflecting my agreement with what Senator Milne said uh, from last night, that the Prime Minister talks a lot but hasn't done very much. Now, uh, Senator Marshall may disagree with that, and we're going to have a political uh, debate about these things for many years to come, I'm sure. But uh, please, let's uh, look at our constructive contribution to this debate rather than the partisan sort of politics that Senator Marshall is intending to play. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you. Look, I just want to um, address a couple of um, uh, remarks to the um, amendment moved by the Greens, and I'd commence my contribution um, last night when we uh, adjourned. Um, I was making the point that um, um, the circumstances in Australia are quite different from the United States, and I think it's important to point that out. What we have seen in the United States, and I'm not going to go through the details of the US subprime crisis, but there is no doubt, there is no doubt that one of the central elements of the, the, um, the collapse of the US financial system um, were the perverse incentives and the failure of many senior executives, many senior executives to identify um, the risk uh, of the um, 
the very creative financial instruments that they were, were uh, employing in spreading through the, not just the US system, but the entire world's financial system, uh, for which um, uh, they were paid, uh, a, a fr frankly, obscene sums of money. And I agree with President Obama in his comments last week. And I think his comment, well, I don't think, I know his comments last week were a response to the, uh, the revelation that um, uh, many people in the financial sector in the United States, having had a catastrophic year, catastrophic year in the financial sector in the US last year, with banks falling over, um, a major insurance company um, without government bailout would have collapsed. Having had a catastrophic year, uh, many in the financial services sector had been paid, at the end of the financial year, approximately, I think, $22, $23 billion um, uh, in, uh, in incentives and so-called rewards. And I think, well, I know that Senator Obama was rightly outraged, as the, as the um, uh, vast majority of people in the US are rightly outraged, that failure was rewarded. Failure was rewarded. These perverse incentives and bonuses were being paid to individuals, to varying degrees, who had been involved in what is going to go down as the largest financial collapse in the US since the Great Depression. Now, that's a fundamental difference from what has occurred in Australia. We haven't had the collapse, fortunately, of mainstream financial institutions in Australia. We have had, certainly, at the edges, Babcock and Brown is an example. Also, there have been uh, a, a very small number of entities uh, where uh, I think, um, on reflection, uh, and Senator Milne referred to a couple of these, on reflection, um, the, uh, the payments, given what happened to those institutions, uh, you can certainly question whether it was appropriate. But I think we should distinguish between the, um, the uh, collapse of large sections of the US financial system uh, and the situation that has prevailed in Australia. Um, and I think this debate uh, needs to, um, to reflect on that background. But having said that, nevertheless, nevertheless um, the Prime Minister and indeed the Leader of the Opposition, um, uh, Mr Turnbull, um, have identified um, a range of issues and argued that there does need to be improvement in respect to uh, executive remuneration in Australia. Um, and this global financial crisis has revealed that there are many financial institutions that pay their employees in a way that encourage them to take large and inappropriate risks, particularly short-term risks. That full, uh, and, and taking short-term risks fuels a boom and a culture of greed and short-termism, short-termism. Um, and uh, as I've mentioned, we've seen uh, these opaque investment instruments uh, in a search for short-term, what has turned out to be paper results. Uh, and financial institutions need to have clear incentives to promote responsible behaviour. Now, the Rudd government is committed. It is committed to responsible economic management, and this includes this area of acceptable remuneration practices for Australian companies and particularly in the financial sector. And the Prime Minister and the Treasurer, um, and indeed I on a number of occasions, have been advocating reforms uh, of the financial sector executive salaries. And it needs to be done not just in Australia, but it needs to be done internationally. In financial services in particular, we're dealing with an international market. And financial institutions need to have clear incentives to promote responsible behaviour rather than some of the unrestrained greed that we have seen. And the government believes the Basel rules on capital adequacy uh, should pick this up. And specifically, we think regulators should set higher capital requirements for financial firms with executive remuneration packages that reward short-term returns or excessive risk-taking. That is, institutions encourage excessive, encouraging excessive risk by employees. It should be prudent to keep a bigger buffer of capital to reflect the increased risk. And that, in turn, of course, will be reflected in the, uh, in the executive remuneration. Um, and this will be implemented domestically. 
um, in conjunction with discussions um, from our regulators, APRA and ASIC. Um, in Washington on the 15th of November, the G20 leaders agreed uh, that their finance ministers will formulate recommendations on executive compensation. APRA is developing the template and the, the global financial crisis gives us all cause to reflect on the matters um, that uh, we have under debate. Um, now, Senator Milne has criticised the government for action, lack of action. These issues, I know executive salary uh, as a public concern has certainly been there for, um, for many, many years, but certainly crystallised over the last uh, calendar year. Um, these issues need to be examined thoroughly and dealt with effectively. Um, and, the, and the point I would make about the Green Amendment is um, there will be reform in this area. However, the, the Green Amendment, which is the same amendment that they moved, um, I think, in October and November last year, um, is, an, is an extremely blunt approach. Extremely blunt approach. Um, and we do want thorough reform in this area. We will want it to be considered. And I'd be very confident that we will see reform in this area during this calendar year. Um, but the proposed Green Amendment is an extremely blunt approach. Um, it doesn't address anywhere near all the types of issues um, that uh, need to be considered in an effective response to this issue of executive um, remuneration. And therefore we won't be supporting the, uh, the, um, the amendment. Uh, but I would give this uh, commitment to um, uh, uh, the Greens that um, uh, when we are reaching a point where it requires, uh, where it may require some regulatory uh, parliamentary amend amendment, very happy. I mean, I do have some responsibilities in this area as Minister for Corporate uh, Corporate Law. Um, very happy to involve you in uh, in the discussions that um, occur about how we uh, how we respond in a legislative way uh, or and or regulatory way. Um, about uh, about uh, these particular issues. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Milne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The committee is considering the Corporations Amendment No. 1, Bill 2008, and Amendment No. 1 on Sheets 5705, moved by Senator Milne. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Williams, teller for the noes. Order. As a result of the division, there being seven ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The question now is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Corporation's Amendment No. 1 Bill 2008 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. We move the report of the committee be adopted. The question is that the report of the committee be adopted. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Thank you. I'll move the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clerk. An act to amend the law relating to corporations and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day Number Two, Migration Legislation Amendment Bill Number Two, 2008. Second reading, adjourned debate. Uh, Minister. Uh, the State of the Chamber. Quorum not present. Ring the bells.
order. The quorum is present, so could senators resume the seat or leave the chamber, please? I believe Senator Fury Van Wells' microphone is not turned on. Could we have some attention to that, please? Thank you. Thank you. I rise to speak on the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2008, which amends the Migration Act to clarify and enhance provisions in the Act that relate to merits and judicial review of migration decisions. These amendments aim to rectify the shortcomings of the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2008. They aim to do so by creating conditions conducive to the expeditious and efficient administration of justice for those seeking review. These principles were first introduced as part of the previous bill before they were withdrawn in August 2008 amid some concerns over their unintended consequences. The coalition supported the principle behind these changes when they were first introduced. Consequently, we are in support of these amendments in their revised and improved form. As the then Shadow Minister for Immigration and Citizenship, Senator Ellison, indicated in his second reading speech on 27 August 2008, it is fair to say that the coalition, while in government, was looking at amendments of a similar nature to the ones we are currently we see currently in this bill. These amendments provide for a number of much needed improvements in process, in particular allowing oral communication of requests for further or initial information, the setting of time limits for appeals and the commencement dates of the times within which appeals can be made. Most notably, this bill seeks to amend the current 28-day period for lodging an application to the High Court for judicial review of a migration decision, which will be changed to 35 days. In order to remove concerns, a new 35-day period will commence to run from the date of the migration decision rather than from the time of the actual notification of the decision. The case of Minister for Immigration and Citizenship versus ZK, Z, SZKKC highlighted concerns associated with the concept of notification for the purposes of lodging an application for judicial review in the Federal Magistrates' Court. Section 477 of the Migration Act, as it currently stands, provides that the time period for initiating proceedings in the Federal Magistrates' Court commences from the date an application is actually notified, an applicant is actually notified of a decision. This provision creates a large degree of uncertainty, as it is often difficult for a court to ascertain when an applicant is actually notified of a decision. The Senate recently moved to rectify many of the problems associated with notification of migration decisions when it passed the Migration Amendment Notification Review Bill last year. I spoke on behalf of the coalition in support of that bill as I saw it as a practical measure to prevent unnecessary legal recourse based on minor technical deficiencies in the process of notification by the department. The amendments prescribed in the Notification Review Bill have removed opportunities for unnecessary legal challenges which intended to delay and overturn migration decisions. In a similar fashion, this bill too calls for a far range of measures aimed to prevent such action before the courts while also improving effective administration of justice. Indeed, as a former lawyer with the Australian Government Solicitor, I have seen in my own experience how regrettably unscrupulous immigration lawyers and migration agents can exploit such technicalities in a futile attempt to delay their clients' cases. Together with the Notification Review Bill, these amendments solidify changes which improve the notification process between migration applicants, the department and the relevant tribunals. These pieces of legislation will, at the same time, ensure that the notification system remains fair and reasonable for all of the parties involved. The objective of the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2 
is to amend the Migration Act to clarify and enhance communication provisions in the Act that relate to merit and judicial review of migration decisions. In particular, this bill clarifies that the Migration Review Tribunal, the MRT, and the Refugee Review Tribunal, the RRT, may invite, either orally or in writing, review applicants or third parties to give them information. It establishes uniform time limits for applying for a judicial review of a migration decision in the Federal Magistrates Court, the Federal Court and the High Court. And it limits appeals against judgments by the Federal Magistrates Court and the Federal Court when they make an order or refuse to make an order in relation to extending time to apply for judicial review of migration decisions. Currently, the tribunals and the full federal court can only request or require information from a person in writing, enabling the tribunals to obtain information from review applicants and third parties orally, including over the telephone, will help ensure that reviews of migration decisions can be conducted more efficiently and quickly. In many instances, the only available method for contacting an applicant is by oral means. While acknowledging the issues surrounding procedural fairness which arise from the acquisition of information orally, it is often the case that the tribunal registry only has access to telephone numbers. These amendments allowing the tribunals greater power in obtaining information orally will ease delays in the judicial process without necessarily compromising procedural fairness. The amendments relating to time limits address the problem where there is currently an incentive for unsuccessful visa applicants to take advantage of the delays litigation can cause by waiting until their removal from Australia is imminent before lodging an application for review. These amendments provide the courts with broad discretion to vary the time period for applying for a review of a migration decision where the courts consider such a time frame is necessary in the interests of the administration of justice. The limitation on appeals against extension of time decisions will help ensure the effectiveness of the new time limits for applying for judicial review of a migration decision as inserted by the bill. The current wording in the Act is in places ambiguous and has allowed appeals to migration decisions based on lack of clarity concerning dates of decisions and communication processes. These amendments seek to clarify the intention of the Act and to streamline the appeal processes. Under these amendments, various changes will occur. Subsection 3592 inserts the words either orally, including by telephone or in writing, after may invite in subsection 3592 of the Act. Subsection 3591 of the Act provides the Migration Review Tribunal with the power to get any information it considers relevant. Importantly, it provides that once the MRT has such information, it may have regard to this information in making its decision on the review. The amendments to subsection 3592 outline that the MRT has the power to seek information orally by whichever method it chooses, including but not limited to by telephone. The MRT will still be able to invite a person by written invitation to provide information. These powers are a subset of the MRT's broad powers under subsection 3591. The power to seek information orally or in writing applies at any stage in the review. As previously mentioned, these amendments will also ensure that the MRT is able to obtain relevant information where the only way of contacting a person is by oral means, for example, where only the telephone number has been provided. In all circumstances, including over the telephone, where information is collect collected that is adverse to the applicant and which the MRT considers would be the reason or part of the reason for affirming the decision under review, clear particulars of that information will be put to the applicant in writing. The applicant will then have an opportunity to comment on such adverse information within a prescribed period. 
period before a decision on the review is made. The removal of the word additional from the heading in section 359 makes it clear that the MRT's power to seek information orally, including over the telephone or by written invitation, applies to all information and seeks to deal with the uncertainty surrounding what information is covered by section 359. Vesting the High Court with a broad discretion to extend time where it is necessary in the interests of the administration of justice aims to protect applicants from possible injustice while also ensuring extensions. A prime reason for an extension of time being necessary is evidenced by the 2007-2008 annual report of the High Court of Australia, which illustrates that 93 per cent of the immigration applicants who filed uh, in 2007 were filed by self-represented litigants. According to the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission submission to the Senate Legal and Constitutional Legislation Committee in 2004, and I quote, it must be remembered that persons making claims under the Migration Act may have little familiarity with Australian legal process and may face linguistic and cultural barriers to effectively manage their application and advocating on their own behalf, unquote. Furthermore, where the services of a migration agent are employed, not all problems are overcome, as it is often the case that the actions or rather inaction of an agent can adversely affect the prospects of an individual wishing to appeal their decision. A new subsection 486 capital A 3 provides a definition of date of the migration deci decision which will serve the purpose of setting the time limits for applying to the High Court for review of a migration decision. Subsection 486A capital A 1, as amended by section 5 of this schedule, provides that the 35-day period for applying for applying for a review of a migration decision starts to run from the date of the migration decision. One of the effects of this subsection will be to ensure that where a written statement for this decision does not comply with all the requirements set out in subsection 3681 for the MRT and subsection 4301 for the RRT, this will not affect the time limits starting to run. These subsections seek to ensure that the High Court is not required to examine whether there is a jurisdictional error in the migration decision before determining whether the application for review is within time. In short, these amendments will ensure improvements to the Migration Act in order to build upon the shortcomings of the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 1, 2008. These provisions aim to do so by creating conditions conducive to the expeditious and efficient administration of justice for those seeking review. The coalition supports such positive changes. In the past, applicants have been afforded opportunities to abuse the tribunal and appeals process based on shortcomings of the process, particularly those originating from the notification process. These amendments, together with those outlined in previous amendments supported by the Coalition, such as the Migration Amendment Notification Review Bill, will help ensure a more efficient and effective judicial review of migration cases in Australia. Senator Anson Young. Thank you. I rise to speak to the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill 2008. This bill is a welcome move to clarify and enhance judicial provisions relating to the merits and judicial review of migration decisions. The issue of judicial review has been one of great concern for the Greens, and we are particularly pleased to see the government move to ensure effective time limits for judicial review of migration decisions reinstated, effectively allowing for the courts to extend the time frame where they consider it necessary in the interests of justice and, of course, administration. Having said that, however, despite our overall support for the bill, the Greens have some ongoing concerns. 
in particular about the proposed increase in the length of time unsuccessful applicants have to lodge an application for judicial review and, uh, more concerningly, the proposal to remove, to remove the right of unsuccessful applicants to appeal decisions regarding extension of time to a superior court. Firstly, I'd just like to address the issue of the timeframes. Currently, applications for judici judicial review must be lodged within 28 days of the actual notification of that decision. The relevant court may extend the initial 28-day period by up to, up to 56 days if an application for su such an extension is made within the 84 days of the actual notification of the decision and that the court is satisfied that it is in the interest of the administration of justice to grant that extension. While this amendment in theory seems logical, on closer inspection there seems to be a danger that the new provisions may not sufficiently safeguard against unfairness to applicants who experience delays or mistakes in, not in notifying them of, an immigration de of a migration decision. Under this proposed new provision, time would be running as soon as the decision was made, and any error or delay in providing notification could d diminish or completely use up the amount of time available to make an application. Although these, circumstances would most probably be although these circumstances would most probably be sufficient grounds to apply for an extension of time, we are concerned that on the onus of doing so would be on the, the onus of doing so would be on the applicant alone requiring an application in writing setting out why the extension is in the interest of the of administration of justice. This appears to impose an unreasonable burden upon applicants who may already suffer considerable disadvantage, including language barriers and limited financial means, in assessing the legal system and may diminish their practical ability to obtain a fair hearing. Accordingly, I would like the Minister to outline how the proposed amendments to subsections 477-477-A and 486-A will safeguard against any any potential disadvantages that could arise if these amendments were to proceed. The second issue that I would like to raise deals with Schedule 3 of the bill. Essentially, Schedule 3 removes the right to appeal to a, in a superior court in respect to a decision of a lower court relating to the extension of time which, to lodge, which is given to lodge an application for judicial review. In the uh, explanatory memorandum notes, the amendments are being made to discourage unsuccessful and I'm quoting here to discourage unsuccessful visa applicants from taking advantage of the delays caused by litigation to prolong their stay in Australia. Although I understand the minister's con contention that appeals uh, in such appeals of such decisions may in some circumstances be used to delay tactic as a, as a delay tactic or, uh, burden court resources, or as a burden on court resources, these factors should not justify unreasonable restrictions upon fundamental rights. The rights of applicants to obtain a fair, a fair trial and access to the legal system must, must be protected. And, um, while I, I see the minister's point, I think that it's uh, a concern that we are suggesting taking away people's rights. Uh, just because um, perhaps some people don't play fairly. Though this proposed amendment was not contained in the bill number one, the government has not indicated what has changed between the drafting of the two bills to necessitate the imposition of the limitation, nor provided detail, detailed reasons why this measure is needed um, other than that it will strengthen and, and enhance the new time limits, that it may help prevent applicants from making weak or vexatious appeals to deliberately delay their removal. Um, and the, the, the third argument was to seek to encourage applicants to seek timely resolution of their cases. Schedule 3, as it stands, is unacceptable to the Greens, and we will not be supporting it. Judicial discretion should instead be exercised to allow review of orders in respect to the extension of time in appropriate cases. And I ask the minister to outline how this amendment will not dis diminish a person's fundamental right to access the legal system. Putting aside the small handful of cases, as shown in the statistics, of uh, people that perhaps do um, currently take advantage of, uh, of the processes, we need to be ensuring that we're not undermining the rights of those that are perhaps more vulnerable and disadvantaged. The Greens support the overall intent of this bill, and I, I'd, I would like to stress that. I think that there are, there are some good parts of, of this bill, and, and overall we do support the intent. But we believe the Migration Act as, as a whole needs to be amended to 
it mended immediately to implement the many principles announced by the Minister for Immigration on the 29th of July last year, as well as immediately implement judicial review for detention decisions. We want to talk about giving the courts um, the ability to review decisions and, uh, and, and to make judgments in relation to immigration. We need to be looking at a judicial process for uh, looking at decisions made around detention. While I understand that this bill before us today deals specifically with judicial review of migration decisions, I think it is important to note the findings of the Australian Human Rights Commission uh, annual report into immigration detention that highlighted asylum seekers, including children, uh, continue to be held indefinitely despite assurances by the government that detention is only being used as a last resort and for the shortest time possible. Considering this bill aims to extend the judicial review timeframes for applicants who have already received a tribunal decision on their visa applications, some of whom will still be in detention, uh, stipulating reasonable timeframes for people to consent their de sorry, stipulating reasonable timeframes for people to contest their detention should also be an obvious inclusion to this overall package. As I outlined in my speech to the joint Standing Committee on Migration's report into immigration detention last year, we need to urgently ensure that the merit of detention decisions should be subject to independent oversight without indicating uh, a view as to when, when that should be available as a right or should occur as a matter of course. Their intention um, did not suggest that they, that they would have considered it reasonable to preclude merits and judicial review for 12 months, something that I think um, I'd like the minister to respond to um, if they could today. The Greens are therefore moving a second reading amendment calling on the government to immediately put forward amendments to the Migration Act to implement the principles announced by the minister last year into legislation and to ensure that a person cannot be kept in immigration detention for more than 30 days unless an application by a, co a court makes an order that, seems, that deems it necessary to detain a person on a specified ground and that there are no effective other alternatives to detaining that person. Thank you. Senator MacLucas. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, and can I thank uh, senators for their contributions to the second reading debate on the bill. Uh, and uh, I note that uh, Senator Hanson Young has asked a, a number of specific questions. Uh, given that we will not conclude the debate uh, before quarter to, to one, um, I can assure Senator Hanson Young that we will endeavour to get uh, good answers to those uh, legitimate, legitimate questions. Um, uh, Senators, the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill Number Two of 2008 amends the Migration Act of 1958 to clarify and enhance provisions relating to the merits and to merits and judicial review of migration decisions. The bill contains three sets of amendments. The first set of amendments clarifies that when the Migration Review Tribunal or the Refugee Review Tribunal seeks information from re review applicants or third parties, they may do so, do so either orally or by written invitation. <coughs> the amendments seek to address a series of recent judicial decisions which held that the tribunals may only seek additional information by written invitation. By allowing the tribunals to also seek information orally, the amendments seek to overcome problems where the only available means to communicate with a person is orally, for example, where, where only a telephone number is provided to the tribunals or where it is appropriate to seek information orally rather than in writing. Order. It being 12.45 p.m., I call on matters of public interest for discussion. Senator Cameron. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise on a matter of public interest concerning the Coalition's agenda to retain those parts of work choices that depress the wages of low-paid workers and make their jobs less secure. This agenda would increase economic inequality and damage the economy by strangling demand at a time 
when there is a consensus amongst business and economists that the government must stimulate demand. Consider the public record. In evidence to the Senate's inquiry into the Fair Work Bill, the Treasurer and Minister for Industrial Relations in West, the Western Australian Government, Mr Troy Buswell, outlined the Liberal Party's plan to retain as much as they can of work choices under the state law in Western Australia. The Liberal Western Australian Government opposes the extension of rights to workers that will protect them from being unfairly dismissed. The Liberal Western Australian Government opposes a minimum employment standard that limits weekly ordinary hours of work to 38. The Liberal Western Australian Government will reintroduce take-it-or-leave-it employment contracts as a condition of getting a job. And the Liberal Western Australian Government will make it easier for jobs to be contracted out and outsourced with no protection for employees' wages and working conditions. And it's not just the Western Australian Liberal Party. In a speech to the Young Liberals the other weekend, Senator Fifield made some quite curious remarks about what choices. And I quote, There is a reassessment by many in the coalition as to the wisdom of having been so quick to abandon our core principles on workplace relations after the election. Then he said, he must have thought about it, don't get me wrong, of course the brand and policy iteration known as work choices is dead. So one minute, work choices is a core principle of the Liberal Party, the next it's simply a policy iteration, a brand to be discarded like an empty can of coke. Which is it? Well, I know what it is. Senator it's, a, it's a core Liberal Party principle. Ripping conditions from ordinary working Australians is a core Liberal Party principle. Who are the many of those in the coalition who Senator Fifield says are questioning Malcolm Turnbull's position on the necessity for the Liberal Party to declare work choices dead? There are many in the coalition who won't let go of the policies that were doing so much harm to Australian workers. Take it or leave it, individual agreements. No protection from unfair dismissal. The barest of bare set of minimum employment standards. Stripping away the no disadvantage test for workplace agreements. All of these attacks on workers' rights contribute to downward pressure on the income of working families and, if persisted, would stifle growth in, and demand in the economy. According to a report in today's Australian newspaper, Senator Fifield's many at least include Senator Abetz, Senator McGoran, Senator Joyce, Mr Tucky, Mr Abbott, Mrs Bronwyn Bishop and Mr Schultz. There are many more in the list and no doubt all will be revealed before too much longer. The difference between Senator Fifield and Senator Abetz is that Senator Abetz wants to continue the debate behind closed doors. This is what happened when what choices was introduced. No consultation with the Australian public, no warning to the Australian public, no mandate from the Australian public. As further evidence of the coalition's continuing affection for political and economic extremes, take Senator Abetz's outrage against suggestions from Mr Pine that the Liberal Party should move to the political centre. From his remarks, it's clear Senator Abetz thinks that any move to the centre is a move too far to the left. Senator Abetz is going to tough it out on the right-wing fringe, and many of his colleagues want to be there with him. Senator Abetz and the coalition have no idea what the political centre is. What choices was the policy iteration of the coalition's lack of a political compass? So we have an accumulation of evidence 
that amongst all the other things the coalition is in denial about, including climate change, they are also in denial about the severity of the global recession. They are preparing to frustrate the decisive and economically responsible action that is needed to support economic activity, jobs and investment. They persist with their neoliberal economic policy based on the law of the jungle. It's the let the market rip approach, the Gordon Gecko approach to governance. That's where the Liberal Party are. There is an overwhelming case for a comprehensive government package to deal with the economic downturn. In terms of the labour market, the last thing we need now is a debate about the discredited policies of the coalition. Turnbull argues he is now standing up for fiscal discipline. Well, let me tell you what the government is standing up for. We are standing for leadership and decisive action to protect jobs and support Australian households. For us, the international meltdown is not about a failed economic theory simply. It's about looking after working families. And we are demonstrating leadership and we are acting decisively by delivering $14.7 billion to schools for major and minor infrastructure construction. Well, I'll be happy to see all the Liberals scurrying back to their electorates and telling their local school communities that they are not supporting the government's biggest approach ever in the history of this country to refurbish schools in this country, something that you failed to do for 13 years in government. We are funding the insulation of the country's housing stock because we understand there is global warming. We are not deniers on this. We are increasing the solar water rebate. We are injecting $12.7 billion into households to support household demand and support economic growth. We are providing $6.4 billion for the construction of new social housing and a further $400 million for repairs and maintenance of existing public housing. We are providing $252 million for construction of 800 houses for Defence Force personnel and an additional $150 million for repairing regional roads. $500 million to help local councils fund community infrastructure. And while we are at the cutting edge of the changes that are required to protect jobs in this country, the coalition remains stuck in a time warp. It just wants to return to work choices. That's its policy for this country. While the government does the right thing demanded by the very tough economic conditions facing the country, by providing an urgent fiscal stimulus, the coalition clings to its deficit fetish. False fiscal discipline from Malcolm Turnbull. Time warp politics from the coalition. Nothing typifies the return to the past than the return of Peter Costello to late line last night. After making little or no contribution to the political and economic debate since the election, he now detects an opportunity to fill the vacuum created by the flip-flopping, incompetent and ineffective Liberal leadership. Unfortunately for the Liberal Party, his contribution was a negative carping and angry exhibition that clearly demonstrates why he could never gain the support of his peers for the Liberal Party leadership. Working families deserve better from this ragtag opposition. Working families deserve an opposition that acts in the national interest and not in the interest of an individual's political aspirations. Working families need better from an opposition who want to defend discredited economic theory that's brought the international economic system to its knees. The Labour Party will not be distracted by the internal machinations of the opposition. We will continue to develop the global, the global responses to the economic crisis that are in the interests of working families and in the communities and in the nation. 
We have to make up for the failures of the opposition when in government. A failure to provide fairness, balance and equity in industrial relations. A failure to invest in our schools and the youth of this country. A failure to develop our industries. A failure to recognise the reality of global warming. A failure of leadership and a failure to build the nation. That's what this package is about from us. It's a nation-building package. It's about ensuring that we protect jobs, we protect our communities, and we protect the families of Australians. You are failing to show any leadership and any national approach of consensus towards the international crisis. You are climate change deniers, and you are now deniers on the reality of the, the, the the, the major and crucial issues that face the economy of Australia. Senator Bushby. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I rise to speak on a matter of public interest, being the concerning ideological direction of the government in terms of its economic management. As we head into 2009, it's becoming increasingly apparent that the fallout from the global financial crisis will pose great challenges to our nation with a vast array of worrying consequences for all Australians, and in the process deliver great, uh, will greatly test the government's ec economic capacity. With unemployment set to rise, the hard-won Costello and Howard surplus exhausted, and a global economy in downturn, left-leaning journalists, academics and politicians have lost no time in placing blame for this situation squarely at the feet of capitalism and globalisation. And indeed, they have been so successful that this message has pervaded the mainstream of Australian discourse. In the midst of the severity of the crisis becoming apparent, our own Prime Minister was seen urging the world leaders to reject what he labelled extreme capitalism and calling for a new world order of global financial regulation. And now our, our self-professed economic conservative Prime Minister, together with the assistance of other fellow ideologues, has engaged in composing fruitless reams of ideological Senator Cameron. diatribe. Yeah, well, I, 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 I Senator wouldn't have gone Cameron. so far, Senator Cameron, as to call his essay claptrap, but if you would Senator like to label Bushby. that, then I'll accept Bushby. that. Railing against the economic paradigm which he, only last year, so warmly identified with himself with. Sixteen months ago, he went to the Australian people saying words to the effect of, I am an economic conservative. I won't take the budget into deficit. You can safely vote Labor because when it comes to the economy, we won't do anything different to what the coalition has been doing. Yet here we have this self-professed economic conservative in an essay for the monthly laying into the balanced common sense approach to government management of the economy so successfully practised by the coalition government and to a limited extent by the Hawke and the Keating governments, an approach that has placed us in what is almost certainly the best position of any nation in the world to tackle this crisis. Can I say I find this backflip, this flip-flop, this complete turnaround to be completely breathtaking in its enormity? But can I also say I don't find it at all surprising? This is because I never believed our Prime Minister when he stood with his hand on his heart and told the Australian people that he was an economic conservative and that Labor promised more of the same. My suspicion, shared with millions of Australians, was that in politics the less scrupulous will sometimes say what they need to say to be elected. I am reminded by the overheard and widely reported comments by the now Environment Minister during the campaign that we will say what we need to get to to get elected, but we will change it all when in government. Well, there is no clearer evidence of that than the words of our Prime Minister in the monthly essay. Here we have our economically conservative Prime Minister declaring that he is a social democrat. I understand he has since also declared that he is both an economic conservative and a social democrat. Kind of like uh, Christian socialist. Kind of like claiming you're a constitutional monarchist who wants an Australian head of state. The, can I, <laughs> exactly. A, a total inconsistency through you, Madam Deputy Chair. The Prime Minister used the term the Emperor has no clothes in his essay in attempting to denounce the obvious success of the approach to economic management that seeks to encourage private enterprise and investment and reward individual effort and freedoms. But the reality is that in doing so, the Prime Minister has exposed himself as the Emperor with ec no economically conservative clothes. The fact is that in signalling a return to old-fashioned 
big spending, high taxing, high debt, Keynesian expansionism, this government has sounded the death knell for the prosperity of Australians for generations to come. The Prime Minister is correct in his essay when he says that this crisis may mark a turning point between one epoch and the next. But I, for one, am extremely concerned if the next epoch marks a return to the failed socialist policy implemented as part of social democratic experiments in the past. It will be our children that pay the price if the social democrats, the Keynesians and the socialists win the ideological argument now surfacing and such irresponsible economic policy rules in Australia. Order. One needs only to glance Order. briefly at the course of 20th century history to Senator observe Cameron. the failures of Keynesian Senator overreaction. Cameron. This is, of course, not to say that a review of global financial structures is not necessary, but such a review needs to be well considered and informed rather than reactionary. 200 years ago, Adam Smith described the brilliance of capitalism. Let a man seek his own advantage. Sometimes he will flourish. Sometimes he will flounder. But always, the process of innovation and failure will reward the common good. In Smith's words, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we can expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. The employment of self-interest to generate outcomes that advantage others is the more or less the simplified central assumption of capitalism. It is beautiful in its simplicity and, despite the scapegoat role it seems to play in the event of any sort of financial crisis, humanity has not yet devised a better system. In 1944, a meeting of like-minded individuals was called by a great man by the name of Robert Menzies. These individuals were brought together by a common belief that freedom was paramount. They sought to provide the Australian people with an alternative to the post-war socialist agenda of the then Labor government. This was a great moment in Australia's history. This was the birth of the greatest political force for freedom that our great nation has ever known, the Liberal Party of Australia. In a policy speech, freedom, that's what that was all about through you, Madam Deputy Chair. In a policy speech at the 1949 election at which the party was first elected to government, Robert Menzies said, and I quote, you cannot have a controlled economy without controlling human beings, who are still the greatest of all economic factors. You cannot socialise the means of production without socialising men and women. As the founding father of the Liberal Party, Menzies very clearly articulated the link between economic freedom and political freedom that goes to the very core of the political philosophy of classical liberalism. Indeed, the advent of the Liberal Party signalled a re-emergence of classic liberalism in Australia, following the long period of lagging economic growth, high levels of taxation and debt across the globe that followed the failure of Keynesian expansionism to adequately address the latter years of the post-depression recovery. And I must say I feel that we're heading towards very similar circumstances to the way this government's going. By the late 1970s, early 1980s, this revival was in full swing with the likes of Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan at the helm. Reagan at the helm. In his work, Capitalism and Freedom, Milton Friedman very succinctly summed up what it is about the free market that has brought about the unprecedented prosperity and freedom of the past few decades. Economic arrangements play a dual role in the promotion of a free society. On the one hand, freedom in economic arrangements is in itself a component of freedom broadly understood. So economic freedom is an end in itself. In the second place, economic freedom is also an indispensable means towards the achievement of political freedom. The spread of capitalism on a global scale has brought about spectacular improvements in the quality of life for billions of people the world over. In 1820, 85% of the world's population lived on today's equivalent of less than a dollar a day, so that's in today's terms of a dollar. By 1950, this had fallen from 85% to 50% and today it has diminished to less than 20 per cent. It is a simple fact that global poverty has plummeted over the last 50 years more so than in the 500 years preceding it. The spread of capitalism has also brought with it increased life expectancy and a greater scope for the pursuit of leisure and freedom from the burden of back-breaking physical labour, which, ironically, has allowed for the emergence of an educated class who may make a career out of criticising capitalism if they so wish. Intellectuals' distaste for capitalism was best described by Friedrich Hayek in The Fatal Conceit. It was his belief that capitalism offends intellectual self-importance in its distrust of evolved systems, which seem to function effectively without intelligent direction. 
Simply put, capitalism didn't require any planning from anyone, and it doesn't need anyone to run it, rendering those poor socialist intellectuals redundant. Contemporarily, this criticism has engendered a broad range of adherents, with many who claim a moral high ground on things such as greed and materialism. Of more economic relevance is the current blame game being played around the causes of the global financial crisis. As has often been said, capitalism was doing just fine until politicians and bureaucrats decided that they could do a better job. The now infamous taxpayer-funded Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were created by the United States government to do what the free market would never have done—provide subprime mortgage finance or finance to those that would not otherwise have qualified for a loan. Fannie Mae's status as a government business enterprise gave a false impression to the market that it was somehow guaranteed, leading to risk-taking behaviour on a massive scale. To cut a long story short, when the bubble finally burst, the result was global financial chaos, what our Prime Minister in his glib bureaucratic fashion likes to call the GFC. Yes, there was risk-taking. Yes, there was excessive greed. And yes, there was regulatory failure. But in no way can it be said that capitalism is to blame. It is the socialist adherence to the notion that somehow politicians and bureaucrats can improve upon the inter interactions of individuals in a free market that is largely responsible for this debacle. And what of our fortunes in all of this? The International Monetary Fund says that Australia is in a comparatively strong financial position, but this strong position that we find ourselves in didn't just happen. No, our current good fortune relative to comparable nations comes as a direct result of 11 and a half years of responsible and prudent economic management under John Howard and Peter Costello. Under a coalition government, we saw a dramatic increase in the number of Australians in work, consistently lower interest rates, an increase in the average wage of 20 per cent greater than the increase in the cost of living, and, very importantly, the repayment of the $96 billion of debt so very generously endowed upon us by the last Labor government, resulting in a massive annual interest bill saving of $8.8 billion a year and every year. The situation that Australia would be currently in under the current economic circumstances, had this debt remained, just doesn't bear thinking about. And worryingly, given this government's clear willingness to head us uh, back into uh, to deep debt, we are staring down the face of a massive deficit for many years to come. What benefits will my children and their children receive for the taxes that they will be paying for many years? to cover this massive exercise in political pork barrelling that we see today. I contend there will be none. There is very little, if anything, in this new package, or the last one from late last year for that matter, that builds future productive capacity. It is all one-off spending that, sure, will temporarily boost economic activity and will show up in the figures, but will not jumpstart any ongoing or lasting future economic activity. There is a generally accepted rule that a government should only go into deficit to fund activities that will benefit those who will have to repay that deficit. For example, to fund major infrastructure that will have a life of 20, 30, 40 or 50 years and will deliver ongoing benefits to taxpayers throughout those periods. But to place the burden of interest and principal payments on our children and grandchildren to fund one-off cash splashes that will only increase economic activity in the periods in which they are spent is both irresponsible and inequitable. To make things worse, the bills tabled in the House today include one seeking authorisation to increase borrowings by an amazing $125 billion, from their current authorisation of up to $75 billion to an astounding $200 billion. Let me restate that. Mr Rudd is asking if he can extend the limit on his credit card from $75 billion to $200 billion. He has no collateral. He has no plan setting out how he intends to pay it back either. And he hasn't told the Australian people what services he will have to cut in the future to pay in order to be able to afford to pay the interest that he's going to have on a $200 billion credit card. That, if he takes it to his limit, could be up to around $20 billion per annum just in interest, and that's $20 billion you can't spend on services or on schools. And worse, even if Mr Rudd remains Prime Minister for a number of terms, there is almost no chance that it will be him who has to make the hard decisions required to actually pay the credit card off. It will be future governments and, and inevitably it will be the future coalition government that will have to come in and clean up the mess. It took us the best part of 10 years to pay off the $96 billion the last Labor government left us after a series of temporary deficits. 
In a little over 10 months in office, the new Labor government has wiped out our surplus. And here, a few months later, we have this Labor government taking us back deep into debt. And for what outcome? Like the last economic stimulus package, we will see nothing more than a short-term upward blip in economic activity and no long-term solutions providing ongoing economic benefits. Neoclassical economic theory has long decried the effectiveness of lump sum payments in promoting economic growth, suggesting that individuals are more likely to adjust their spending habits when faced with permanent income changes, such as tax cuts, rather than once-off windfall payments like the Prime Minister's flagrantly populist pre-Christmas spending spree and this newest massive cash splash. In short, Labor have panicked, and each of their responses to this crisis have been ill thought out and, quite frankly, threatened to undermine the economic and political freedoms the previous coalition government fought so hard to uphold. In addition to this heavy-handed, potentially ineffectual policy initiative, which will do little other than burden future generations with debt, the government's bungled bank guarantee has left many Australians in dire straits, with savings frozen in investment and in mortgage accounts. According to the Financial Review, the amount of bank debt guaranteed by the Senator Rudd government— Senator Bushby, your time has expired. Senator Seward. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. During, um, there are, in fact, two issues that I um, wish to cover today um, in, when we're talking about matters of public interest. Two issues that, that uh, once again came to the fore, or one in particular came to the fore during the break of the summer break, and that was whaling, and one also that um, is also very close to my heart, and that is the state government. Um, last week, the Western Australia State Government last week proposed to put a road through the heart of the Fitzgerald River National Park. A park, uh, the road would be proposed to go through from Bemmer Bay through to Hopetown. And the Premier proposed this as in response to BHP closing its laterite nickel mile in uh, mine in Ravensthorpe, a mine uh, a closure that resulted in, in um, eighteen hundred workers being put off and uh, which will have a dire impact on both Ravensthorpe and Hopetown, Hopetown in particular, where 200 new houses were built to accommodate these workers. And the Premier's response is, let's build a road, a road from Hopetown to Bremer Bay, which not only will cost a fortune, but more importantly, will, will complete, is complete environmental vandalism and will destroy the wilderness and biodiversity values of what is acknowledged as one of the most important national parks in Australia and, in fact, in the world, because it also happens to be at the heart of one of the world's 25 biodiversity hotspots. So how, did the, how does the Premier propose to help, so-called help, these workers and these areas that have been put off? It's build a road that will damage the very thing that is encouraging people to come to that region to look at, and that is the, bio, that is the biodiversity of the Fitzgerald River National Park. This park is a biosphere uh, reserve under the UNESCO Man in the Biosphere Convention and forms part of an, a global network of these biosphere reserves. Australia is a signatory to this international um, convention and we believe um, has obligations to uphold the protection of this area, although the Man in the Biosphere uh, Convention doesn't have the same legislative backing that the World Heritage Convention does, the Migratory Species in Australia does and the Ramsar Convention um, does. Um, we believe that it does have obligate. It does confer obligations on the national government or the Australian government to look after the values of this area. This area is declared as a biosphere reserve um, by definition. Uh, 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 in 1978, and there was a local committee formed in 1986 um, to look after the area. I will put on the, on the record that I am deeply attached to this park. I used to live very close to it, and I know the park uh, very well. This is, um, as I said, the Biosphere Reserve, or the Fitzgerald River National Park, is one of 25 um, of uh, biodiversity hotspots around the world. This, these, are so, these are called biodiversity hotspots because they have some of the, most, the richest and most threatened areas in the world, the richest in terms of plant diversity and biodiversity. The park contains 250 plant and animal species identified as rare or geographically uh, restricted. It is extremely rich in, in flowering plants, um, as well as lichens, mosses and fungi. It's a relatively small park, it's 330,000 hectares, but it contains 1,900 1900 species of plants, nearly 20 per cent of the total number of plants in Western Australia. 
So nearly 20 per cent of the plants in Western Australia are found in this small park. Um, it has some of the greatest biodiversity, not only in Australia, but on the planet. When you consider that we have lost so much in Australia, we have lost so much globally, and yet we are still proposing these archaic responses such as, let's go and destroy, bulldoze a road through and dis destroy more of the, of the uh, world's biodiversity. 62 of the plant species are found only in Fitzgerald River National Park, with a further 48 species more or less confined to the park. These include the royal hakea. And if you've ever seen a royal hakea, you'll never forget what a royal hakea looks like. It's one of the most gorgeous flamboyant flower, uh, plants you could, you could you come across. The scarlet and showy um, uh, banksias, the uh, feather flowers, the bell fruit mallies, and many other eucalypts and bottle brushes and pea flowers that are found nowhere else on the planet. This biodiversity of plants is a haven for native animals and birds. It is home to 19 um, species of native mammals, making it an extremely important reserve for that as well, because those mammals are found um, increasingly nowhere else. Many of these species are dieback prone, and those in the east, I realise that dieback is, is a problem in the east, but not such a problem in Western Australia. So you may not appreciate when, when people that care about nature hear about um, a species being, bio, uh, being dieback prone, it sends shivers up your spine. Because once it's in an area, it is almost, almost impossible to get rid of. And Western Australia, a lot of plant species in Western Australia um, have already been devastated by the various forms of dieback. It's not just one. It's, Phytophthora is the most commonly known species, but it's not just Phytophthora. Um, and this, that very fact alone, being prone to dieback, should put this, re this road off the agenda because putting a road through will open up that area to dieback. This diversity of plants, as I said, is a, it's a haven to um, native animals and birds. Several species of um, mammals, in fact, were thought to be extinct, have recently been rediscovered in the park. These include the dibbler, which is a small and um, secretive carnivore with distinctive white rings around its eyes, and the heath rat, um, which the heath rat, which was thought to be extinct for many years until it was found in the park in the 1980s. There's the short ridges native mouse, as well as the woylie and the tamer tamo wallaby. And very importantly, there's the ground parrot, which is the best known of the three endangered birds that are in the park. Um, the ground parrot was once found across the whole of the south, um, southwest coast, but is now restricted to very small areas in the Fitzgerald River and the Cape um, Arid National Parks. And of course, these are restricted in these areas because we have cleared so much of our native vegetation um, throughout Western Australia and in that south coast area. The ground parrots are ground nesting birds. They are threatened by the predation from foxes and cats, as well as altered fire regimes. Fire regimes, again, in, the, in this national park are extremely important because there are so many fire-sensitive um, species. Um, and unfortunately, we, unfortunately, we have had a number of wildfire fly, fires through that area, but the, um, the, the park is, is, they try to manage the park in order to reduce the spread of wildfires. The proposed, the proposed road um, threatens critical habitat for the ground parrot within this park. There's also the western bristlebird, um, which, is an, which is another well-known threatened species in Western Australia. Um, we, um, as, I, uh, as I touched on um, previously, um, this area is prone to dieback. Unfortunately, um, through and I, I understand it was originally introduced when a track was pushed through the park called the Bell Track um, to facilitate mining exploration quite some significant period of time ago in the park. Um, int unfortunately, introduced dieback. DEC, the Department of Environment and Conservation in Western Australia, has spent over $1.3 million just recently eradicating dieback um, from the, or trying to fix the dieback in the park and to, because, that was caused by the, Del, uh, the Bell Track. Um, if this project goes ahead, there is, no, there is absolutely no saying um, that there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that dieback will be introduced and will be introduced into areas of the park that it, that, that it would never otherwise get introduced to. And of course, the Premier uses the excuse of, well, the park's not being properly managed, there's illegal tracks through there at the moment, so therefore, if we build a road, we'll manage it better. Well, how about putting more money into managing the park so that you don't have illegal access to these areas and allow the park to be properly managed? 
over a significant period of time, the management resources into this park have, have uh, been reduced to the point where there's not enough ranges there anymore and there's certainly not enough resources going to the management of the areas. You don't, des you don't try and destroy an area and then say, OK, we'll fix it up by destroying it further. That's absolutely ridiculous. And to try and imply that a road going through from Hopetown, Bremer Bay to Hopetown, is going to solve all the economic problems of the south coast is absolutely ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. It gives false hope to the local community, and also by putting that road through, if you do draw that many that number of increased tour, to, or more tourists, you certainly will be drawing away tourists and and people going through the towns of Jerramungup and the towns of Ravensthorpe. So, if there is any gain, what you gain on one hand, other towns are um, going to are going to significantly um, lose. The other important part of this area of this park is that it's wilderness values. Because it is on the south coast, um, because of the management plans that have been put in place, the management plan has very has a zone, takes a zoned approach, and the, the management plan um, has in it this wilderness zone. And the wilderness zone is particularly important not only for its wilderness value, but because it protects so many of the rare and endangered species um, and the biodiversity of the park. Putting a road through will destroy the wilderness value, and is completely contrary to the management, to the various management plans for the area. For the area. Um, uh, that's the, the, the various management plans that are in place for the, for the park for a significant period of time. Um, we do not believe it's, we believe the premier's response was a knee-jerk response to a very unfortunate situation in Ravensthorpe and Hopetown. There is absolutely no doubt that there needs to be things, uh, money and resources injected into the area to help that area. The Greens have no problem with that. We don't have any problem with the approach of sustainable tourism. In fact, we strongly support eco, um, eco tourism and we believe that a focus on tourism in the park would be a good idea. But invest in the facilities of the air, put in new facilities where the access is already available and where the management plan says those facilities should be put in. Develop a, a, in fact, a, a sustainable tourism plan for the whole of the south coast. And in fact, the conservation groups are already one step ahead of the, of the Premier and have suggested a sustainable tourism blueprint for that region where you could not only improving the infrastructure, sustainably improving the infrastructure in the Fitzgerald River National Park, but you could then link that infrastructure through to other natural areas on the south coast, of which we are blessed with a number, um, and, and including looking at um, the developing up the woodland, the Western Woodlands proposal, which is another a proposal to ensure the protection of the Western, uh, Western Woodlands, another very important ecosystem. But a little bit of forethought into this could actually have very positive outcomes in terms of increasing um, visitation to the area based on the natural values of the area, which are so unique. They are found nowhere else on the planet. The Premier says it's going to cost $50 million. That was a, that was a, a figure that was, in fact, um, developed a significant period of time ago, and I fail to see how you can build a highway through that very rugged area, or a road, sealed road through that very rugged area, um, which is 80 kilometres for $50 million, when it necessitates putting bridges over at least three or four estuaries, um, and which will be engineering feats in um, in themselves. Um, and I'm, I doubt very much that the Premier has actually looked at the figures. Uh, in any meaningful way. Of course, they're calling on the federal government, which is another reason why I'm bringing this issue here, besides the fact that I think the federal government need to be looking after the biodiversity of that region. They're applying for federal, they want to apply for federal government funding for this road under infrastructure development. It is completely inappropriate for the federal government to invest in such a road that will destroy an utterly unique biodiverse area that the federal government has obligations to ensure is protected. The Greens urge the federal government to send this proposal back to the Premier, saying it is completely inappropriate and unacceptable, and they will only invest in sustainable development in that area. It is completely inappropriate and a knee-jerk reaction for the Premier to pr propose a road around an area to encourage tourists around an area to come to encourage tourists to come and see that an area. The, the road itself will destroy the very things that the Premier wants tourists to come and see. So the message is go home and redo your plan, Premier, and come up with a truly sustainable tourism management strategy for the South Coast. Now, the link to whaling here is very is 
I'll, in, the, in my last minute, I'll just refer very quickly to the IWC announcement that was made yesterday with the possible com com compromise with Japan on the Fitzgerald um, River. In fact, I have stood on many occasions at Point Anne looking at the glorious whales directly off the coast of Western Australia, off the coast of the Fitzgerald River National Park. The IWC yesterday made its announcement, its open secret, that it was proposing a compromise with Japan that will, would facilitate them probably getting out of the south coast but, incorporate, but entrenching whaling, coastal whaling. So what is my question to the government here is very strongly, at what level were you involved in those discussions? The, the government has to distance itself completely from any compromise on whaling that would see Japan simply moving its whaling from the Southern Ocean to the Northern Pacific. A whale is, a, still, a, a value, is still important whether it's in the Southern Ocean or whether it's in Japan. Japan gets what it wants. All along it has wanted to be able to undertake commercial whaling. This compromise, so-called compromise, sellout is more the case, by the IWC simply entrenches commercial whaling for Japan. It is unacceptable. Australia has to completely distance itself from any such compromise. Australians are very clear. No whaling. Not, it's not no whaling just in the Southern Ocean. It's no whaling. And Australia should have nothing further to do with these negotiations, should distance itself from these negotiations and be very clear that it is an unacceptable compromise. I'm aware that conservation groups around the world are Senator writing... Seawood, your time has expired. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today to talk about a matter of public interest out of concern for Western Australian workers. Workers who the West Australian government would see fit to leave out of the critical work of nation building. Workers who the West Australian government would leave out of our nation's new fair work legislation. And I say, in this time of global economic uncertainty in which people are losing their jobs, people want, need and deserve security and certainty. Security and certainty in their employment system. Now, Madam Deputy President, more than ever, they want to see fair industrial relationships. And the Rudd Labor government is giving the nation tools to shore up economic and industrially, to shore us up economically and industrially against this global economic tidal wave. But I have to say, the West Australian government seems to be attempting to distract West Australians' attention from its failure to handle the consequences of the current international economic crisis in Western Australia. It seems to, to be bent on wanting to hark back to the failures of work choices and the divisive relationships it put in place. The WA government seems to want to use workers as a scapegoat for being asleep at the wheel. There is one thing I agree with the West Australian government about. In its submission to the Senate Education, Employment and Workplace Relations Committee inquiry into the Rudd government's Fair Work Bill, the government did say, it is critical in the current economic climate that workplace laws encourage flexibility, productivity and business confidence. I couldn't agree more. But in the same paragraph, they also said, the WA government is concerned that the bargaining, transfer of business, unfair dismissal and right of entry provisions of the bill will negatively affect West Australian workplaces. I say this is patently untrue. Similarly, the federal opposition is incorrectly implying that the Fair Work Bill will cost jobs. This is scaremongering and scapegoating at its best. They're trying to bring us back to the old work choices debate that was held and lost at the last election, a debate that was played out and lost on the vote of the Australian people. They are trying to manipulate feelings of insecurity about the consequences of the global economic downturn and attach them to the government's fair work legislation. But as Unions WA Secretary Dave Robinson said at the Perth hearings of the Fair Work Bill inquiry, if there ever was a time for improved workplace laws, it is certainly now, as the global economic crisis is felt all across all nations, with working people suffering considerably 
from the fallout. The industrial landscape must change in a way that affords these millions of Australian workers the rights and protections that are necessary in such a global economic downturn. Yet the WA government continues to scaremonger about the right of entry provisions in the proposed legislation. There have been no complaints about right of entry and inspection records in WA, where we currently have such provisions. WA Liberals don't want to sign up to a unified national system of IR laws. They want to keep certain WA workers in unfair industrial relationships. They don't want to be part of our nation-building exercise. And I say this is tragic given the scale of job losses in my home state. And I'll give you just a few examples. We've had uh, from Argyle Diamonds uh, some 300 to 500 uh, workers. Uh, from Newcrest Mining at Telfar, um, some 400 workers are projected to lose their jobs. From, what, from uh, uh, Waterloo, Noralisk Nickel, 150 workers. And uh, from Rio Tinto's head office, some 600 workers. And that's just a few examples uh, from the list I have of the current uh, job losses that Western Australia is facing in the mining industry. But I say workers and their unions are already part of the bigger plan for our country. In WA, we have already seen workers with Alcoa forfeit pay rises to help ensure that production remains competitive in this tough economic climate. Unions are working hand in hand with people who are losing jobs in the mining sector, providing practical support, counselling and finding new employment opportunities. These very same unions have approached the WA state government to say, let's work together, like they're doing in Queensland with tripartite arrangements between business, government and unions. But there's been a deafening silence from the West Australian state government. And it's a crying shame because now more than ever we need partnership and cooperation. The Rudd government is working hard to reduce the impact of the current global economic crisis on families and jobs. We have a massive nation-building plan before us, a plan that will provide jobs during this period of economic downturn, both through new infrastructure projects and by encouraging consumer spending, a plan that will provide financial assistance to those ordinary Australians who are most likely to be adversely affected by the downturn, to minimise the harm that it will inevitably inflict on workers and families. A plan that will at the same time set Australia up to get maximum benefit from economic recovery when it comes, by enhancing our productive capacity. The infrastructure uh, projects that this government is supporting will improve our productive capacity by ensuring that our essential productive capacity, such as roads, ports and railways and our broadband network, are of first-class standard. But even more importantly, as we've seen this week, We've got all our new spending on education and training, enhancing Australia's productive capacity by ensuring that our greatest resource, our people, are ready to take advantage of the benefits a global recovery will bring when it comes. We need to be ready for jobs of the future as part of a flexible workforce under a fair industrial relations system, including new jobs in a greener economy. We should make no mistake. A responsible carbon pollution reduction scheme and a single national industrial relations system for private sector workers are essential steps to modernise Australia. And it's in this capacity, and it is this capacity to take full advantage of the global re recovery, to seize new job opportunities and new business opportunities as soon as they arise. That we must ensure, this we must ensure, if we are to maximise, uh, so if we're to minimise the negative impact of this downturn on the fiscal position of Australian governments and on the welfare of Australian people. It is this task that needs to be the focus of all Australian governments and for all sides of politics right now, not some worn out, irrelevant debate about industrial relations. Labor knows this, 
The union movement knows this. The question is, does the federal opposition, and in particular, does the West Australian state government? The WA government needs to work with the federal Labor government to facilitate the rollout of funds to support communities, to provide them with the facilities that they require for the future and for the jobs that they desperately need right now. Improvements to primary and secondary schools, local government projects and public housing. For the sake of all Australians, I hope the West Australian government has its priorities right. My home, state my, my, home, um, my home state rode the biggest boom in years under a state Labor government, and by rights, by virtue of its natural resources and the resourcefulness of its people, I believe WA will also play a crucial part in leading the way to recovery, if the WA government plays its part. If Troy Buswell can resist the temptation to try and score cheap political points by attempting to revive a debate over industrial relations that the last federal election settled once and for all. If the coalition can stay focused on the real task at hand, WA is going to benefit and so in the process will the rest of the country. Thank you. Senator Boswell. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. The matter of public interest I wish to raise is the heavily compromised Treasury's modelling of the government's proposed emission trading scheme. I refer senators, the media and the public to the former head of ABEA, Dr Brian Fisher's review of the Treasury modelling which was commissioned by the Senate Select Committee on Fuel and Energy and released this week. He found that many of the uh, really important conclusions reached by the Treasury modelling were basically out of the ballpark because the underlying assumptions were totally unrealistic. The modelling is only as good as the inputs that go in, and Dr Fisher has raised serious questions about the validity of those assumptions, not least because the government won't tell us how those key assumptions were arrived at and by whom. A cynical exercise in political manipulation has gone on here. Dr Fisher's review shows how the assumptions used by Treasury at government orders were so wrong that they materially affected the outcome of the modelling. As Dr Fisher states on page 6, the interaction of these assumptions is likely to result in the Treasury modelling seriously underestimating the economy-wide and territorial challenges associated with the particular emissions reduction targets, particularly in the short to medium term. The implications are especially important for Australia's emission-intensive trade-exposed EITE industries and for the electricity generation sector. Dr Fisher reveals on page 21, and I quote, Treasury officials have been advised the committee have been advised the committee that the uh, scenarios that were modelled by Treasury were done at the direction of the government. As one example, on page nine, Dr Fisher found that in the case of agriculture, it is unclear how the large emission reductions would be achieved in the face of substantial increases in output relative to the level in 2008, as suggested by the sectorial result of the Treasury modelling in a country where competitors will continue to depend on extensive rangeland agricultural production of sheep and cattle. It is difficult to imagine that technology will become available in the near future to enable major reductions in the methane output from rangeland agriculture. As the former head of ABEA, Dr Fisher knows what he's talking about and points out on page 30 that, and I quote again, just because agriculture is excluded from the scheme in the first five years does not mean the farm costs will not rise. Suppliers of input, such as electricity and diesel, will have to purchase permits, and a large share of those costs will be passed on. In the cropping sector, almost 40 per cent of the import costs come from emissions-intensive inputs. 
while in livestock the share is about 17 per cent. Uh, Competitors in key developing uh, counts, uh, countries will not be subject to such cost increases. He also notes on page 31 that the competitive impact on the IET industries of an ETS is likely to be felt most keenly in regional and remote Australia, often in locations with limited alternative sources of economic activity of such high value. So rural Australia is being asked to pay for the green guilt of those in the leafy suburbs, the rural voters of far less weight to run than the green vote. And that's what this is all about in the end. Dr Fisher's review highlights the utter absurdity of the Treasury modelling relying on the assumption that the world implements emission reduction arrangements through a global emission trading scheme with strong coordinated global actions. He notes on page 18 that this is fundamental to results that yield relatively modest, modest emission prices and aggregate economic cost of mitigation policies in Australia. It also helps to determine core conclusions about Australia's early mover benefits, positive improvements in the competitive of many EIT sectors, and the ease which Australia's economy, including the electricity sector, transforms to a low emission future. From this premise, Tre Treasury's analytical framework yields a self-reinforcing, virtuous circle of domestic and international benefits. The international action assumption of two Gano scenarios in the Treasury modelling are particularly optimistic based as they are on a global emission trading scheme covering all economies and sources of emissions from 2013. Just how realistic is it that US, China and India will move together with us to commit to binding carbon reduction commitments. Just last week, the new US President, Obama, stated, and I quote, to protect our climate and our collective security, we must call together a truly global coalition. I've made it clear that we'll act, but so too must the world. And Hillary Clinton weighed in. The Secretary of State on Monday argued that no solution is feasible without all major emitting nations. That doesn't uh, sound to me like Obama is going anywhere without China or India. So I wish Senator Cameron was here because I'd like to ask him personally. So why is Australia putting jobs at risk by going ahead with a flawed scheme well before the rest of the world? Why are we selling out Australian jobs to our competitors? at a time of global financial crisis. Dr Fisher concludes on page 35 that, and I quote, there is little in the recent experience of international climate change negotiations that points the way to the Treasury scenario of strong coordinated global action involving all major emitters. If anything, the position of rapidly growing developing countries in global climate change forums has hardened. In reality, there is almost no prospect of non-annexed B countries taking on binding emissions restraints. The best that could be hoped for in coming years is for the developing countries to engage gradually in an international framework via policy-based commitments. Yet Treasury was told to assume that if Australia reduced emissions by 5 per cent, the world would agree to 19 per cent reduction while allowing China to increase their emissions by 172 per cent and India to increase theirs by 99 per cent. And I can't see uh, Congress, the American Congress, going, uh, going to agree with that, and I don't think it would go down too well with them. Dr Fisher observes on page 36, and I quote, that there is little doubt that the Chinese government has adopted an ambitious climate change-related domestic policy program but this should not be taken as an indication that China is prepared to adopt binding targets in an international regime. In other words, he says, China's position in global climate change negotiation resolves around one, 
demands that industrialised countries first commit to massive reductions in emissions. Two, demands for large-scale technology transfers and financial support. And three, using the legal framework of the UNFCCC to avoid any attempt to see it take on commitments sooner than other de developing economies. The Treasury modelling assumptions appear to regard China's position in international climate change negotiations as a giant bluff. India is the world's fifth largest global uh, gas emis emitter, accounting for about 5 per cent of global emissions. Dr Fisher makes the point on page 37 that, and I quote again, in general India's stance in international climate change negotiations is viewed as less accommodating than, than that of China. India has maintained a firm position that developing nations must first commit to very large emission reductions in the order of 80 per cent by 2050, before developing countries take on commitments to constrain emissions. At this stage, India has pledged only that its per person GHG emissions will at no point exceed that of developed countries. When you consider that India's emissions are 70 per cent below the world average on a per capita basis, India has a long, long way to go before it commits to any real reductions. Meanwhile, back at the US ranch, Dr Fisher reports on page 38 that President Obama's envoy, Senator John Kerry, made it clear that large developing countries such as China and India would have to take on some kind of target before US ratification of an international agreement that is not consistent with Treasury modelling. On page 39, Dr Fisher concludes, in short, there is little prospect of the United States agreeing in the near term to anything approaching the national emissions allocations framework modelled by the Treasury. The modelling re relies on especially heroic assumptions in terms of the timing and the nature of future US commitments to emission reduction targets within an international agreement. And because the government told Treasury to assume there was strong coordinated global action the problem of carbon leakage simply disappears. So green commentators and government ministers can get up and say Treasury modelling found carbon leakage is not a problem. But that is patently false. In the real world, where there is no global strong action, it will be a huge problem. As Dr Fisher says on page 27, with its uh, inter international action assumptions, the Treasury modelling largely assumes a way that Garnet described as the truly dreadful problem of Australia's EIT industries facing a carbon price while their international competitors take no action. Following my estimate questions, everyone now knows that Treasury modelling did not factor in the global crisis. The world is, the world is now fractured, time-wise, into pre-global crisis and after-global crisis. This Treasury modelling that the government is pinning all its arguments on is pre-global uh, pre, pre, uh, crisis. It belongs to another world, not the one we're in now, where no one knows what tomorrow will bring, not even Treasury. The folly of using pre-global uh, crisis modelling must be recognised. As Dr Fisher states on page 42, the Treasury modelling exercise and much of the decision-making on scheme design has assumed often explicitly a continuation of strong global and domestic growth, both in the implementation phase of the ETS and the longer term. It seems so obvious, yet the government has not recast its modelling or assumptions, but continues to run with the pre-GC scenario of events. And events are moving fast. As we all know, budget forecasts are obsolete practically from the day they are released. And yet Senator Carr and Senator Wong and Senator Conroy all want us to sign up to an EDS justified by ancient history. Not only that, their modelling isn't even based on their white paper policy. The government policy in the white paper is that even if the rest of the world does nothing, Australia will go for a 5 per cent reduction in emission 2000 levels by 2020. 
but the Treasury 5 per cent scenario assumes equivalent climate change policies in overseas countries. Moreover, as pointed out by Dr Fisher on page 63, Treasury modelling published prior to the release of the White Paper does not analyse the revised shielding scheme for emissions intensive trade exposed industries. Neither does it analyse the effect of a permit price cap in the first five years. In summary, says Dr Fisher, the Treasury modelling does not actually model the government's preferred policy approach. A complete analysis and assessment of this economic cost and benefits of the government's preferred policy approach has yet to be published by Treasury. The sleight of hand used with the Treasury modelling has served to conceal the hard facts about the very real burdens if Australia pursues carbon reduction alone ahead of the rest of the world. On page 34, Dr Fisher concludes that more realistic assumptions on global action means higher emission prices, higher cost of emission re reductions, less or no gains from early action, greater competitive disadvantage for our trade, exposed industries and the risk of serious disruption of our energy, sec uh, energy sector. Dr Fisher worked out how much EDS will cost today's dollars using the discount rate of 1.4%. In present value terms, the cost of mitigation for the lowest 5 per cent scenario is $1.264 trillion, which is greater than the entire value of our GDP. And the Rudd government wants to put us through all this at a time of global financial crisis. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move that the Senate uh, be suspended till 2 p.m. The question is that the Senate stands suspended until 2 p.m. Those in favour say aye, against say no. I think the ayes have it.
Questions without notice. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. Will the Minister outline for the Senate exactly how many years the budget will remain in deficit? Good question. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> dear, oh dear. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, the global recession has led to deficits around the world. The IMF predicts that the deficits of advanced economies will rise to an average 
of 7 per cent of GDP in 2009. The fact that those opposite, Mr President, still do not understand the severity of the global conditions and do not understand how that impacts on deficits in Australia is an indictment on those opposite. Because it is very relevant to talk about world conditions when you're talking about how long Australia will be in deficit. That is why it is relevant to this answer, Mr. President. The fact that those opposite don't like that doesn't make it irrelevant to the question, because the state of the international economy bears directly on the length and the severity of the impact on the Australian economy. And it goes to the heart of the question that those opposite are asking. So, as I noted yesterday, government tax revenue has collapsed by $75 billion over the forward estimates since my EFO. $115 billion since the budget. $115 billion since the budget. In the midst of this global recession, it would be irresponsible not to act swiftly and decisively to support jobs and invest in nation building. The reduction, the redu you just go on believing Order. that. Resume, the reduction. Resume your seat, Sen resume your seat. S Senator Coonan. Mr. President, uh, I do have a point of order, and it relates to uh, the standing order requirement that the minister be directly relevant to the question in his answer. He was asked very specifically a timing question, how many years the Australian budget will remain in deficit. So far, he hasn't addressed that at all. Senator Ludwig. President, uh, on the point of order, this is exactly the difficulty that these questions pose. The uh, good Senator, Senator Conroy, is providing a directly relevant answer to the question. The difficulty is always is the framing of the question suggests an answer. In this instance, what it does is try to pin it down by saying how many years. But if you listen to Senator Conroy's answer, the answer provides the answer. In other words, Senator Conroy is answering directly the question in doing so by explaining about the global financial crisis, how countries just, around just the world resume, are in. Just resume your seat. When there's quiet, we will proceed. When there's quiet, we will proceed. Senator Ludwig, you're on a point of order. Thank you. And the global financial crisis around the world leads to a recessionary outcome. But what Senator Conroy is explaining for those opposite, which Senator Coonan does not seem to grasp, is the way the process will go forward. But I don't want to debate the matter. The simple question is, is that they presuppose an answer. Senator Conroy is on point and is directly relevant to it. Senator, Senator Conroy, you have 10 seconds remaining in the primary question and primary answer. You have uh, 10 seconds in which to address the question that has been raised by Senator Coonan. Well, thank you, Mr President. Treasury and Finance have been working around the clock to ensure the government could release robust forecasts as quickly Senator as Conroy, possible. Senator Conroy, your time has expired. S Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you. Uh, Resume your seat, Senator Coonan. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I note that uh, Senator Conroy is, um, is struggling with how many years the budget will remain in deficit. Could he try this as a supplementary? Will the minister outline exactly how many years our children will be paying off Labor's new debt? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the, mil the minister. Minister. Absolutely. Oh. Minister. So, Liberal debt is OK and ours is no, it's oh, OK. Order. Yeah. It's not debating time. It's question time. You're required to answer the question. Continue. Thank you, Mr President. The government will return the budget to surplus after the global recession is through, specifically, specifically as the economy recovers and grows above trend. The government will take action to return the budget to surplus by banking any increases in tax receipts 
associated with the economic recovery, while maintaining our commitment to keep taxation as a share of GDP on average below, below the level we inherited from those opposite, and holding real growth in spending to 2 per cent a year until the budget returns to surplus. Now, as Senator the Prime Conroy, Minister noted your time has expired. Your time has expired. Senator Coonan. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, well, given that we're probably in for many years of uh, deficit, what That's is right. the official government's projection of the annual interest repayments on Labor's new debt? Here. The Minister. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, once again, those opposite are demonstrating their complete lack of understanding of how this economy is working, how a modern economy works. We have made it perfectly clear through the commitments that I have just outlined. We have made it perfectly clear from the commitments that I have just outlined that we will be returning the budget to surplus. Well, the question is actually irrelevant to the subs actually irrelevant to the question as well, just for the record. Yes it Order. is. I won't, I won't give you the call until there's silence, and it's your side that's stopping me calling you, Senator Coonan. Senator Coonan. President, it's uh, a point of order that relates uh, to uh, the requirement to be directly relevant to the question asked. The question directly asked what were the figure, the annual interest repayments on Labor's new debt? Yep. Senator Evans. Uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, on the, on the uh, point of order raised by Senator Coonan, uh, firstly, uh, Senator Conroy was uh, attempting to answer uh, that question in the time available and responding to, uh, to the question. But in uh, speaking of this point of order, Mr. President, can I also draw your attention to the fact that uh, since the new uh, system of question time has been introduced, uh, members of the opposition make commentary before asking each question supplementary. If they're going to argue for relevance, I think we also ought to uh, make sure that there are questions that it doesn't turn into a taking note debate, because that the weight we're going, there'll be about three questions uh, a question time. Senator Abetz. Uh, Mr. President, in your examination and ruling, I would invite you to consider what commentary there was in this supplementary question that Senator Coonan asked. Very simply. What is the official government projection of the annual interest repayment on Labor's new debt? Very straightforward, no commentary, a direct question that under the new standing orders now deserves and indeed requires a directly relevant answer. Order. 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 Senator Faulkner. On the point of order, uh, Mr. President, I listened carefully to um, Senator Abetz's uh, additional uh, point of order and uh, respectfully suggest uh, uh, to you, Mr. President, that uh, there are, of course, new arrangements for question time and there are rules in relation to relevance. And originally, uh, these were designed, these new question time arrangements were designed. Uh, on an understanding that ministers would be provided uh, with some indication of the broad nature of questions that, that is true, Senator, that were to be asked by the opposition. Well, this is a very, my, point of, my, my additional uh, point of order, Mr. President, is to make this point. This is a very specific question, and given the nature, and given the nature of the changes, the, uh, the opposition has taken the relevance point but failed, of course, to deliver on what Senator Ferguson first proposed, which is indication to ministers of the broad nature of questions that would be asked. Don't argue re relevance when your own, when, Senator, don't Order. argue relevance when you haven't delivered on the other element of what you designed as a new question time arrangement. Senator Macdonald. On the uh, point of order, Mr Chairman, uh, Mr President, if Senator Faulkner is, why, is correct, then Senator Conroy's answer should either be uh, a figure or he doesn't know and he'll take it on notice and get back to us. He doesn't need to give us the spiel and spin that we've become used to from Senator Conroy. So I agree with Senator, Con uh, Senator Faulkner 
and uh, Senator Conroy should just say he hasn't got a clue. He'll take it on notice and get back to us. Sen Senator Conroy, I draw to your attention the fact that there's 23 seconds left to answer the question, and you are required to answer the question that has been asked. Senator Conroy. As I was saying, those opposites who have no understanding of how the economy works, they've lost all corporate memory. Increased borrowing to fund the temporary deficit will impose a short-term cost on the budget. And on current projections, on current order, your time has expired. I was just about to give you the answer. I was just order, about Senator Conroy, your. Senator Conroy, your time has expired. Those, if those on my left want, want to hear the answer, you will need to be quiet. Senator Farrell. Mr. President, uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, uh, Senator Evans. Can the minister please explain to the Senate what the impact of the failure to pass the government's nation building and jobs plan package would be? The leader. Thank you, Mr. President. Order. I, I thank the senator. Order. order. Resume your seat, uh, Senator Macdonald. Order, Mr. President. Would you uh, consider that that question is hypothetical, and would rule accordingly? I'll, I'll review the question at the end of question time. Se senator Evans. Thank you, Mr. President. I understand that Senator Macdonald may be nervous uh, with the extraordinary decision taken today by the opposition to oppose the government's nation building and jobs plan. I think it is an extraordinary day in Australian politics. Mr President, in the middle of a global financial crisis, when all economies are under enormous pressure, where the IMF is, uh, has revised downward its projections for the economies on at least three occasions in recent months where they are predicting we will have negative growth if we don't no, no, act no, no. decisively now. The government has taken uh, strong and decisive action to try and protect jobs, to boost the economy and to assist families. In taking that action, we followed the advice of all the international economic organisations uh, and have, and have uh, mirrored action taken in all the Western uh, economies around the world to try and protect their economies from the worst impacts of the, uh, of the global financial crisis. And when this government takes important, decisive action, what does the opposition do? They say we're going to vote against it and we're going to attempt to block your attempts to bolster the economy and to protect Australian jobs. They want to stop us protecting Australian jobs. That's the extraordinary order, position we're order. at today. Senator, Senator Evans, resume your seat. I won't give you the call, Senator Macdonald, until it's quiet. Simple as that. Senator Macdonald. President, I again raise the point of order, uh, understanding Order 73, that this question is hypothetical. Uh, the question asked if this passage was voted down. Now, surely the opposition's view is known, but this Senate comprises other people besides the uh, opposition. And Mr. President, uh, the question is hypothetical. Order. Order on my right. Order. <laughs> on my right, order. Senator Macdonald is in. Senator Macdonald. Mr. President, you can tell from the interjections from the other side that they know that what I am saying is 100 per cent true. This question is hypothetical and should be ruled out of order. As I undertook, I will review the question at the end of question time and get back, if necessary. On the point of order? On the point of, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Clearly, the uh, Senator is uh, looking at Rule 73, and it goes down through a range of matters which questions shall not be asked, which goes to, uh, for an expression of opinion, for a statement of the government's policy and uh, so on and so forth, but it also includes uh, in G uh, hypothetical matter. Uh, in this respect, it is a question that's been asked of the leader of the government about uh, these issues, and it is quite within—it uh, is quite within—it is quite within—it is quite within 
the remit of this government to ask that question of the leader and for the leader to deal with it. Just it resume a, your seats, Senator Ludwig. Order. Senator Ludwig. And within that, within that, we are talking about a real issue that is uh, confronting us. It is not a hypothetical matter. But of course, even within that, within that framework of 73 rules for questions, there has always been, there has always been, although is not conceded in this instance, a broad latitude to provide for the answers to the question. Senator Ludwig, I've already indicated to the chamber that the question will stand. I will review the comments that have been made, the points of order by Senator Macdonald at the end of uh, question time and get back to the chamber if necessary. Senator Evans. Thank you, Mr President. I can understand the extraordinary sensitivity that Senator Macdonald and the Liberal Party have about this issue because it is incredible to think, it's incredible to think that their position now is they don't support uh, us trying to protect Australian jobs, they don't support us providing assistance to families, they don't support us providing assistance to small business, they don't support us trying to ensure that this economy grows and that people continue to have, uh, have jobs. They are so out of touch that they would rather take, take uh, smart aleck debating points than examine the real needs of this economy to protect Australian jobs, and I urge them to reverse their decision. Resume your seat, Senator Farrell. I, I remind senators that there is a time for debating answers at the end of question time. That's why we take note of answers at uh, the end of question time. That's the appropriate time. Senator Farrell. I have a supplementary uh, question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, <clears throat> could the minister uh, please detail to the Senate uh, the impact on low- and middle-income earners and families if the package is not passed? Well, they might have to pay the minister. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, as Australian families uh, know, the government is attempting to provide them with financial support, both to support them and to boost economic, acti ac economic activity to protect jobs. People know jobs are at threat. We've already seen large numbers of redundancies. This is a real economic crisis. What we want to do is support families. We're trying to give 8.7 million individuals a tax bonus of $950, but the opposition say, no, don't do that. We're trying to find a way to give 2.8 million children $950 as a back-to-school bonus, $950 to help families meet the costs of getting the kids back to school. But the opposition say don't do that. We want to help 1.5 million families with the bonus, single income families. But the opposition says don't support Australian families. We're going to stop you giving them the economic support you propose and protecting Australian jobs. Wake up Senator to yourselves. Evans, You're your so time out of touch. Has expired. Order. Order. Senator Senator Stirl. Senator Carr. I'm waiting for a question from Senator Farrell. Senator Farrell. I have another uh, supplementary uh, question, uh, Mr. President. Uh, what will the impact on delivering essential community infrastructure be if the government's package is not passed? The Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, the government's plans include a $28 billion investment in infrastructure, investment in schools, housing, local roads, investment that will benefit communities for the long term but will also provide jobs now, will employ Australians, employ Australians who are under threat from the global financial crisis. So we're investing in the future, investing in infrastructure, investing in our schools and our roads, and we're providing jobs. But the opposition say, don't do that. Don't invest in Australia. Don't invest in jobs. We're going to do everything we can to stop you providing that support to the Australian economy. Every PNC in Australia 
should tune in that the opposition says don't build them a new hall, don't, don't uh, replace uh, classrooms that are under, under, uh, in need of reconstruction. Don't help Australian communities, don't help Australian families. You, the opposition is so out of Order. touch with Resume. Australians, Mr President, Senator Evans. I urge them to Senator change their Evans. mind. Resume your seat. Senator Cormann, you will withdraw that comment. I withdraw. Thank you. Stand up and withdraw. That's the normal withdraw, practice. Withdraw, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you. You're, I did. S Senator. Order. I can only proceed with order in the chamber. Senator Troth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. Can the Minister confirm that the cumulative budget deficit will be $118 billion over the next four years? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator, uh, Senator Conroy. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, can I thank uh, for that question, Senator Troth? Uh, the government is working responsibly on the budget deficit. Let me be clear, because when it comes to this issue, there are a number of private sector, a number of private sector endorsements of the budget and the budget stimulus package, which goes to the heart of the question of what is the appropriate size of the deficit. Dr. David Degaris, the senior economist at NAB Capital, stated it was a sizable fiscal stimulus and I think appropriate in the circumstances, both in terms of the size of the stimulus and also its construction. ANZ Economics. The moves have been decisive and preemptive, thus giving policy the best chance of minimising the damage to employment. So let's be clear about this. There is endorsement across the country for this package. The deficit for 2008-9 will be $22.5 billion. That is 1.9 per cent of GDP. And the government's fiscal strategy aims to ensure fiscal sustainability. Because when you look at what's happening around the world, most major industrial countries will have deficits in 2009. And those opposite who are seeking, those opposite who are seeking to pin their hopes on avoiding a deficit or reducing the deficit should understand exactly the state of the world economy. We have the US deficit will surge to 9.5 per cent of GDP in 2009. That's a $1.2 trillion, and that is inclusive of President Obama's fiscal stimulus. The European Commission projects the UK's deficit will rise four percentage points to 8.8 per .8 cent of GDP. And in Senator Japan, Conroy, the deficit your is time forecast. Has expired. Senator Troth. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Minister, you did not answer the question, so I'll ask you is it the case that the budget would, in fact, have remained in surplus at, for at least this financial year, but for the government's reckless cash splash? The, uh, the Minister. That's right. I, I actually. Order. No, Thank you, Mr. President. I, I do recollect. I think that some of my colleagues are interjecting that uh, those opposite actually voted for it. But let's be clear about this. Let's be let's be absolutely clear. As was revealed on Monday, the the size of the collapse in revenue has driven has driven us into deficit. The size of the collapse in revenue has driven us. On top of that, on top of that, we have now put in place a stimulus package. And what you have to decide, what you have to decide is whether or not you are actually going to stand behind your leader or all of those like Mr. Costello who went out last night and tried to preempt him on it and force him into this position. You've got to get right behind Mr. Turnbull on this. You've got to stick by him on this, because this is going to cost Australians jobs. Let's be clear. Senator Conroy, Australians your time has expired. Of what you're Resume planning to your do. seat. Senator Order. Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr. President. I refer to make, to make my point further. I refer to the Prime Minister's press conference on the 2nd of February last, 
where he claimed in relation to the $115 billion fall in tax receipts, and I quote, that means an impact directly on our budget. That means, therefore, of course, a temporary budget deficit. Why did the Prime Minister mislead the Australian people, at least in relation to this financial year, about the reasons for the deficit when the deficit is actually a result of the cash splash? The Minister. Well, that is, that is a question just based on a false premise. It's, it is entirely incorrect in the assumptions that underpin it. And let me just be very clear, because the budget deficits, which Senator Troth asked about, of minus 22 billion, minus 35 billion, minus 35 billion, and minus 25 billion, we are being driven into this position by international circumstances and the response that we have made, both in the economic security package before the Christmas and the new stimulus package we've announced in the last few days. So let us be clear. You have a very, very simple choice. Are you going to stick with Mr Turnbull and his position and cost jobs and put Australian families on the unemployment queue? That is what you are faced with. And you are going to have a very long weekend to think about this because Australians will lose their job because of the irresponsible short-term Senator Conroy, your time has expired. Resume in. your seats. Order. Senator Milne is waiting to ask a question. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, on December 15 last year, the Prime Minister justified the inexcusably 5 per cent weak target and design of the proposed carbon pollution reduction scheme on the basis that a more rigorous target would cost jobs and that he had the balance right. Yesterday, however, the government included investment in insulation and solar energy in the latest jobs stimulus package. Does the government now acknowledge that well-designed climate action is a jobs creator, builds manufacturing capacity and generally stimulates the economy? Minister for Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you to Senator Milne for the question. And, uh, I'm pleased that uh, the Greens recognise the importance of yesterday's announcement and the uh, massive investment in energy efficiency uh, which the government made as part of the nation building and jobs package announced by the Prime Minister. Uh, it is uh, an almost four billion, and in fact in excess of four billion if you count existing expenditure over the forward estimates, an enormous investment in energy efficiency measures. And the government has always recognised uh, that there are uh, an enormous economic uh, opportunities from adjusting to a low carbon future, from building uh, an economy that is capable of competing in a world where there is a global carbon constraint. Uh, where we differ from the Greens, however, Mr. President, is that we recognise the enormous challenge, the hard economic challenge, of making that transition, of making that transition uh, on an economy which is one of the most carbon intensive in the world and in circumstances where there is not a, a, a policy magic wand uh, that immediately transforms the Australian economy from a highly carbon intensive economy uh, to the low pollution economy we do want to build. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, am grateful that um, Senator Milne recognises uh, the historic investment in energy efficiency that was announced yesterday, uh, uh, an investment that will not only support jobs uh, for those uh, p who are participating in the installation of insulation or of solar hot water panels, uh, but also uh, an historic investment in energy efficiency to reduce Australia's emissions. However, the government also recognises this is a hard economic challenge. Making that, this transition is a transition that needs to be made over a number of decades. That is why we need a scheme to drive that, that type of economic change in the years and decades to come so we can we can Order. secure today's time jobs while building tomorrow's. Your time has expired. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank the Minister for her response and recognition that uh, there are huge economic opportunities in adjusting to a low carbon economy and ask her to uh, ask her will she now revisit the design of the carbon pollution reduction scheme 
to ensure that the allocation of free permits is conditional on the implementation of the greatest possible energy efficiency opportunities, fuel switching and other emissions reducing and job creating options because the design of the current scheme actively prevents the creation of new jobs in these sectors. The Minister. Thank you. Um, well, uh, we simply don't accept the premise of, of the good senator's question. Um, the, the impetus to uh, drive investment uh, in cleaner energy options, uh, the impetus, the incentive for Australian business to improve their energy efficiency, the incentive for Australian business to build those low-polluting industries and jobs of the future is driven by the fact that you put in place a carbon price for the first time. Uh, you ensure that the market finally has the information it should have had, which is that climate change costs money and that is reflected uh, in a carbon price. That is the way you drive incentive. Uh, the senator seems to believe the only way you can drive that sort of change is by making permits conditional. Let's remember uh, that notwithstanding the fact that the government has put in place unashamedly substantial measures of assistance to assist Australian industries in this transition through the design of the carbon Senator Wong, pollution your reduction time has scheme, expired. Uh, the incentive your comes time from the carbon price. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I further ask the minister, in announcing the $2.7 billion insulation program, the government claimed it would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by almost 50 million tonnes by 2020. Since that 50 million tonnes is not additional to the emissions cap in the carbon pollution reduction scheme as proposed, have you misled, has the government misled the Australian people when you said this measure would reduce Australia's actual emissions? The Minister. Can I say, um, Senator Milne, implicit in that question uh, seems to be a misunderstanding of the nature uh, of a cap and trade system, which I, I, I understand your party supports. The reality is uh, that the, the reality is that if we reduce our energy use, if we become more energy efficient, not a, that does a number of things. One, it enables Australians in the context of higher energy prices, it enables Australian families to reduce their energy costs. I would hope that would be something uh, that all senators uh, would support. Second, it would enable, it would enable uh, governments to go for more ambitious targets. That's the reality. The difference between uh, the difference between the difference between uh, Senator Milne and the government, or the Greens and the government, is we consider the target range of 5 to 15 to be an ambitious target. 15 per cent is a 41 per cent reduction in the carbon footprint of every man, Senator woman, and Wong, child in your this time country has between expired. 1990 and 2020. Sen Senator, Fe Sen Senator Fearer of Andy Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. Given that the government has admitted that it will need to borrow $118 billion over four years to finance its latest cash splash, why is the government seeking authority from the parliament to borrow some $200 billion, $82 billion more than is required? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Where's that stats going? The temporary, the temporary deficit, Mr. President, has been imposed on us by the rest of the world. The global recession and unwinding commodities boom has collapsed in revenues and pushed the budget into deficit. Borrowings are also needed to fund the nation building and jobs plan to support the economy and jobs. So let's be clear. The figure that it, those opposite are identifying is needed for these reasons that I am outlining. The government has introduced legislation to increase Commonwealth government securities broadly equivalent to the deficits over the forward estimates. The overwhelming majority of the increased borrowing requirements is the collapse in revenues and higher payments associated with the global recession. Those, these account for around two-thirds of the increase in the borrowing requirement. The government's balance sheet remains sound and net 
debt remains low, low by international standards. Average net debt across the OECD is currently nine times the level of Australia. If the choice is between borrowing to finance the temporary deficit and higher unemployment, we make no apologies, no apologies at all, for choosing Australian jobs and supporting Australian families. Because if those opposite want to play these short-term political games, if those opposite want to play these short-term political games, well, the Australian public will judge you on that. The Australian public will judge you on that. Because what this government stands ready to do is whatever is necessary Senator Conroy, to protect your Australian time jobs has expired. and Australian Resume families. Your seat, Senator Conroy. Senator Fear. Order. Senator Fear of Andy Wells. Perhaps I might ask the question in another way. Why is the government supplementing its borrowing limit by a staggering 70 per cent from $75 billion to $200 billion and providing a, an $82 billion blank cheque from the Australian yeah, yeah. taxpayers? Minute order. The minister. Keep asking the question why, and I am happy to keep explaining it to them. As, as, as I have been saying, increased borrowing to fund the temporary deficit will impose a short-term cost on the budget. On current projections, net interest payments are forecast to rise to $2.6 billion. That's 0.2 per cent of GDP. 0.2 per cent of GDP in 2011-12. As the IMF has said, the consequences of inaction will be devastating. While the fiscal cost for some and this is a quote from the IMF, while the fiscal cost for some countries will be large in the short run, the alternative, the alternative of providing no fiscal stimulus or financial sector support would be extremely costly in terms of lost output. The human cost of the opposition's plan, their Senator inaction, Conroy, your is time too has bad expired. to contemplate. Senator Fear of Andy Wilkes. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Having admitted that the government will borrow $118 billion and $82 billion extra by way of a blank cheque, will the minister guarantee that the government will seek explicit approval from the parliament for any new spending measures over and above the $200 billion? The minister. The government, the government will legislate to increase Commonwealth government securities broadly equivalent to the deficits over the forward estimates. The Australian government has a AAA credit rating and our treasury bonds, our treasury bonds are high quality and attractive to investors. The advice we have from Treasury is that we will be able to raise sufficient funds to finance the deficits as conditions stand. The government will need to borrow around $125 billion over the forward estimates. <coughs> this comprises borrowings to finance deficits of around $118 billion and, with the remaining amount required to meet the other financing requirements, such as the commercial property SPV. So let me be clear. Those opposite who want to keep playing this game can look us straight in the face expired, and say why Conroy, they put those— Your time has expired. Resume your seat. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to Senator Conroy, the minister representing the Treasurer. Can the minister outline to the Senate the importance of the $42 billion national building and jobs plan announced yesterday on our ability to withstand the global recession. Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. Mr President, the Rudd government thanks Senator Moore for that question. The Rudd government has taken decisive action with its $42 billion investment to support the economy and jobs. In the current economic climate, there is an overwhelming case for the nation building and jobs plan. As I outlined yesterday, these are almost unprecedented economic times. There is a global recession 
and the outlook has deteriorated sharply in the last few months. We know that the IMF has cut its forecast for global growth three times in the last four months and is now forecasting a deep global recession. We know that in all six of Australia's top ten trading partners are now in recession. And we know that the global recession has wiped $115 billion off government revenue and has imposed a deficit on the budget. Mr President, I am continually amazed that those opposite just don't quite yet understand how serious the economic emergency is, which must explain their ongoing preference. This must explain. It's the only rational and logical explanation for why they continue to play short-term political games rather than facing up to these challenges. Mr President, Australia is better placed rather than most countries, but we, but we can't completely resist the pull of these international forces. That's why the, the Nation Building and Jobs Plan is so important. It's been carefully Senator designed. Senator Conroy, your time has expired. Senator Moore. Can the minister outline the risk to the Australian economy if these measures are not passed or if they are delayed? Minister. <laughs> Mr President, given the conditions that we face, the government is taking the only responsible action to support growth and jobs in the face of the global recession. We had a choice between further spending from the temporary deficit or higher unemployment. And we make no apologies. We will make no apologies for choosing to save Australian jobs and fight for Australian jobs. Those opposite will stand condemned. Because if only they'd had the opportunity to wait another few hours before their shadow cabinet met. Because one of their great criticisms, Mr President, one of their great criticisms, it won't be spent. And yet, and yet, what we saw when the retail figures for December came out this morning blew a large hole. A large hole in those opposite's argument. Because what it showed was a major increase. A Senator Conroy, major your increase. Your time has expired. Resume. Order. 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 Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the opposition's decision to vote against this package contrasts with the approach being advocated in other parts of the world in the face of the global recession? The minister. Thank you, Mr. President. Every government. Every government, economic authority and expert around the world is urging decisive action to stimulate economic growth. The IMF, the IMF supports payments to increase spending and stimulate the economy. The IMF, no greater authority than the IMF. This demonstrates yet again how out of touch Mr Turnbull and the, those opposite are with the lives of Australian families and workers and with the experts. Mr Turnbull should go to the schools around the country and explain to them why they don't think that they need decent libraries, halls and refurbishment. Mr Turnbull should travel the country because once again Mr Turnbull is putting his own self-interest self ahead of the national interest. Order. Your time has expired. Interest. Resume your seat. Sen Constant interjection is disorderly, Senator Abetz, and it's very hard when one of your own seeking the call and you're interjecting. Senator Eggleston. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. And the question is given the government's claim that it will support 90,000 jobs, how many jobs will the stimulus package actually create? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Conroy. 
Mr. President, th can I thank Senator Eggleston for that question? Mr. Yeah, President, the Rudd government has made it consistently clear that in these unprecedented economic times, we will do whatever Just is necessary. Just resume your seat, Senator Conroy. There's debate going on across the chamber, which is disorderly. I need to hear the answer, Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. In the face of worsening global financial environments and indeed the onset of a global recession, we have taken decisive action to support the Australian economy. We've outlined the economic security plan before Christmas. We've outlined a COAG passage. We outlined a $6.1 billion long-term plan to assist the Australian automobile industry and associated industry components. The world economy is going into recession. This is driving, this is driving Australians onto the unemployment queues. What this stimulus package is designed to do is to support and protect and try and ameliorate that. So let's be clear about this. The economic illiteracy of those opposites this is, this is about protecting Australian jobs and supporting and fighting for them. You are going to have to go home over the weekend. Order. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. Senator Conroy. Thank you, Mr. President. As those opposite well know, the cumulative impact of the measures taken by the government last year and this year will be delivered over time. The government has been absolutely upfront about the fact that the global recession will impact on growth and jobs here. Absolutely upfront. That is why the government has taken decisive action to limit the impact of the global recession on Australian jobs. The Nation Building and Jobs Plan will help support up to 90,000 jobs has over the next two years. Your time has expired. Order, both sides. I'm waiting. Senator Eggleston. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary, and it is: Will the government release the Treasury modelling, as referred to by the Treasurer in a television interview this morning, which underpins this claim? that the package will support 90,000 jobs. The Minister. Thank you, Mr President. As those opposite well know and practised themselves and Senator Minchin many, many times and Senator Coonan before him consistently refused to release Treasury modelling. Consistently, consistently refused to release it. Mr President, we on this side know there is no quick fix or silver bullet when you are facing a global recession. No quick fix. To come in here with simple short-term politics, which completely display amnesia from just over 12 months ago when you were on this side of the chamber, simply shows that these questions are designed to not face up to the challenges that we have, not face up to the challenges that we are currently Resume embroiled in. Resume your seat. Your time has expired. Send, Senator Eggleston. <laughs> Thank you, Mr President. I do have a second supplementary, and it is, if, if it is the case that this package will support 90,000 jobs, Will the minister confirm that each of these jobs, in fact, will cost taxpayers $230,000 per job per year? The minister. <laughs> Mr President, that is, that is an absolutely absurd question. It has no sensible base. No, because those opposite know that there is no sensible calculation involved in deriving those numbers. None whatsoever. We will stand by the Treasury's modelling on this ahead of Senator Abetz's and Senator Minchin's Mickey Mouse back of the envelope uh, projections. 
But what we will be watching for is over the weekend when you go back to your constituents and start telling them they can't have the $900 and the $950, when you stand there and start saying to Australians, look, we're sorry, short term politics says we have to say no to this. It doesn't matter, if, but don't you worry if you lose your job. Don't you worry if you lose your job. We'll be in there playing short term politics. Because that is what is going to be at stake here. When you vote on this, Se that Senator is what Conroy. is going to be at stake here. You are going to be putting Senator Australians Conroy, on the resume your seat. View. Resume your seat. I remind you that in, in addressing the chamber, you should address the president and not the other side. Se Senator Fearling. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ludwig. The government said. It introduced the Alcopops tax to combat binge drinking. Would the minister please advise the Senate how the government is measuring the success of the Alcopops tax? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Fielding for the question. And of course, he is right when he says that the Alcopops uh, uh, consumption in any given week approximately is one in 10 or 12 to 17-year-olds are causing binge drinking or drinking at risky levels. That's the facts of the, about it. And of course, binge drinking is a problem in the community. The facts of, of course, why Alcopops are a problem, the Alcopops industry received a tax break from the Liberals. The distiller's own figures show that sales increased by over 250 per cent since the Liberals created the loophole. And of course, when you then go and look at what uh, Mr Turnbull says about it, he says, of course, it's just a money-raising exercise. And of course, what he said was, this is a money-raising exercise. It's not going to stop young people drinking. What he hasn't considered is that, of course, and he hasn't thought about it because he hasn't put up what Mr Turnbull is going to do about it. And of course, the real question that has to be answered is when you look at the third party supporting the Alcopops measure. An independent report commissioned by the Howard government, of course, David Collins and Helen Lapsley, the cost of tobacco, alcohol and illicit drugs abuse to Australian society found that there would appear to be strong justification for the April 2008 Order. increase in the Australian Resume tax on premix. Senator Fielding. Uh, Mr President, a point of order on, on complete irrelevance. The question was about Please advise the Senate how the government is measuring the success of the Alcopops tax. He's gone uh, about, I don't know, he's got 30 seconds left and he hasn't even got there. Could you please get him back on to answering the question? The, uh, I draw your attention uh, to the fact that you've got 31 seconds left in answer, to answer the question that has been raised by Senator Fielding. Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, when you look at the independent research, because the independent research supports what we've been saying about uh, dealing with Alcopops is a serious issue. We need to address it, and the support of the independent report provides the basis for saying that this is an appropriate measure to undertake. And of course, if you look at alcohol and other and other Drugs Council of Australia, who also said the responsibility Senator for getting Lodwig, your time sensible has expired. Resume your seat, Senator, Senator Fearling. Thanks, Mr. President. I have a supplementary, even though the primary wasn't even answered. Last month, the New South Wales Labor Health Minister said alcohol-related admissions to hospital emergency departments in New South Wales have soared by 130% for 18 to 24-year-olds in recent years. Is the minister? saying that the New South Wales Health Minister is wrong and what the alcohol-related hospital emissions for other states. What are, is it going up or down? The minister. What the measure has achieved so far, the excise figures show that from May to September 2008, total spirits clearances decreased by 9.2 per cent relative to the same five-month period in 2007. This includes a 40 per cent decrease in alcohol pop sales and a 19 per cent increase in full strength spirit sales. So what, what we are doing is taking decisive action in respect of alcohol pop sales. 
and the figures underpin that we are, we are achieving some measure of success in this area, because young people, young people are the people who are in the frame for binge drinking, for being affected by it. If there are further figures that I can garner out of New South Wales or other state hospital systems to support this, I will. But what is, what is clear is the advice from the NHMRC guidelines uh, is that they are— Order. Your time has expired. Senator Fearling. Thanks, Mr. President. I have a further supplementary question. Uh, Family First has always been concerned that this tax is nothing more than a revenue raiser. Would the government agree to an independent assessment of the success of this tax in combating binge drinking across Australian communities? The Minister. Uh, thank you. The evidence is clear on this, Mr. President. It's clear that the increasing, price, increasing prices reduces alcohol consumption, and that is the particularly, and that is particularly so for young people. International experience backs this up. Higher excise taxes have been shown to significantly reduce the frequency of youth drinking and the probability of risky drinking levels. The effects of price and alcohol consumption and alcohol-related problems. That is the position that is being demonstrated. The research already underpins that. Local and national studies on the effectiveness of price-related levers on levels of alcohol consumption reliably show that higher prices lead to reduction in consumption, especially among price-sensitive groups such as young people. And that was done as early as Loxley et al. in 2004, prevention of substance use, risk and harm Senator in Australia, Ludwig, your review time of the evidence has expired. Monogram. Your time has expired. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. My question is also to the Minister representing the Minister for Health and Ageing, Senator Ludwig. Will the Minister outline for the Senate exactly how much money in the second stimulus package is allocated to Australia's ailing health system? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, Mr President. What we have uh, through the Health and the COAG health package is provided significant money to provide health and hospital support. What we've continued to do, if you look at the COAG, the COAG uh, circumstances themselves, and that is, and that is perhaps the difficulty that the, uh, the Senator Payne goes to in answering in asking this question in relation to an unrelated matter about a package that is designed to do a stimulus to the economy and, of course, what we are doing as a package in the health area. And that is what we are going to do and we are doing. If you look at, as a result of last November historic COAG meeting, the Commonwealth in implementing lasting reform to improve the Australian health care system, at that, at that meeting the Commonwealth Government agreed to provide $64.4 billion over five years. That's the appropriate place for the provision of funding through the COAG process to assist hospitals right across Australia—$64.4 billion over five years. And that package includes several national partnerships Order. to strengthen our hospitals Order. and Senator health— Order. Senator resume your seat. Senator Betts. Order. Senator Betts. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On the point of order in relation to relevance and indeed direct relevance, the uh, question was specifically about uh, the stimulus package as to how that uh, assists the ailing health sector in this country. And uh, Senator Ludwig, at another time, I tell us about COAG and other measures, but uh, this was a specific question, specifically about uh, the health sector. Uh, being funded, if at all, under this stimulus package, and I would uh, invite you, Mr. President, to ask the minister to answer the question, and if he can't, to take it on notice. Senator Evans, uh, Mr. President, uh, it's obvious this has to be ruled out of order, but the persistence of Senator Betts in this matter, given his performance as minister, is, uh, is breathtaking. But what Senator uh, um, Ludwig was. Uh, was making clear is the government's initiatives in the health area providing funding through a different vehicle, and it's a perfectly appropriate and honest response. So I don't know uh, that there's any point of order, and it just seems that Senator Abetz insists on 
wasting the time of the parliament by taking these points of orders to pursue some uh, some uh, um, some cause he uh, he holds dear about relevance, one that he showed no interest in when he was a minister. There's 42 seconds left, Senator Ludwig. I draw your attention to the question, Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Of course, what this package does, the need for the National Building and Jobs Plan legislative package, if you want to confuse the two between what we're doing in the health and what we're doing here, I can make it even plainer. The legislation which needs to pass, which you are holding up, will provide, will provide a tax bonus for working Australians, and it's paid through the ATO to eligible taxpayers beginning in April 2009. That's $950 for eligible taxpayers. The Commissioner of Taxation, of course, uh, it, we will also provide four other household Senator measures. Ludwig, the single your time income. has expired. Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a supplementary question. And I thank the Minister for acknowledging that there is no money allocated in this package to the health system. Will the Minister then outline exactly how much money in this package has been earmarked for the ageing part of the health portfolio? The Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. What we what we are doing, what we are doing in this package is providing four other household measures that are the single income family bonus, the back to school bonus. We're also providing oh, those order. just wait a minute. Order. I'll give you the call when it's quiet. Order. Senator Abetz is on his feet, waiting to take a point of order. He's entitled to be heard in silence. Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Unless, unless, Mr. President, we are to believe that school children are somehow in the aged cohort within the community, I would have thought that answer is completely and utterly irrelevant to the question that was asked. Well, Senator, Senator Conroy. Fair to say that there is still 46 seconds of 60 to go, and to take a point of order, take a point of order this early, is not allowing the minister to get close to answering the question. So, if you want to keep, if, if those opposite keep taking points of order, all they're doing is wasting their own time. There are still 46 seconds to go, and Senator Ludwig should be entitled to complete his answer before. Senator, Con Senator Conroy, Senator Ludwig has been addressing the, sec the supplementary question for 14 seconds. He has 46 seconds left to go, and I draw your attention to the question. Senator Ludwig. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And of course, as I've been saying, there are both the COAG process and, of course, if you look at the current Nation Building and Jobs Plan, it also provides a range of benefits to Australians right across the board, both in a tax package of $950 for eligible tax people. All of that both supports, supports jobs in the community, supports those people such as nurses, people who support and work in aged care facilities right across the board to keep their jobs, to ensure that their jobs are supported. It also provides infrastructure. It also provides longer-term benefits as well. All of this is about ensuring that the economy Order, remains strong. Your time has strong. expired, Senator Ludwig. Senator Evans. I, I, I agree with Senator Brandis Senator about the Evans. pathetic, but uh, I ask that uh, further questions be placed on the notice paper, Mr. President. Who are you? Are there any uh, motions to take note of answers? Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I uh, seek leave to take note of, uh, don't need leave, of, of the answers in uh, question that. time given by uh, Senator Conroy. And, uh, in particular, I want to uh, mention Senator Conroy's abject failure to come to grips with how long the budget will remain in deficit as a result of this enormous package of $42 billion. And critically, 
How many years will Australia's children, our children and grandchildren, Senator Conroy's children, be saddled with this new Labor debt that will see every Australian slugged $9,500 as we have to live with the consequences of this reckless and poorly thought out package? Now, the Coalition, of course, as disciplined and responsible economic managers, are not unmindful of the economic circumstances that do call for a careful, thoughtful and well-targeted well stimulus. And we do accept that there is a good case for a stimulatory package. Our concern, of course, about the $42 billion spend is at least threefold. Firstly, it is simply too big, and the government has failed to establish why $42 billion is the appropriate number. I mean, why is it $42 billion as opposed to 41 or 30 or 24 for that matter? There is a whiff of panic, a whiff of the knee-jerk about this size of, uh, the size of this package, with absolutely no guarantee that it will work. Uh, in fact, the Prime Minister very carefully said uh, that he didn't know whether it would work. And uh, he said, of course, that there was no silver bullet. It appears that the only silver bullet is pointed at the coalition's head unless we suddenly agree to this hysterical uh, need uh, advocated by Labor to pass this enormous package within 24 hours. Now, we know that the downturn may be very long lasting, and Australia simply cannot afford to spend larger and larger sums like this every quarter. Let me illustrate. We've already seen 1 per cent of GDP spent in an ineffectual cash splash of $10.4 in the December quarter, and there will be, just in cash handouts alone from this package, another 1 per cent of GDP in the March quarter. And, uh, as I said, the Prime Minister has already admitted he doesn't know if this will work. So committing to $42 billion when you simply don't know what the future holds is simply shooting in the dark. The second uh, concern is the very poor quality of this spend. Now, this will obviously take us some time to work through, but we believe that our main focus, of course, should be jobs, jobs and jobs. We've been saying that since last year and have been consistently saying it until, of course, Labor has now caught up and started talking about the impact on jobs. Disappointingly, even with reckless cash handouts and massive debt fuelled spending, the Prime Minister's package predicts unemployment will top 7 per cent in just over a year. 7 per cent. That's another 300,000 Australians out of work when we're looking down the barrel of another $42 billion stimulatory spend. And where are the 70,000 jobs promised by the government as a result of the $10.4 billion cash splash? They didn't eventuate, and we know that the most that they will now say is that this package will now support jobs. We've heard the weasel words that have now morphed from one package where we, where we were supposed to be looking at the creation of jobs to simply supporting jobs with a vastly increased spend. It simply adds to the fear and the perception that this is a government that simply doesn't know what it's doing. And thirdly, we believe that there are far more targeted responses that will do more for jobs, for employment creation, for small business, for the economy and for Australian families than have been contemplated in this package. What we've seen from Labor over the past couple of days is nothing short of manufactured hysteria over the timing of this package, and we believe very clearly that it is our duty to carefully scrutinise the package and to discuss more effective ways to achieve a stimulus. We know that our decision to oppose the package uh, will not be a popular decision. It is a hard decision. Uh, we know the Prime Minister has never taken a tough decision, but we have and we know all about standing up for the rights of Australians, being careful fiscal managers. We understand what debt means. Order. We understand debt that needs to be Order, repaid Senator and the burden the on Australian time families. Has expired. Senator Moore. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. 
As many people have been saying, Mr Deputy President, including Senator Conroy in his contributions, we are in truly exceptional times. And the evidence is out there, Mr President. There is nothing um, that can be hidden in terms of the way the media coverage has been putting out on all parts of this issue around the economy across the world, because this is not just an issue that is facing Australia. What we're looking at is a global financial crisis. And the really important thing, Mr Deputy President, is not something that we're just discussing around the table in this place. People in the community have now got information which clarifies just how deeply in debt, how deeply in crisis the world economy is. And amongst the people across this country, there is deep concern. So when we hear people from the opposition talking in the terms of, and I quote, <coughs> manufactured hysteria, <coughs> that actually devalues the knowledge and the concern that the people of Australia have, and it is real concern. What this government does, and it is a tough decision, what this government is planning to do is to put forward a package to respond to the needs of our community, to protect jobs, and indeed, I take Senator Coonan's point, jobs, 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 to protect those jobs, to boost the economy, because what we're talking about is our economy and our economy within the midst of the global process, the global economy, and also, most importantly, Mr Deputy President, to support Australian families, to support Australian citizens who are working through their own concerns about what is happening to their lives, to their economy. And that is the fear. That is the challenge. And those are the issues which the government is putting forward a package to respond, not to actually hide the issues, not to pretend that any single way is going to provide the full answer, and not to find some mystical silver bullet. What it is is actually carefully and with full intent and understanding put forward a package which looks particularly at individual needs, and we see through the process a number of, pack of packages that are looking at tax relief for individuals, for individual taxpayers, to look immediately at some immediate relief for those people, some of whom will be facing the loss of jobs, because we've seen over the last few months, Mr Deputy President, the beginning of job losses in our country as a result of international companies pulling back, as a result of our trading processes being affected by the international um, crisis, by our resources markets not being able to be, to be boosted up because our trading partners are not taking what they used to take. These are real situations, so we're looking at immediate support to families. We're looking at support for families who are working now at getting their kids back to school. So we're giving people an immediate payment for that. But more importantly, I think, Mr Deputy President, the um, input of funding into the infrastructure of our schools is something that we can stand here and say is necessary. We'll respond immediately to the jobs, jobs, jobs issue in terms of using effective construction, planning and administrative work to, to do the large range of infrastructure in the schools that is presented in this package. And I know schools right across my state um, independent schools and government schools are all looking at these packages and saying how that best can be used for them and for their community. So for families with school-aged children, there is something real in this package that can be held on to and, most importantly, give people hope. Another point, Mr Deputy President, and it's much too short a time to look at the whole range of this passage beca package because, as you know and we all know here, this is a large response to a large issue. I just want to put on note uh, my particular favour of the infrastructure program around looking at homelessness and bringing forward the kinds of plans that we in this place talked about quite recently about the real need for looking at immediate infrastructure to look at the homelessness issue across the country. The package looks at that, looks at how we can once again use construction, look at our infrastructure needs and use a real stimulus to respond to a real issue. Again, Mr Deputy President, this is not manufactured hysteria. These are real problems in our community, and the package that's put before this place by the government needs support. It needs people looking how we can work together rather than putting up barriers and trying to play games. Senator Fifield. Uh, Mr Deputy President, uh, we are in difficult economic times. 
that Australia would face an economic challenge in the wake of the US subprime crisis was inevitable. It was also inevitable that Australia would be better placed than any other nation to handle this economic challenge. Why? Because in November 2007, thanks to the coalition, we had a budget in surplus. We had no government debt. We had world-class financial institutions and a world-class prudential regulation. And we had a booming economy and strong business and consumer confidence. But what wasn't inevitable was the undermining of these very strengths by this government. There is no doubt that the economic downturn will be deeper and longer than it needs to have been as a direct result of decisions by this government. Consumer and business confidence slammed into the wall by a government talking up inflationary expectations. Interest rates rising in response to government jawboning. These two points were part of a deliberate political strategy uh, which was motivated by an attempt to undermine the record of the previous government. The resulting slowing of growth, well, for this government, that was just collateral damage. And, of course, non-bank institutions were undermined by the bank deposit guarantee, which was bungled, and we've got a situation where a budget has been completely undermined. And it's here, in the Commonwealth budget position, where we see the con in the stimulus sham. And I think we all remember, Mr Deputy President, Mr Swan's budget speech where he gleefully declared, we are budgeting for a surplus of $21.7 billion in 08-09, 1.8% of GDP, the largest budget surplus as a share of GDP in nearly a decade. Well, fast forward to last Sunday, where Mr Swan declared to Mr Oakes that one consequence of the global recession, the unwinding of the mining boom, will be a temporary deficit. Well, that's just not true. The Commonwealth budget is not going into deficit this year as a result of falling revenues. The budget is going into deficit because of policy decisions by this government. Now, I put this to Senator Abib on Sky on Monday before the UEFO came out, and Senator Abib scoffed. But just look at page 42 of the UEFO second paragraph. It's there in black and white. For 08 09, there will be a decrease of revenue of $9.3 billion. Now, my maths mightn't be that good, but that doesn't equate to a $22 billion surplus. This government is fibbing about the genesis of the budget hole. This fiscal stimulus is predicated on inverting the political and fiscal debate. The measure of economic virtue is now the size of your deficit. Bigger is now better. Mr President, Labor have the view that there is such a thing as cost-free borrowing. But every dollar that's borrowed must be repaid, and it must be repaid with interest, and it must be repaid by the taxpayer. And every dollar that's paid in interest becomes a dollar that can't be spent on schools or hospitals or pensioners. And I do uh, find it quite amusing when uh, Senator Conroy before said that they were going to return the budget to surplus. Well, you can't return a budget to a place you've never had it. This government has never delivered a surplus and are unlikely to. Never will. Mr Deputy President, on this side, we're really careful because we know that this is taxpayer money we're talking about. Now, there is, of course, a need for some measure of government action in the current environment. Indeed, there's more of a need because of this government's handling of the economy in 2007 and 2008. But there is no justification other than political for a spend of such poor quality. And a lot of this package is, it must be said, junk spending. As an opposition, how can we be complicit in taking the budget further into deficit for spending of such dubious economic benefit? Mr Deputy President, on this side of the chamber, we quibble with the motive, we quibble with the magnitude, and we quibble with the make-up of this package. The easy path, the opportunistic path for the opposition, would have been for us to wave through the $42 billion package. But on this side of the chamber, we choose to do what is right. We know it won't necessarily be popular, but we know it's the right thing for Australian taxpayers, it's the right thing for the Australian economy, and we will propose our own alternative. S Senator Arbib. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy President, and I'm um, pleased to rise in the take note debate. For a number of weeks now, the Prime Minister has been asking the opposition leader to stand up, stand up and tell us what you believe in, stand up and tell us your <coughs> policies for the country. It's taken a while, but I'm happy to say today the member for Wentworth stood up. Now we know where he stands. Now we know whose side he's really on. And his decision today to block the $42 billion stimulus package shows he is completely out of touch, completely out of touch with the state of Australia's economy, completely out of touch with the state of the global economy and, most importantly, completely out of touch with the suffering that Australian families, workers, small businesses are experiencing because of the global recession and will continue to suffer going into the future because of his decision. The only plan that the Leader of the Opposition has for the global recession is to leave it to the market. The solution for Malcolm Turbull and merchant bankers is let the market decide. Don't intervene. Let the market decide. Let's wait and see, the, let's wait and see how far the stock market will crash and what bargains will be available for the scavenger funds, <coughs> what portfolios merchant bankers might pick up on the cheap. This is what Malcolm Turnbull, the Leader of the Opposition, stands for. He never has stood for working families. He's never stood for small businesses. He stands for greed and his own ego. And it's been very interesting to, to hear today senators on the opposite side of the chamber talk about the October stimulus package. And also the Leader of the Opposition today mentioned the first stimulus stimulus package and call it a cash splash. It's now a cash splash. And I mean I thought I remembered the Leader of the Opposition and Senators on the other side of the chamber actually supporting the stimulus package. So I, I took a bit of time and went to the to the Liberal Party website. I have to say I don't spend too much time there, but I, I enjoyed it today. And I found I found on Tuesday the 14th of October a joint Turnbull uh, press conference he talked about the so-called cash splash, and this is what he said. We welcome the government's yeah. announcement today, especially for Australia's aged pensioners. But nonetheless, we're not going to argue about the composition of the package or quibble about it. It has our support. It will provide a stimulus to the economy. That's for certain. That's not the Prime Minister saying that. That's the Leader of the Opposition. It has our support. It will provide a stimulus to the economy. That's for certain. And today, it's a cash splash. That just, that just goes to the proof of who and what Malcolm Turnbull really is. And I'm very, very happy that he got up today and the real Malcolm Turnbull stood up, because finally Australians will Senator see what Arbe, kind of a leader he order, is. Order. Senator Arbeeb, you must refer to the Leader of the Opposition by his proper title. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. The government has taken action to protect families and workers during this unprecedented global recession. This $42 billion package will provide a direct stimulus, direct stimulus to employment and activity. The challenge for the Leader of the Opposition, the challenge for the Liberal senators on the other side of the chamber is if they are going to oppose the stimulus, then they have to go out and explain to workers why they may lose their job. They have to go out and explain to small businesses why they may have to close their doors because the economy continues to slow. And the proof is there, the proof is there that the first so-called cash splash worked. Look at the sales figures today. A huge jump in terms of the sales figures. 
Something. Order. Something. Order. Before calling Senator Bushby, Senator Arbeeb, during your speech, you made reference to the Leader of the Opposition standing for greed. Now, that's an allegation of improper motives, and I must ask you to withdraw that statement. I'll withdraw. Senator Bushby. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Well, who would have thought that uh, the election just 16 months ago would be standing here today taking note of answers to questions in this place about a proposal to deficit finance a package of $42 billion to jumpstart an ailing economy? I mean, back then, 16 months ago, the future looked rosy. 11.5 years of hard work by the coalition government had eliminated the $96 billion of debt accumulated through a series of temporary deficits under the Hawke and Keating government. We were consistently running surplus deficits with the growing economy, growing tax revenue to such an extent that we were able to both put away billions of dollars for future needs and provide billions of dollars in tax cuts to Australians. Employment was at a record low, and the only economic issues that we faced was though, were those occasioned by growing pains as demand for goods, services and skilled labour outstripped supply. But here we are in February of 2009, of 2009 facing a vastly different scenario. Sure, the international economic crisis has put an end to the good times with many consequences for Australians. Even government revenues have been affected, according to the most recent Treasury outlooks, a drop of $9 billion uh, predicted. And here we are looking going, at going back into debt, and not just in a small way, can I say, but massively going into debt. With the, uh, we have a request to permit the government to expand its limit on its credit card from $75 billion to a, an enormous $200 billion. As any Australian knows, once you get into the debt interest trap of a large credit card limit, it's very hard to pay it off. I don't have time to look at the causes of the crisis, but what we must look at is the government's approach to this issue, as set out by ministers in this place today. Where is the money to decrease the cost of employing people? Where in this package do you actually go to small business and say, we want you to employ more, employ more people so we're going to make it easier and cheaper for you? There's nothing. Where's the money for new hospitals or improving the health system? What have we heard for the last three or four years in, in around this country? That the, the biggest problem facing Australians in terms of uh, government funding is the, the lack of finance for, for in the health industry. And there's nothing in it, not a cent. No new hospitals, no health, nothing to improve the health system, no new doctors, no new nurses. And where is the money to help those who have been most affected by the crisis? Self-funded retirees, people who have been carefully putting aside money for the, the whole of their working lives, never, never asked anything of government, put, a, put away, uh, uh, invested in superannuation and share portfolios, finding that their, all their careful planning, all the, the self-sacrifice that they've made throughout their working life has, has uh, been completely undermined by this crisis. No fault of their own. Where's the assistance for them, the people who really need the, the assistance? I mean, I've heard a lot of, um, of government senators in this place today talk about how this package will help Australians deal with the impact of the global financial crisis. And, you know, if, if Australians are suffering uh, negative impacts, then it's a good thing to actually look after them. Um, and there's no doubt that all the Australians who receive some money from this package, if it goes through, will actually appreciate it. I mean, who wouldn't appreciate getting a cheque for $950 in the mail? Uh, you know, they're, got, they're all going to take it and they'll, they'll enjoy it. It's going to cost you $10,000 down the road. Well, thank you, Senator Cormann. I'm getting to that. But the, the, the issue is, um, how many? I mean, not all Australians have been negatively impacted by the crisis at this point. If you've got a stable income, and your uh, you, your your job isn't threatened, and your income isn't threatened, you, you've in the recent months enjoyed lower interest rates, lower petrol prices. You've probably got more disposable cash in your pocket than you've had before. Giving you an extra $950 as welcome as it is, and you know I begrudge people who get it, uh, isn't really necessary in terms of. Uh, offsetting the negative impacts of the global financial crisis. But there's a well-accepted economic proposition that deficit finance should only be used to fund long-term infrastructure that will provide direct benefits to those who will be paying for it, here, here. through taxes to cover interest and principal repayment. Despite the rhetoric and spin of the government, there is nothing in this package that provides such long-term benefits. What benefits will my children and their children receive for the taxes that they will be paying for many, many years to come? to cover this massive exercise in political pork barrelling. 
I contend that they will receive absolutely no benefits, but they will be paying taxes for years, if not decades, to come to cover the costs. I could, where in this, I mean, it is just in, simply inequitable to place the burden of interest and principal payments on people who will not receive the direct benefits. This, this package will only increase economic, economic activity in Order. the period in which they are spent. Order. Your time has expired. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Coonan be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Milne. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I rise to take note of an answer to a question from Minister Wong uh, from me regarding, the, uh, regarding climate change and, in particular, a couple of aspects of the stimulus package. And the first is that uh, I am pleased to note that uh, the government last year consistently said that uh, taking strong action on climate change would cost jobs, and that's why they weren't going to uh, introduce more stringent, rigorous targets. Now in the stimulus package they have acknowledged that uh, if you spend money on reducing emissions, on addressing climate change, it stimulates jobs and will re help to begin the process of rebuilding the manufacturing sector, which has been hollowed out for, uh, after a decade of the Rudd government, of the uh, sorry Howard government. So I'm uh, so I'm very pleased. There's now an acknowledgement that addressing climate change, moving to the low carbon economy, creates jobs. However. The minister then refused to say that she would revise the uh, carbon pollution reduction scheme to make sure that instead of giving out free permits for nothing, she actually makes them conditional upon those industries implementing energy efficiency opportunities, fuel switching and other job creating um, ideas. It's very clear that in all those industries that are getting free permits, there is an enormous opportunity to make change, to drive greater efficiency, and the Greens believe you'd have been much better off to have gone for 100 per cent auctioning of permits and then provide some of that permit income to give accelerated depreciation, for example, to some of those companies for installing energy efficient uh, machinery, technology and so on. So I'm disappointed that the government uh, didn't recognise that. But the issue I really wanted to focus on today is that yesterday the government claimed that the $2.7 billion insulation program would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50 million tonnes by 2020. Now, I believe they have misled the Australian community because one of the fundamental flaws of the carbon pollution reduction scheme is the weak cap. And because the 50 million tonnes that are going to be reduced because of insulation don't result in a 50 million reduction in the cap, a 50 million tonne reduction in the cap, all that's going to happen is the government is going to pay the community to reduce the emissions by 50 million tonnes, and that 50 million will go straight across as a direct subsidy to the big polluters. So every time anyone takes action to reduce their emissions in their homes, in their communities, it doesn't reduce Australia's overall cap. The cap stays the same and it creates a bigger space for those companies to pollute. So we are not only giving them free permits, we are going to be using community action, reducing emissions through efficiency and so on, to give them the opportunity to pollute more. So that 50 million tonnes reduction inefficiency in homes is going to go straight across to an additional 50 million tonnes worth of carbon dioxide pollution from the big emitters. Now, the minister said today that the great thing about doing things like energy efficiency it gives you flexibility in order to be able to reduce your emissions. Well, what we need to hear from the minister and from the prime minister is that they are going to reduce the cap in the carbon pollution reduction scheme by 50 million tonnes to account for the 50 million tonnes that they are paying to have reduced through the efficiency uh, measures, or else it is yet the government is actually using taxpayers' money, taking money out of the pockets of those who wanted in health and education and so on to reduce emissions to one sector in order to allow the polluters to pollute more. So it's paying them to pollute, using government money to pollute. So this is a key issue because if you don't reduce the cap, what you are going to get is a complete disincentive for community engagement. Why should someone in the community pay to put solar panels on their roof 
if the reduction in emissions it just automatically goes across to allow the polluters to pollute more by, or by that exact amount. And that is why there's a photo in the paper this week of someone taking their solar panels off their roof saying, I'll give them to any other mug who wants to have them because all it's doing is allowing the coal industry to pollute more. So this is a key issue, and I believe the government misled the community by saying that the efficiency gains, 50 million tonnes, would reduce Australia's actual emissions target because it is not reducing the cap. So what we have to make sure is the government immediately reduces the cap under the CPRS according to the amount that's been saved elsewhere. Otherwise, there's complete disempowerment. And it's because of that that the community groups that came here to Canberra, and I said it's fantastic, 150 community groups from across the country said that the CPRS is a disincentive to them to take action, and that is one of the reasons why they will be campaigning against Order. it. Order. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Milne be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Ludwig, is it? Senator Ludwig. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of a former member and minister of the House of Representatives, the Honourable. Uh, sorry, Pen sorry. Um, That's not the Sen one. No, I'm sorry. That was my fault, Senator Ludwig. Uh, it is with deep regret that I inform the Senate <coughs> of the death on the 1st of February 2009 of the Honourable Peter Howson. CMG, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the divisions of Faulkner and Casey, Victoria, from 1955 to 1969 and 1969 to 1972, respectively. Senator Ludwig. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to the death of former member and minister of the House of Representatives. Leave granted. There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. I move that the House that the Senate records its deep regret at the death on 1 February 2009 of the Hon. Peter Howson, former Federal Minister and Member for Faulkner and Casey, and plates on record its appreciation of his long and meritorious public service and tender its profound sympathy to his family in their bereavement. <coughs> uh, Mr Peter Howson was born in London on 22 May 1919. He was educated at Trinity College, Cambridge, and graduated with a master's degree in arts. In 1940, uh, Peter enlisted in the Royal Navy as a pilot in the Fleet Air Arm and progressed to the rank of lieutenant. In 1946, uh, Peter was discharged from the Navy and moved to Australia. Before entering politics, Peter worked as a company director in Melbourne for several years before being elected to the House of Representatives in 1955 as the Liberal Party member for Faulkner. Peter served in five successive Liberal governments from the mid-1950s until the 1970s. He was the government whip from 1963 to 1964, and before being appointed to his first ministerial position during the, the final Menzies ministry as the Minister for Air. He held this position from 1964 to 1966. With the transition to the Holt Liberal government in 1966, Peter retained his position as Minister for Air and also became the minister assisting the treasurer. These ministerial appointments were also retained during the McEwen and Gordon governments. In 1969, the seat of Faulkner was abolished and Peter was elected as the first member for Casey. As part of the McMahon government, Peter was appointed as minister in charge of tourism activities in 1971. He also became the first minister for environment Aborigines and the Arts. And during his parliamentary career, he served on a number of committees, including the Privileges Committee and the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs. In particular, he was elected to the House of Representatives Select Committee on Voting Rights of Aboriginals in 1960. The committee travelled around Australia over the following year, gathering much of the evidence that informed the 1967 referendum on the constitutional status of Indigenous people. Peter was also an active participant during and in the work of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, both internationally and nationally at the Commonwealth of Australia branch level. He was instrumental in the creation of an executive committee of the General Council of the CPA and became the first chairman of the executive committee, serving in that role from 1968 and 1971. Peter led a number of delegations to CPA conferences, including to Jamaica in 1964, Canada in 1966 and Trinidad in 1969. 
After he left Parliament in 1972, Peter retained a strong interest in CPA matters. He continued as an associate CPA member and was made a life member of the branch in 1983. Through his ministerial and committee work with Indigenous people, Peter developed a lifelong passion for Indigenous affairs and remained active in the area long after retiring from politics. He regularly wrote at newspaper and journal articles on Indigenous issues and was a founding member of the Benelong Society, a think tank that focuses on Indigenous policy. To his death, Peter was an office holder with the Society. Society President Mr Gary Johns is quoted as saying, Peter was tireless in trying to help Australian and Indigenous people. He said, and I quote, I think his greatest achievement was to persist in the knowledge that Aboriginal people were to become part of Australian society. End of quote. On behalf of the government, I offer my condolences to his family, in particular his son George, daughter-in-law Marie, and grandchildren Natasha, Teresa, Rebecca, and Hannah. I thank the Senate. Senator Minchin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I uh, rise on behalf of the coalition to support the motion moved by Senator Ludwig uh, and to extend our very sincere sympathies to the family of Peter Howson upon his sad passing on the 1st of February. Um, I, I, Peter was indeed a, a wonderful servant of the Liberal Party um, and indeed of Australia uh, and uh, had a very distinguished record of service um, to this parliament. He was, as uh, Senator Ludwig noted, born in the United Kingdom, indeed only uh, six days before my own father, who I'm pleased to report is in, still in very robust health, um, and then of course served in the Royal Navy uh, in wartime from 1940 to 1946. So I was one of those uh, liberals in the uh, Menzies era who had direct service <coughs> um, serving for his country. Um, he came to Australia in 1946 after the war, and like many others, and then remarkably, I think, and it's a great credit to him and I think the Liberal Party um, became a member of this parliament just nine years <coughs> after coming to this country. Um, Senator Ludwig has um, highlighted um, Peter Howson's significant achievements as a, um, both a minister and a member of the House of Representatives for two seats in the 1950s and 1960s and regrettably uh, defeated, like some other Liberals, um, at the uh, 1972 campaign when the It's Time momentum um, defeated that very long-serving government. Peter was in uh, five successive Liberal governments, the Menzies, Holt, McEwen, Gordon and McMahon governments. Uh, he was, as uh, Senator Ludwig said, the Minister for Air, Minister Assisting the Treasurer, uh, our first Minister for the Environment uh, and Minister for Aborigines in the Arts uh, up until the time of his defeat. Um, he was, uh, prior to that ministerial service, an active committee participant he was a member of the Select Committee on Voting Rights for Aborigines in 1961, so his lifelong interest in Aboriginal affairs was evident early. Uh, he was a leader of Australian delegations to a number of Commonwealth Parliamentary Association conferences throughout the 60s. Um, he became uh, um, uh, notorious, of course, uh, as a participant in the infamous uh, VIP plan affair as the then Air Minister and, of course, um, has recorded subsequently his view that his role, as inadvertent as it might have been, was the reason for John Gorton uh, not including him in his ministry in 1968. And there was a long-standing enmity that existed thereafter between um, Peter Howson and John Gorton, most regrettably, because both were colourful characters and great additions to our party. Um, and of course, after um, <coughs> Peter left, uh, politics. He uh, published his own diary, which uh, I think does provide a, an interesting um, level of detail about both his time in the ministry and the um, inter-Nissan uh, Liberal Party machinations over the leadership in the uh, late <coughs> 60s, which were, uh, of course, um, fascinating to us all. Um, in 1984, um, uh, the redoubtable Alan Ramsey described um, Peter Housen's diary as, quote, a small but significant window on the day-to-day -day detail of a turbulent period of our political history and its principal figures. In this, it excels for its insights, its gossip, its information and its political uniqueness, at least in this country. Um, I'm not sure that it's a good idea for us all to publish our diaries, but um, uh, certainly Alan Ramsey thought that was uh, a worthwhile addition to public um, knowledge. Peter, uh, to his great credit, un unlike some others, uh, did remain very loyal and active 
uh, in his chosen party, uh, and particularly in the Victorian division. And uh, Peter Costello, um, I think in a, a great tribute yesterday in the House of Representatives, referred to that and referred anecdotally to the way Peter would always turn up at Liberal Party state council meetings in Victoria and sit right in the front row and do so on a regular basis. Um, as I mentioned, he was our first Australian Minister for the Environment and, of course, um, it was um, a, the Liberal Party that, uh, that created the first uh, environment portfolio. And a great tribute to Peter that he was our first servant in that role. Um, and he was the first <coughs> Australian Minister with um, a portfolio specifically responsible for Indigenous Australians. And as I mentioned, this was an enormous passion for Peter, both in Parliament and afterwards, and a passion that um, he retained right to his death. Um, and he, he had a very strong view about the importance of um, uh, the nation recognising the plight of Aboriginal <coughs> people. And he did um, maintain and articulate a very strong and active opposition to the separatist policies, which I think we now all agree were so naively and regrettably, destructively pursued um, in, a, in an earlier period. Uh, and, and I think um, much of what Peter has written would be echoed and uh, mirror uh, what people like Noel Pearson now say um, about the uh, more productive approach to Indigenous welfare. Uh, and Peter was, uh, of course, a founder and vice president of the Benelong Society, which I'm pleased to note has bipartisan um, participation in that Gary John, a former Labor minister, is very active uh, in that, I think, very good society. Um, it was in this period um, uh, that I came to know Peter quite well in 1996 to 1998 when I had um, a ministerial responsibility for native title in the Howard government and Peter was a regular visitor uh, to my office and I, I think was a, was a very <coughs> valuable um, source of advice in relation to his very common sense and I think very wise approach to managing uh, not only Aboriginal affairs generally but specifically the complexity of native title. Um, and I found his real passion for Indigenous welfare quite compelling. Um, he did remain an active in, participant in public debate producing articles and commentary and, um, and, and most particularly about Indigenous policy um, right up until most recently. Um, and he frequently had uh, written opinion pieces and was, I think, greatly respected by many for that continued involvement in policy discussions. Um, so he's made an enormous contribution to public life in Australia. Um, we are deeply saddened uh, that he has passed away, but he had a wonderful life, nearly <coughs> 90 years of life and, uh, and an extraordinary contribution, as I say, someone who came to this country um, from his home in England and it was managed to um, contribute to this country so successfully. So to his son George, daughter-in-law Mari and grandchildren Natasha, Teresa, Rebecca and Hannah, and Hannah, the Coalition places on record our great appreciation of Peter's tremendous public service and we tender our profound sympathy to the family in their bereavement. <clears throat> I ask honourable senators to stand in silence to signify their assent to the motion. The motion is carried. Um, petitions. One petition has been lodged in accordance with the list circulated <coughs> to senators. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Henta. Are there any notices of motion? Senator Ludwig. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, De 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 Deputy President, I should say. I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that the provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to the following bills allowing them to be considered during this period of sitting. The Appropriation, Nation, Building and Jobs Bill No. 1, 2008 to 2009. The Appropriation, Nation, Building and Jobs Bill No. 2, 2008 to 2009. The Household Stimulus Package Bill 2009. The Tax Bonus for Working Australians Bill 2009. The Tax Bonus for Working Australians Consequential Amendments in Brackens Bill 2009. And the Commonwealth Inscribed Stock Amendment Bill 2009. I also table a statement of reasons justifying the need for these bills to 
be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statement incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Are there any further notices of motion? If, if there are none, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of general business notice number 341 to the 5th of February and business of the Senate notice number 1 to the 5th of February. I shall now. Sorry, Senator Perry. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, I withdraw uh, motion, notice of motion number 332, standing the name of Senator Abetz. Okay. Um, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Are there any formal motions? Um, Senator O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of Senator Hurley, I ask the general business notice of motion number. 333, proposing the, the, an extension of time for a committee to report be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator O'Brien. Uh, on her behalf, I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Cormann. Mr President, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 334 standing in my name for today uh, relating to an order for the production of documents, information on Treasury modelling contained in Australia's low pollution future, the economies of climate change mitigation, and seek leave to make a brief statement uh, before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted to amend the motion? Is leave granted two minutes for a brief statement, Senator Cormann? Uh, since this motion was lodged yesterday, the committee has received a response from the Treasurer to our request for access to this information. In his response, the Treasurer refused the committee's request, uh, stating contractual obligations to external consultants used by the government in conducting its Treasury modelling. Uh, the Fuel and Energy Committee met earlier today to consider the Treasurer's refusal uh, to provide access to the requested information. The committee takes the view that access to this information is in the public interest and required to ensure a proper scrutiny of the government's carbon pollution reduction scheme as proposed in its white paper, in particular as it relates to the likely impact of the government's proposed scheme on the economy and jobs, especially in these difficult economic times. Our advice from the Clerk of the Senate is that if the Senate insists on the production of these documents, parliamentary privilege will override any relevant contractual obligations of the government. Uh, as such, it remains uh, the strong recommendation of the Fuel and Energy Committee to proceed uh, with this motion. The question is that the amended motion be taken as formal. Is there any objection? There being no objection, I call Senator Cormann. Uh, I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and I ask that it be taken as formal. No, I've already done that. And I ask you to move the motion. Mr. President, I move the motion as amended. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Okay. Um, Senator Cormann, you have another one. Uh, Senator Milne? Well, thank Sorry. you, Mr. Deputy President. I uh, seek leave to make a short statement in relation to that uh, previous motion, 334. Um, three, three, four. Did you say or three, two, four? Three, three, four. You seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Two minutes. Two minutes, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Deputy President. Uh, the Australian Greens support the release of the Treasury modelling pertaining to Australia's low uh, pollution future, the economics of climate change mitigation. We have been seeking the release uh, of that modelling because we too would like to scrutinise it and that's why we are supporting this. However, I want it also on the record that we have no confidence whatsoever in Dr Brian Fisher from Concept Economics to conduct any kind of fair analysis of the Treasury modelling. Dr Fisher is a climate sceptic, has been a climate sceptic, remains a climate sceptic, was so as head of ABEAR and, in my view, is one of the significant reasons why no progress was made on addressing climate change in the years that uh, the Howard government was in power. So, whilst we support the laying on the table of the Treasury modelling, we wish to indicate that that uh, decision to support this does not imply any support for any analysis that Dr Fisher may conduct. Senator Cormann. 
President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 335, standing in my name for today, relating to an order for the production of documents, estimates, questions, or notice, and additional information on alcohol consumption and the Alcopops tax, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Cormann. Mr. President, I move the motion, standing in my name. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Cormann be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, Senator Perry. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 336, standing in the name of Senator Minchin, for today, relating to the order for the production of documents, namely reports relating to the national broadband network process, be taken as a formal motion. Objection to this motion being taken as formal. Well, Senator Fielding. I would like to seek leave to move an amendment to that general business notice of motion number 336. Um, yeah, before, we, before we decide whether or not we can take an amendment, uh, which are usually in writing, I must say, Senator Fielding, um, uh, I have to find out if there is any objection to the motion being taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none. Uh, I call Senator Fielding. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I seek leave to move an amendment to General Business Notice of Motion Number 336. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, and I thank the uh, Chamber. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the motion be amended by omitting uh, Thursday, the 5th of February 2009, and substituting, uh, I quote, the day after the day the winning bid is announced, end quote. And it has been uh, circulated in the Chamber. It has been circulated. Um, well, the question is that the, the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Fielding be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. I, I just need to get an indication from the Greens. You are saying no. Um, well, I still think the ayes have it. Did you want a division? No. All right. I'm calling it for the eyes. Um, <coughs> the question is: the motion as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think think the eyes have it. I think the eyes have it. Um, Senator Parry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 337, standing in the name of Senator Abetz, uh, today uh, be taken as a formal motion. Objection to this motion being taken as formal. There being none, I call Senator Perry. You were, Mr. Deputy President. I move that motion. The question is: the motion moved by Senator Perry be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Um, Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I ask that uh, general business notice of motion number 338, standing in the name of Senator Nash for today, relating to the death of Mrs. Nancy Bird Walton, be taken as a formal motion. Objection to this motion being taken as formal. There being none, I call Senator Parry. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. I move the motion, standing in the name of Senator Nash. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, 339. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 339, standing my name for today and that of um, Senator Hanson Young, um, relating to the Ramsar Convention and wetlands management, be taken as a formal motion. Uh, is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seward. Uh, thank you. I move the motion standing in my name. Senator Ludwig. Thank you, Deputy President. I just seek uh, leave to make a short statement. Yep. Uh, and I thank Leave the is granted. Uh, the Australian government takes its Ramsar obligations very seriously and is concerned about the condition of our wetlands. However, the government uh, does not support this motion because it suggests that the Commonwealth is solely responsible for managing Ramsar wetlands. Most Ramsar wetlands are managed by state and territory governments, while the Commonwealth's principal role is in coordination, management, funding and liaison with the Ramsar Secretariat. I thank the uh, Senate. The question um, that the motion moved by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. 
Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Deputy President. Um, I'm just trying to clarify because I had asked for an amended motion to be circulated, and it's not on my desk, so I'm not quite sure if so everyone. To is. which uh, motion? To, sorry, to motion 342. Four, two. Okay. One who's yep. missing it. That's. <laughs> sorry, have you got it, Joe? Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps if you could You've move, got it. if you could move your motion. I, okay. Um, uh, no, seek formality, and, okay, so and then we'll move to amend it. Do I, so I, do I have to seek leave? Is that what I'm doing? Yeah. What you should do is um, seek seek leave to amend your motion. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Deputy President, I seek leave is to amend leave my motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I ask that. General business of mo notice of motion number 342, standing in my name for today, um, as amended and circulated, be taken as a formal motion. Um, is, is there any objection to it being taken as formal? No. Senator Coonan. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Deputy President, uh, I seek uh, the leave of the Senate to make a brief statement. Uh, leave is granted for two minutes. Uh, thank you. Uh, the coalition won't be supporting this motion, but I want to put uh, our motivation in context. The coalition is deeply saddened by civilian casualties on both sides of the Israeli-Gaza border. The coalition supports the government in providing aid for the United Nations to be used for humanitarian purposes in Gaza. The Israeli ceasefire declaration was important in attempting to bring an end to the violence, but Hamas must reciprocate. Hamas should respect the ceasefire conditions as outlined by the United Nations Security Council's Resolution 1860, notably containing specific guarantees to Israel's security, including an explicit condemnation of terrorist attacks on civilians and demand that member states act to stop the smuggling of arms into Gaza. And finally, the coalition has pointed out that it was the conduct of Hamas that violated the ceasefire with its unprovoked rocket attacks on Israeli towns, villages and civilians. There can only be lasting peace if Hamas accepts the state of Israel's right to exist within secure borders. Senator Faulkner. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I also seek leave to make a statement on this motion. Leave is granted for two minutes. Well, I didn't ask leave to make a short no, statement. No, but they granted it for two minutes. Did they? Mm. Uh, well, that's unfortunate because um, uh, with these foreign affairs motions, uh, I, would, I, I might seek leave again um, uh, to complete my remarks. Mr Deputy President, the government's position on the conflict in Gaza is well known. We are strongly supportive of the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1860 and its call for an immediate, durable and fully respected ceasefire. For this ceasefire to be effective, it will require an end to arms smuggling in the Gaza Strip, an end to rocket attacks on Israel by Hamas and the opening of border crossings. Australia condemns recent rocket attacks from Gaza into Israel and understands Israel has responded through airstrikes. This recent outbreak underlines the importance of a durable and fully respected ceasefire. Australia regrets the number of people that have been killed and injured in this conflict. The original motion, tabled by Senator Hanson Young, referred only to conflict in Gaza. We welcome the preparedness of the uh, senator to amend the motion to refer to the conflict in southern Israel. In addition to referring to those Palestinians who have lost their lives, it is important that the motion refers to the conflict in southern Israel following rocket attacks from Hamas, a terrorist organisation, over several months. In response to this crisis, Australia recognised the need for urgent humanitarian assistance, including medical assistance. Uh, I inform the Senate that the government has provided $10 million since 1 January this year for emergency humanitarian aid. This is in addition to the doubling of Australia's assistance to the Palestinian people in 2008 of $45 million. We are committed to assisting further where we can. Mr Deputy President, this conflict has demonstrated once again the vital need for a two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Australia remains strongly committed 
to that objective. Senator Hanson Young. Mr. President, could I seek leave to make a short statement, please? Leave granted for two minutes. Thank you. Um, before I, um, I, I move the motion standing in my name, I just wanted to respond to um, Senator Coonan's remarks. I find it disappointing that the opposition is not willing to support a motion that um, looks clearly at the, the death of 437 children, Palestinian children who have died during the last few weeks. I think it's outrageous that, um, that the coalition cannot simply see that we're talking about the, uh, the killing of innocent children and that Australia has a role to play in supporting extra funding to medical support. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Um, Senator Hanson Young, we have another one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. I ask that general business of notice of motion number 340, standing in my name for today, relating to the global gag rule for family planning guidelines, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yes. There is objection to the motion being taken as formal. Um, that, are there any further formal motions? That concludes formal motions. Sorry, Senator Brown. Um, the government has objected to formality for that motion. Uh, the uh, Greens will not uh, insist that we go through the process of a half-hour debate now as to why the matter is urgent and should have a proper debate. But uh, we can assure the government uh, that. Uh, the Greens will revisit this matter by the placing of a further motion and um, by, in, in light in particular of the uh, Obama government's uh, move on this matter to get the Rudd, Rudd government to follow suit. Um, Harry, we don't have... We move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports. Senator Coonan. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Deputy President. Uh, I present the first report of 2009 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, and I also lay on the table Scrutiny of Bills Alert Digest No. 1 of 2009, dated the 4th of February 2009, and I move that the report be printed. The question is that the report be printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Uh, take note of uh, the first report and that uh, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. In accordance with the provisions of the Auditor General Act 1997, I present the following report of the Auditor General. Report number 19 of 2008-9, Performance Audit CMAX Communications Contract for the 2020 Summit, Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk? Documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to senators. I have received letters from a party leader requesting changes in the membership of committees. Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Minister. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I appreciate the leave of the Senate to be able to do this. I move that senators be discharged from and appointed to committees in accordance with the document circulated in the chamber. The, the question is, does that motion be agreed to? All of those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. 
Mm. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day, Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2008, adjourned debate on the motion for the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young. I'll draw your Senator. attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, I'll, I'll quorum not present, ring the bells. <laughs> oh, cancel that. <laughs> um, yes, I'm happy to, to withdraw that statement if that's acceptable to the chamber. That's fine. Minister, uh, thank you, uh, Madam, uh, uh, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, can I uh, firstly uh, seek to table a uh, correction to the explanatory memorandum related to the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill Number Two of 2009? It's a minor, a minor amendment to the bill with no. You don't leave, need leave, leave, Minister. Type it. Madam uh, Deputy President, I think I need to seek leave to continue uh, the remarks that Senator McLucas uh, started making in, uh, in summing up uh, the debate. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister? Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'm sure Senator McLucas was doing a better job. Um, but uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the contribution of uh, Senator Ferranti Wells and Senator Hanson Young uh, and for their continuing interest. Uh, in these uh, these issues, um, I think uh, um, Senator McLucas had uh, uh, indicated a response to the the, uh, the first uh, tranche of, tranche of uh, uh, our amendments. The second set uh, seeks to reinstate effective and uniform time limits applying for judicial review of migration decisions in the Federal Magistrates Court, the Federal Court, and the High Court. Uh, the new time limits are 35 days from the date of the migration decision. Importantly, though, the courts will have broad discretion to extend the time for applying for judicial review of a migration decision when it is necessary in the interests of the administration of justice to do so. I think that uh, seeks to balance the interests of the applicant but also the inter interests of, uh, of proper process. Um, the final set of amendments limits appeals from judgments to make an order or refuse to make an order to extend time to apply for judicial review of migration decisions. This set of amendments will assist in strengthening the time limit for applying for judicial review, which I mentioned earlier, uh, by encouraging applicants to resolve their cases in a timely fashion and helping to deter applicants from making strategic appeals to simply to delay their removal from Australia. The amendments do not limit appeals to the High Court in its original jurisdiction because such a limitation would be unconstitutional. Madam Acting Deputy President, I think that's a very important uh, step forward. Uh, we all support um, the right of people to seek uh, appropriate decision making and pursue uh, um, uh, full, fair appeal rights, but there's got to be an end to it and there's got to be the capacity for a, uh, a decision uh, that is not in their favour to be enacted. And, uh, the integrity of our immigration system relies uh, not only on uh, people receiving fair treatment, but also on the uh, on the capacity of the state to remove those who failed to meet uh, our laws. So uh, I think that's an important step forward in making sure we uh, maintain that integrity. Um, turning now to the points raised during the debate on the bill, and uh, uh, so I thank Senator Ferranti Wells for her contribution. Um, I think years of dealing with this stuff, she's way in front of me on the intricacies of it, uh, not only because of a legal background but having to wade through it in the professional capacity. Um, and I must admit some of this stuff is mind-numbingly difficult. Um, and, but there are a number of people who live off it, uh, I understand, because uh, <laughs> the complexity encourages uh, a profusion of lawyers. Um, in terms of Senator Young's concerns regarding the number of issues, um, uh, I note her concern that the new provisions based on time running from the day of the decision rather than from the day of notification may adversely impact on clients. And she also raised her concern that the onus being placed on applicants to seek extension of time may be an unreasonable burden, particularly where there are language and financial difficulties. Um, you know, I acknowledge their legitimate uh, concerns to raise, but the package put forward in the bill is actually more beneficial than the existing position. The bill introduces a new broad discretion, which is unlimited, 
to extend time. This means that if someone wants to apply for an extension of time, they can do so outside the 35 days period, for example, two years later, provided the court decides that it's in the interests of the administration of justice. Uh, currently, the time limits require that an application for judicial review must be lodged within 28 days. Um, and currently, if a person were to seek judicial review in the FMC and the federal court uh, after the, uh, the extendable period of 84 days, the courts would not have jurisdiction to consider the application or any request to extend time, even if there were compelling reasons. So I think the overall package is more beneficial. Those who, people who are out of time under the current provisions and therefore could not have accessed the courts will now have an opportunity to put their request for an extension of time to be considered by the courts, not the department, but the courts. And the court's ability to extend time will be unlimited under the bill. Uh, Senator Hanson Young also asked for clarification on how the amendments to sections 477, 477A, and 486A will safeguard applicants against any disadvantage. Um, the requirement that applicants give reasons is not a legal onus on the applicant. There is no, con uh, no uh, concept of the applicant having to prove that it's on the balance of probabilities that their reasons for an extension are in the interests of the administration of justice. It's merely a requirement that the applicant states reasons for the request for an extension of time. It just assists the court in early identification of meritorious cases so they can be quickly resolved, something that I've been very keen to pursue since I've been in the portfolio. Um, linking the commencement of time to date of decision rather than notification will provide greater certainty for applicants and the courts. It will be clear on the face of their decision when time starts to run. Uh, the existing notification rules for notifying an applicant of their decision will continue to apply, but the time limits for applying for judicial review will no longer be linked to actual notification. Uh, Senator Hanson Young also asked uh, why the time limits start to run even if there's a failure to comply with the requirements of certain provisions. Uh, this is to ensure that the time limits operate effectively to minimise the risk of an applicant claiming there was no date of decision for the purpose of time limits because the decision did not comply with legislative requirements. Otherwise, the effectiveness of the proposed time limits would be undermined. The court can address possible injustice caused by this provision by using its new broad discretion to extend time. Uh, Senator Young, Hanson Young also asked if there was an unreasonable burden on applicants, um, you know, financial language, knowledge of the legal system. Um, the amendments are intended to allow the courts to conduct extensions of time applications as informally and flexibly as possible with minimal burden. Providing access to an extendable appeal period allows applicants with financial language or knowledge issues to seek assistance from available resources. Um, Senator Hanson Young also asked what had changed since the first iteration of these amendments in the Omnibus Bill last year and why we're adding Schedule 3 at this time. It's a good question. Um, since drafting of the migration legislation of Bill No. 1, it became apparent that in order for the time limits to operate effectively, those amendments should be accompanied by a limitation on appeals. The limitation on appeals uh, amendments have been included in a separate schedule in the bill for ease of reference, but they shouldn't be viewed in isolation from the uh, rest of the bill. They're an integral part of the time limit amendments. Uh, introducing the new broad discretion to extend time without having Schedule 3 would open us up to an additional avenue for judicial review with consequential implications for cost, time and extra workloads, workloads for the courts. It also may exacerbate the strategic litigation that we've seen some applicants use to prolong their stays in Australia. Um, Senator Hanson Young's second reading amendments uh, um, are not, uh, uh, not uh, supported. I think, um, uh, as the Senator is aware, last year I announced uh, the government's new directions and detention policy. Um, and uh, uh, that included the announcement of our key immigration uh, values, uh, which uh, I think are widely understood. Uh, they were values designed to drive the development of a very different detention model. Um, and uh, I think uh, acknowledging Senator Hanson Young's call to immediately put forward amendments to the Migration Act and these principles and legislation. Uh, I just note the government's well aware of the desire of stakeholders and others that those policies have legislative backing. Um, that action was strongly advocated by stakeholders in the extensive consultation process uh, 
uh, we've undertaken uh, and uh, is also uh, part of the recommendation 12 of the Joint Standing Committee on Migration's first report on immigration detention. And that part of the uh, report was um, uh, across party lines. I think it was unanimous. I'll double check that. But certainly it was supported uh, on all sides of the, uh, the parliament. Um, I am working to try and implement these changes as quickly as possible, to get them working in practice as quickly as possible on the ground, and then legislate to support those new practices once we've got that experience. Uh, I thought that was a better way of going than having sort of theoretical debate in the parliament and, uh, and then looking to implement that. I think we'll have some benefit of the experience, what works, what doesn't work, and then have the uh, legislation that uh, reflects that. Um, I am, though, uh, keen to progress uh, uh, amendments to the Migration Act, and uh, I hope to bring forward uh, uh, more legislation uh, in this year. Um, there are obviously drafting and policy issues to be considered, but uh, um, this uh, certainly shouldn't be seen as the end of it, and uh, I am keen to, uh, to make significant changes to the Migration Act. Um, I also note uh, the reference again to the introduction of just judicial review, review of the decision to detain. Uh, I know this is uh, very important to advocates uh, and uh, a lot of people are arguing this case out in the community. It was also uh, a recommendation by the Joint Standing Committee on Migration's first report. Um, uh, it is our intention, reflected in the value statement, that detention will be for the shortest period possible and subject to increased transparency and accountability. Uh, clearly, detention that is indefinite or otherwise arbitrary is not acceptable, and we need regular review of the decision to detain. Um, we have introduced a system that will provide for more regular and earlier review. There's three monthly re reviews by a senior departmental officer. An ombudsman review at the six-month month mark will provide that outside check, uh, and the whole philosophy of the department is turned around to justify why you detain not to, to detain as your first response. Um, the department's well advanced in terms of implementing those changes and uh, um, I think uh, we should have some experience of uh, how that's working very shortly. Um, I suppose the, the main point to make is that I don't have a closed mind to the introduction of judicial review of the decisions to detain, uh, but I am mindful of the effectiveness of new three and six month detention review arrangements are yet to be determined. There's been no policy decision taken by government regarding judicial review, but it very much is on the table and I am uh, you know, having conversations, interaction with interested parties about those aspects. And I think the Senate, uh, sorry, the uh, Joint Migration Committee's work is really informing that debate and I thank them for, uh, for that work. I think it's proving useful for the parliament. Um, it's good to see the House of Reps uh, members following the following the lead of the Senate and learning to uh, conduct inquiries that actually assist the development of public policy and, and lead the debate. And I think uh, we've got good cooperation uh, on that committee and it's done some good work. Um, thirdly, Senator Hanson Young uh, reflects uh, some of her dissenting uh, um, report into the uh, Joint Standing Committee's current inquiry into immigration detention, calling for a person be, to be detained beyond 30 days only if there's a court order that it's necessary to detain that person on the specified ground. Uh, I reiterate our policy position that the uh, government's intention is that detention will be the shortest period possible and that there be transparency and accountability around those decisions. Um, I think uh, that responds to uh, uh, the uh, points made in Senator Hanson Young's second reading amendment. I understand uh, the motives about, uh, um, uh, behind it, but uh, um, the government's not inclined to, uh, to support it, but it has been useful for, uh, for taking forward the, uh, the debate. As I say, I think we'll have more debate around immigration uh, throughout the year, and uh, I think there's a lot of interest in a range of measures that the government is considering. And uh, as I say, I think, uh, I think we can, uh, as a parliament, uh, uh, do some good work in, uh, in improving the migration legislation and, uh, and uh, making it more, uh, 
more reflective, I think, of a modern, tolerant, democratic society. But I thank senators for their contributions and, their, and uh, particularly the uh, opposition for their support and look forward to uh, working with the parliament on uh, further amendments uh, to the uh, migration legislation over the coming year. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The question now is, is that, th that this bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to migration and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? Certainly is. There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Yeah, I know there's a um, um, amendment uh, moved by the uh, Greens. Uh, if reflecting their opposition to Schedule 3, which I think Senator Hanson Young covered in the uh, in the debate, I've indicated on behalf of the government we're obviously looking to uh, maintain Schedule 3. I think the opposition uh, indicated their support for that, um, but uh, obviously they might want to indicate their position. But um, uh, it's not a substantive amendment; it's only only a um, opposition to the schedule. And as I say, Senator Hanson Young articulated her concerns during the debate, so. But I'm happy to take your direction as to whether we proceed or not. I think the general view was we were keen to finish the bill, though. Senator well, Ferranti follow, Wells. Following on from what the minister said, yes, we do support the inclusion of that uh, schedule and oppose the amendment. We'll, we'll proceed. Uh, the question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against, no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Migration Legislation Amendment Bill No. 2, 2008 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. Madam uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. Qu the question is that the re report be adopted. All those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Minister. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move that the bill be read a third time. The question now is that the bill be uh, read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to migration and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three. Horse Disease Response Levy Bill 2008 and two associated bills. Second reading, adjourned debate. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. Madam Making Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Horse Disease Response Levy Bill 2008, the Horse Dis Disease Response Levy Collection Bill 2008 and the Horse Disease Response Levy Consequential Amendments Bill 2008. Broadly, the intention of these bills is to create a mechanism for the imposition of a levy on, Australian, on the Australian, Australia's horse industry. The funds collected would ensure the industry is able to reimburse the Commonwealth for any expense associated with future outbreaks of horse diseases. The horse industry will become a signatory to the uh, Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, the ADRA, uh, which began in 2002 and has since gone on to devise other levy arrangements with other sectors of primary industries. The progression of the ADRA, the IADRA to include the horse industry is certainly welcomed by the coalition, but we are very much aware of some of the differences between the uh, method of operation of the other primary industries, such as cattle, 
sheep or pigs and that of the horse industry, which could also be very easily described as a community as well as an industry. Through the bills before us today, the proposed levy would be imposed at the first registration of a horse, with a horse registration body only. It would not be imposed on any subsequent registrations during a horse's lifespan. It would not be imposed retrospectively on horses that had been registered prior to the commencement of the Act. I would like to speak briefly on our recent experience with equine influenza, the event which is the precursor to these bills. There is no doubt that the outbreak of equine in influenza in Australia in August 2007 was a devastating, costly and crippling event for, the horse, bus for horse businesses, horse clubs and horse owners. More than 8,000 properties in Queensland and New South Wales were infected and the rest of the country was forced to take fast and extreme action in order to halt the geographic spread. According to the report of the Honourable Ian Callanan, ABER estimates the cost of the EI outbreak during the initial containment and eradication response reached $560,000 a day for the disease control and $3.35 million a day in foregone income in equine business, including racing, farming and recreational enterprises. The Cullinan report also, uh, also the Cullinan report noted also the Commonwealth's allocation of $227.9 million through various assistance packages for those whose primary source of income was affected by the EI outbreak and the subsequent horse movement restrictions. As I've said, the Coalition is no stranger to the nightmare that became the reality when EI hit our shores. We fully appreciate the costs involved and the need to set up a mechanism for cost recovery in the event of future outbreaks. But in their current form, these bills will not ensure that equal contributions are made from all sectors of Australia's horse industry. While the experience and expense of responding to and mopping up after an exotic horse disease is still very much fresh in the Coalition's mind, it will be no surprise for you to hear today that the Coalition will not be supporting these bills. We did not support the legislation when it was debated in the other place in September 2008. We did not support the recommendation of the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee following a Senate inquiry that the legislation pass without amendment. And as I've just said, we will not vote in favour of this legislation in its current form now. The reason for this is because these three bills represent some of the poorest legislation that I've ever been required to assess. This legislation, if passed, will do the exact opposite of what it says it intends to do. Quite simply, the legislation professes to levy equally when in reality it most unfairly levies a small minority of Australia's horse industry, being those who compete, complete the initial registration of a horse. If this legislation was to become law, in some instances horse owners who are exposing Australia to the greatest risk of exotic horse disease will make no levy payment at all. And that, quite frankly, is simply outrageous. I'm referring, of course, to the owners of the highly, highly valuable commodities thoroughbred shuttle stallions. These are the horses who move back and forth between Australia and the United States, Europe, Asia and the United Kingdom to take financial advantage of the dual hemisphere breeding programs. The shuttle stallions currently engaged in this practice are the very horses that brought EI to our shores. Yet the owners of these horses will never pay an EI levy despite the high disease risk these practices create. Should this legislation be passed, future shuttle stallions will make a contribution to the levy when they are first registered, which is usually completed by the breeders. If ownership changes, a very common occurrence in the thoroughbred racing industry, the new owners will not make a levy contribution even if they later decide to shut their horse in and out of Australia. How is this fair that one person is paying while another is creating the, pro the potential for infection? Despite the sector which felt most severely in 2007 the effects of EI, a significant majority of the thoroughbred racing, uh, th thoroughbred racing industry will make no contribution to the levy. 
It should also be noted that this sector also received the greatest share of, some, uh, of income assistance due to the number of associated businesses and individuals dependent on income from horse racing. It is obvious to many who oppose this bill that this sector would again require a great deal of assistance in the event of a future outbreak. Yet the legislation before us facilitates a very minimal input from this sector. The burden of this levy will be borne by the horse breeders, professional and amateur alike. And in, the, in the case of the amateur, the narrow collection base will be a strong disincentive to continue registering foals. Why should they pay when the great, of the great majority of the horse industry will not? Under this legislation, the backyard hobby breeder will be chipping in more than their fair share, while the great proportion of people who own horses, either for pleasure or business, will make no contribution at all. Under this legislation, those engaged in the horse industry through business or employment would not pay the levy, even though these groups would no doubt be calling for assistance in the event of a disease outbreak, as we saw with EOA in 2007. It is little wonder that a majority of the submissions to the Senate inquiry into these bills came from the hobby and pleasure horse community. It is these groups who are the obvious losers here, to the gain of the commercial sector, and as a result they are vehemently opposed to the levy's introduction. Now, the government claims that, the th that all of the three peak national horse representative bodies support this bill, these bills, and this is not totally correct. The president of the Thoroughbred Breeders Association in a letter to Minister Burke of 13th of August 2008 said, the TBA supports the passage of the bills through the parliament in the spring session on the understanding that the government will consult with industry to establish a fair an equitable registration scheme to ensure the burden of the levy does not fall on too few horse owners. This is a conditional support and relies on the government to review the collection method for fairness and equity. The Australian Horse Industry Council has written in support of these bills, even though many of their member organisations strongly oppose the bills. An AHIC survey of their member organisations reported in July 2008 that while a majority of respondents support the industry becoming a signatory to the EADRA, the proposed collection method based on horse registrations was not supported. Individual Australian Horse Industry Council member groups have also expressed staunch opposition to these bills. The Queensland Horse Council general meeting of the 15th of July 2008 passed the following motion that the QHC is not in favour of signing an emergency disease response agreement or committing to any associated levy at this time. The National Camp Draft Council of Australia also opposed the signing of the, Ad the ADRA due to the financial impost that will be placed upon their members. Mrs Kelly Gannon is, representing, is a representative of the CG, of CGB consultants and the author, author of an online petition which gathered the opinions of 6,743 people to oppose, oppose to the implementation of the bills before us. In her submission to the inquiry, Ms Gannon very adequately and very simply summed up the predominant concern of recreational horse owners when she wrote, the current legislation continues to place the majority of the financial burden of any future disease response on the non-commercial and recre recreational sectors of the equine community, when they are likely not to be the recipients of any financial assistance in the light of past outbreaks. Ms Gannon and the 6,743 people she spoke for see the weakness of what is before us, but the government does not. The coalition cannot support these bills. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. I uh, rise to uh, speak in favour <coughs> of the um, Horse Disease Response Levy Bill of 2008 and uh, the, um, the cognate bills that um, are associated uh, with it. 
Now, uh, this legislation intends to protect the horse industry from future disease outbreaks by bringing the industry into the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, uh, which is otherwise known as the EADRA. And uh, <clears throat> it's intended to ensure that the um, horse industry funds um, its uh, obligations, uh, the, 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 uh, the horse industry uh, funds its uh, obligations under the, uh, the agreement. Now, uh, from the outset, um, I have to say that I'm disappointed that the opposition has uh, decided to oppose this legislation um, on the grounds that it fails to completely satisfy every single stakeholder in the horse industry. Uh, this legislation, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, is legislation that is long overdue. Um, the Coalition uh, have known for years uh, that the horse industry should be covered by the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement. Uh, but they have procrastinated on this issue for far too long. Now, the catalyst for these changes that um, are being proposed in this piece of legislation uh, was, of course, the equine influenza epidemic that uh, devastated the horse industry in uh, the year uh, 2007. The equine influenza outbreak uh, exposed serious deficiencies with Australia's quarantine system and uh, a lack of preparation and foresight as to how the Australian government would fund its disease response to the possibility that one day uh, it would have to deal with an emergency animal response. This highly contagious horse virus was first detected in August of 2007 and it spread rapidly uh, throughout New South Wales and Queensland. Um, but fortunately, uh, it did not affect my home state of South Australia. Uh, yet nevertheless, South Australia did feel uh, the ramifications from the disease. Um, I consider South Australia to have been very fortunate uh, to have escaped being directly affected by the outbreak. And uh, we were lucky that the quarantine procedures that were introduced once the virus was detected uh, did in fact work very well. However, uh, South Australian horse owners uh, still had to abide by the quarantine restrictions that were introduced in the eastern states, uh, which meant that many horses were stranded at uh, whatever location that they happened to be once the restrictions came into effect. Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, many horse owners were extremely inconvenienced by having to care for their horses uh, that were stranded great distances away from their home stables. Racing horses especially have very particular routines and special requirements that were disrupted by these restrictions. Of course, South Australia has got a great reputation uh, in the, uh, the horse uh, racing uh, industry, many great champions having been trained in that state. 
Um, the inconvenience uh, caused by the quarantine placed uh, incredible stress on horse owners. And uh, I believe that the final estimate of the cost to the horse industry will not adequately describe the enormous indirect costs of the, uh, the outbreak. We uh, do know, however, that the cost to the Australian government and to the taxpayers was more than $350 million. And this is a very significant expenditure and a costly reminder of the importance of quarantine in Australia. The uh, independent report into the causes of the equine influenza outbreak, authored by um, the Honourable Mr Ian Callanan, AC, uh, was presented in June of last year. And uh, it found that, uh, and I'll read from uh, the report, fundamental biosecurity measures were not being implemented in the largest government operated animal quarantine station in Australia. This constituted a serious failure by those within the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and uh, AQUIS, who were and had been responsible for the management of quarantine risks and, in particular, the management of post-entry quarantine arrangements. Among the people who ultimately must take responsibility for that failure were the Secretary of the Department as the Director of Animal and Plant Quarantine and the person who, under the Minister, is charged with the execution of the uh, Quarantine Act uh, 1908, the Executive uh, Director of AQUIS and the Executive Manager of Quarantine within AQUIS. Various people have held those positions in recent years. However, the disaster that was the equine influenza outbreak was further compounded by the absence of any cost-sharing structure on how to deal with such a crisis. The Australian taxpayer was ultimately left with the clean-up bill, whereas for many other livestock industries the costs are shared between government and industry. In the event of a future emergency disease outbreak, the legislation seeks to establish a mechanism to put a one-off levy on new horse registrations to recover upfront costs after agreement has been reached on appropriate cost-sharing arrangements. In the event of any future emergency animal uh, diseases within the horse industry, the government will initially underwrite the cost of the response. This is essentially because the horse industry may not have the cash reserves to deal with the crisis uh, when it strikes. Initially, as there is presently no emergency outbreak, the legislation will be set at zero. Uh, it's important to note uh, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the legislation is not retrospective. There will be no recovery of past money spent by the government to eradicate equine influenza or any of the other assistance uh, measures uh, paid out. Uh, but surely the opposition would agree that after spending uh, millions of dollars to deal with eradicating equine influenza, the government does have a responsibility 
uh, to ensure that a proper system is put in place to deal with the crisis should it happen again, but apparently not. The opposition is prepared to oppose these bills because it's not 100 per cent to their liking. Uh, I think that a very poor reason to oppose the legislation uh, as uh, this legislation is uh, so essential. As I mentioned earlier, this legislation is effective because it will finally uh, bring the horse industry into the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement. Livestock industries that are already party to the EADRA include the cattle, sheep, pigs, dairy, poultry, goat and honeybee industries. Honeybees, yes, honeybees. Pigs, do you know something about them? Uh, <clears throat> in his closing remarks, to the House of uh, Representatives, uh, the minister made an excellent uh, observation that if the horse industry were allowed to avoid paying their share in an emergency quarantine response, then other livestock industries would have little incentive uh, to remain in the EADRA. Uh, there is the risk that other livestock industries would conclude that there is no need to pay a levy because uh, the government will bail them out in the event of a crisis. The alternative would be for the Australian government to let in the entire industry collapse, obviously a completely unacceptable alternative. I'd like to remind the members opposite that the government made extensive consultations before drafting this policy. It uh, has the support of the three peak horse industry bodies, including the Australian Horse Industry Council, uh, the Australian Harness Racing Council and uh, the Australian Racing Board. It uh, also has uh, support of many other smaller horse industry bodies, such as uh, Riding for the Disabled, the Australian Horse Riding Centres and the Equestrian Federation of Australia. After much consultation, it was agreed that the fairest way to impose a levy was at the point of registration of a new horse. The coalition has expressed a view that the uh, sporting and hobby clubs will bear too much of the cost of the levy, uh, while the racing industry will get off uh, lightly. Any future levy established is going to be negotiated between the government and the horse industry. I'm confident that any future increase in the levy will be fairly uh, negotiated. In fact, um, the current government has already acted fairly and reasonably by not pursuing the costs of the uh, equine influenza outbreak and has wisely chosen uh, to set the current rate at the level of uh, of zero. Now, Ms. Madam Acting Deputy uh, uh, President, if the coalition votes down this legislation, they are in effect condemning the horse industry to future uncertainty and to the whim of future governments who may not be inclined or in a position to act so reasonably. Uh, these bills, at the very least, 
put down a frame, framework uh, which will move forward and provide certainty to the horse industry in the event of a future emergency disease outbreak, uh, that their horses uh, will be protected. In the absence of any real alternatives being offered by the uh, alternative government, the most sensible and responsible course of action uh, would have been to support this legislation. As I've said before, all the other major livestock industries are party to the EADRA agreement. If this legislation uh, fails to pass the Senate, I fear that the horse industry uh, will be left in a state of limbo for a significant period of time. And so the time to pass this legislation uh, is now. There is a consensus among the peak horse industry bodies that this needs to happen. They are willing to sign up to the EADRA and to be party to this agreement. They are asking to be party to the EADRA even before the horse flu outbreak because they understood that they are in a vulnerable position uh, being uh, as they are outside of this agreement. Uh, this was a request that the previous uh, government failed to action. So I seek to um, summarise the, uh, the current uh, situation and I think um, it's important that we uh, cover all of the uh, circumstances. Uh, the first point I think that is worth noting uh, is that uh, in fact both sides of uh, politics have known for some time that the horse industry should be party to the EADRA. And the second point to uh, note, Madam Acting Deputy President, is that the horse industry as a whole want to be party of the EADRA. The third point to note is that uh, in 2007 the, the quarantine system broke down and emergency control measures were rapidly implemented uh, but at a huge cost and distre distress to the uh, racing community. In uh, the aftermath, uh, the Australian government was then left uh, to uh, clean up uh, the bill. And as I indicated uh, earlier, uh, at a very significant cost to the Australian taxpayers of uh, $350 million. Uh, so now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, after the disaster of the equine influenza outbreak, we have the uh, opportunity uh, to pass legislation uh, that will fix this problem. Uh, and of course the legislation will provide certainty for the future, uh, but yet the opposition has decided to oppose the legislation because it's not entirely to their liking. I believe this to be an irresponsible position for them to, to take, and I sincerely Order. hope the legislation passes the Senate. Your time has expired. Senator Fielding. Uh, Mr uh, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, 
Many Australian families own a horse which brings uh, great joy and fulfilment to their lives. Uh, family First believes that those who own a horse for their private enjoyment, leisure or sporting activities should not be financially burdened in the event of any outbreak of equine influenza, as they would under the proposed horse disease response levy bill. Equine influenza, or EI as it's known, is an exotic disease imported by those who own horses for commercial or business reasons. Those mums and dads and kids who belong to the local pony club, who uh, privately own a horse uh, as a valued and loved uh, family pet, are not responsible for uh, importation and subsequent outbreak of EI. Therefore, they should not have to pay the levy proposed by the Horse Disease Response Levy Bill to fund the recovery effort in the event of future outbreak. Also, those who own a horse as a pet are not making any profit as a result of that ownership and are less financially able to pay a levy, unlike those with commercial interests in the horse industry. The proposed bill seeks to introduce a levy paid by the horse owner when registering a horse for the first time. Those already signed up to the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, the EADRA, such as the poultry, beef and dairy industries, have agreed to help pay for any emergency response to an outbreak of animal diseases. Currently, the horse industry has not signed on to the, the agreement. The aim of these bills is to bring the horse industry into the agreement and to oppose to impose the levy on all horses registered with a horse industry body. This raises the issue of exactly what is meant by the term, quote, horse industry body. Does this include the local pony club? Pony Club Australia, in its submission to the recent Senate inquiry on this bill, was greatly concerned about the effect of the levy will have on private horse owners and horse associations and clubs. The Pony Club, a not-for-profit amateur youth organisation established in Australia in 1934 and consisting of over 55,000 members nationwide, depends upon the goodwill of those thousands of volunteers to run the club's events each weekend. The club's submissions, uh, submission states the associations are not equipped and do not have the capacity financially, administratively or in human resources to manage or in human resources to manage the collection of levies. Their submission also points out the differences between the horse industry, the produce industry such as beef, dairy and poultry. It states in the performance, recreation and hobby sector there is no end product other than the championship and pleasure or performance enjoyed by the rider. As the submission points out, quote, some, are signal, uh, signal, sorry, some are signal parents, some are minors, others are from some of the rural industries which are suffering adverse conditions and are all struggling to meet the increased cost of fuel, feed and general living expenses. For many, it involves substantial personal sacrifice so that children can continue their involvement. In her submission to the committee, Ms Kelly uh, Gannon from Victoria wrote extensively about the inequality of a flat fee levy imposed across the horse industry, affecting individual horse owners who are not involved in the commercial or business aspects of the industry. Ms Gannon stated, it is my belief that the majority of intended potential levy uh, payers do not create the need for these regulations, do not create the risk of disease and do not run commercial profitable businesses and are in actual fact the unfortunate recipients of other people's uh, commercial risk-taking behaviour. So it begs the question, why should these horse lovers who have not created this risk be required to pay for it. Ms Gannon created an online petition against the proposed levy and, uh, and there uh, were uh, over 6,000 people that have signed up in opposition to it. Angela Yind, from exe uh, the Executive Officer of the Equestrian Federation of Australia, in her submission to the committee argues that applying the same levy fee to all horse owners across the industry is grossly unfair, as most horse owners are not responsible and have no control over or accountability from those who import horses. She also expressed concern that the levy would prevent many people from being able to start 
at grassroots level in equestrian sports. Family First believes that while it is important to have strategies in place to deal effectively with a future outbreak of EI, it should be recognised that there are significant differences between other livestock industries and the horse industry. Not all horses can be defined as cattle, as they are often privately owned, love family pets and are used for leisure and sporting activities, not defined as cattle. Private horse owners are usually not involved in commercial activities, which are associated with the risk of importing an exotic disease. For many families, owning a horse is already uh, an expensive hobby, giving great enjoyment, physical exercise and learning experiences to children and adults alike. Adding a levy to the costs of looking after a horse may lead to some families having to give up their pets. It may also stop many from registering their horses, preventing them from participating in sporting competitions. Individuals or families who own a horse for their own pleasure or sporting activities are not making a profit from their horses and therefore are less able to financially fund the emergency response to an outbreak of EI. Those who are involved in importing horses and those responsible for implementing secure quarantine practices to protect Australia from exotic diseases are the ones primarily responsible for any future outbreak of uh, EI, not families and kids participating in es uh, esquarian or pony club activities each weekend. They should not have to foot the bill when those importing horses fail to prevent the disease coming into Australia. Family First will be looking at the uh, committee stages to see uh, uh, whether this issue is addressed adequately and uh, we will reserve our vote on the third reading. Thank you. Senator Burt, sorry. Um, Senator Fielding, are you indicating uh, to me that there will be a committee stage? That you'd like to have a committee stage? It's That's not the correct. intention at the moment, I understand. So you, yeah. all, right. all right, thank you. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I too rise to speak on this, the Horse Disease Levy Response Bill 2008 and associated bills before the Chamber today. And uh, it's a pleasure to speak following the contribution of Senator Fielding, who has accurately canvassed many of the issues and concerns that I have in relation to this legislation. This bill, as previous speakers, and these bills as previous speakers have outlined, relate of course to government responses, in particular to the equine influenza outbreak that crippled Australia's horse industry and horse and equine sector over a long period of time. It is of grave concern to us that the response has so clearly been botched by the government in the way they are attempting to implement it through this legislation. Because responding to the risk of disease in sectors like the equine and horse sector is something that's quite important. Getting it right is quite important. It is a big industry. There are big dollars at stake. There are many jobs at stake. There are, of course, many factors at stake in regards to this sector. But it is equally of concern that it is more than just an industry. And I try to avoid calling it just the horse industry because for so many people it is not an industry. It is a hobby, it is a lifestyle, it is a part of the family. That's what owning a horse for so many Australians is about. This is a very different sector to some of those that Senator Farrell mentioned in his contribution and others have focused on. It's not like all of the other commercial animal sectors because so much of it is in the hobbyist area. So this is a fundamentally different area. It's not like cattle or sheep or goats or honeybees, as we heard before from Senator Farrell. This is a sector which in fact is overwhelmingly dominated by people who have horses as pets, by people who have them for their children, by people who have them as part of their day-to-day -day lifestyle. And it is so many of those people who will be most affected and most impacted by this legislation proposed by the government. I, for one, and I know that many other senators have received strong community opposition to this proposal. I've been in touch 
with many of the equine associations in my home state, been in touch with many of the grassroots pony club organisations scattered throughout South Australia, and many of the other bodies representing various breed groups and others involved in the not-for-profit horse sector. They have continuously expressed to me concerns that this is unfair, unfair on their members, on the people who own the horses, and indeed unfair on those associations and bodies who will potentially be caught up in the whole levy collection process. Just quite recently, at the end of last year, I had the pleasure of attending the National Mounted Games that were being held in Adelaide's parklands, hosted by the Pony Clubs Association of Australia, an annual gathering of pony club riders from around the country, where it's noteworthy they ride borrowed horses when they come to their home city, so we're not talking about the transportation of horses across the country, because these are people who can't necessarily afford to transport their horses across the country, because it is such a small volunteer sector. So these are people who turn up to compete at their own time, at their own expense, in a not-for-profit environment, and of course they are young people. It is young people and families who are involved in a healthy outdoor pastime, a healthy outdoor pastime, one that is so integral to Australia's history and culture as well. We can all reflect back on the pride at the opening of the Sydney Olympics when we saw the horses storm into the stadium there that the Olympics were being held. It shows just how integral the horse industry has been to Australia's culture and should continue to be, but not just as an industry, as a sector that all Australians can and should be able to afford to embrace. As I indicated, there is strong opposition to this piece of legislation and the proposed introduction of these levies on the horse and equine sector. Not just from the Pony Clubs Association, who I mentioned that I've met with and spoken to on numerous occasions and who provided a very detailed submission that has been referred to and will be referred to by me and I'm sure other senators in their contributions to this debate, to the Senate inquiry that was undertaken by the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee, but also by other organisations, including Horse SA, the peak horse industry body in South Australia, which made quite clear that they believed the bill could not be supported, and the Equestrian Federation of South Australia, which also made a submission to the Senate committee inquiry into these bills, which equally made it clear that they believed that the levy as currently proposed would be unfair to the majority of horse owners who are not responsible and have no control over or accountability from those who import horses, and in doing so, as they go on to argue, those who pose in many ways the greatest risk to uh, the security and safety of the equine sector in Australia. There are an estimated 1.2 million horses around Australia. These, of course, are largely overwhelmingly horses, many of which are retired in paddocks, not actually used by anybody but loved or cared for by their owners. There are many that are many, many more that are used on a recreational basis. There are some that are still used on a pastoral basis. And there are a very small number out of that 1.2 million that are actually used as part of the horse industry, particularly the racing sector and the profitable horse sector, where indeed we see the money generated and the jobs generated in the main. The government's proposal, it's understood, will capture some 50 odd thousand or so registered horses. So it captures just a very small proportion of the total horse number in Australia. But still within that small proportion that is captured, it is overwhelmingly the number of registered horses in Australia will overwhelmingly be dominated by those of the not-for-profit sector. Pony Club Australia represents, they say, in excess of 55,000 horse owners in their submission. They state this legislation 
is fundamentally flawed and grossly unfair to horse owners in the performance, recreation and hobby sector. They go on to say that if passed into law, this legislation would, and I quote, inflict great hardship on our association and our members, resulting in a huge reduction of the number of young people participating and have an equally dramatic impact on the number of clubs, facilities available and opportunities to take part in horse sport and recreation. That is a very clear statement of belief from Pony Clubs Australia that, if passed, this legislation would mean less families, less young people, less children would be able to afford to participate in a great recreational activity that is so iconic in Australia's pastime. Why the government would want to proceed with something that will hurt so many families simply trying to do the right thing by their kids is beyond me, because that's what the outcome of this will be. It will simply hurt everyday, hard-working Australians, the types of so-called working families that the government liked to talk about so much before the election, and I must say we don't hear terribly much about now, haven't heard the phrase working families for some time from the, uh, the other side of the chamber, I say, Mr Acting Deputy President. As Senator Johnston rightly points out, that's probably because, uh, because the risk is they're not working, as we see greater and greater unemployment forecast by this government. But I stray from the importance of this particular issue to everyday Australians and families right around Australia. Because to them, this is about social activities and pastimes, healthy activities, healthy outdoor activities that government should be encouraging more of, not putting greater burdens in the way of. That's the fundamental issue that really needs to be looked at here. Why a government would want to make it harder for young people to engage in a healthy outdoor recreation activity that is so iconic to Australia's history. Now, as well as the inequalities in terms of the spread of the levy and collection of the levy, Pony Clubs Australia and others making submissions to the Senate inquiries and in representations to me and other senators have indicated concerns about their capacity to collect these levies, the capacity of organisations to actually be the filtering point to collect the levies of registered horses. Why? because most of them are volunteer organisations. Most of the pony clubs around Australia are so small that, indeed, they wouldn't be registered for GST purposes. All of their office bearers would be filled by volunteers. Their state organisations might employ a part-time staff member or so. These are not organisations that are funded or equipped to collect government taxes or levies. Far from it, these are organisations run by either mums or dads giving up their time to make sure that they can help run the organisation for the benefit of their children, or indeed people like my mother who goes out and works as an instructor on a volunteer basis at pony clubs on her weekends. There's so many examples and instances of Australians volunteering in these organisations. And we're going to ask volunteers working in pony clubs to become tax collectors if this legislation is passed in effect. Well, that is utter madness and shows the selfishness of the government in wanting to pursue this type of proposal. They are not in a place to be able to collect it. With such a high proportion of horses located in this recreation sector and such a high proportion of horses captured by the levy, the government needs to go back and reconsider this. It is unfair, as Senator Colbeck in his comments earlier made clear, to burden the not-for-profit sector with the same type of levy system as will be applied to the for-profit sector, to the horse industry, the industry side of things where you have people, breeders, racing owners and others seeking to derive an income and make money out of the industry. That's where there's a comparison that can be made 
with the other types of animals that are covered by similar levies in this area. That's where you can make a valuable and right example and comparison, not with the overwhelming majority of people who are simply in the recreation sector. So on behalf of all of those who have made such an effort to lobby me and to lobby my fellow Liberal and National senators who have acknowledged from the very introduction of this proposal that it would hurt too many Australians and that it would cause them pain and angst, I urge the Senate to defeat these bills, not to take the government at trust that somehow or other the regulations they say will tighten things up and make it fairer, because that's not the way we should deal with legislation here. We should know the outcome of legislation passed in this place before we allow it to be passed. We shouldn't pass it based on the trust that the government will get the regs right, because frankly, given the lack of consideration for those in the recreational horse sector shown in this bill to date, I struggle to trust the government that they would get those regulations right. So this bill, these bills should be defeated today. I note that the Australian Greens issued a minority report opposing the passage of these bills. I welcome that and I trust that they will stick to their guns. I welcome the comments that Senator Fielding made preceding me, outlining his concerns in this area. I encourage Senator Xenophon, on behalf of my fellow South Australian constituents who we share, to think long and hard before he gives a vote in favour of passing these bills, because these bills will hurt the ordinary South Australians who I know regard Senator Xenophon very highly and I know would hope that he would regard their concerns about a new levy and a new fee as something that he should be listening to, and I'm sure and hope that he will be. In closing, uh, as I read through the submissions made by the various contributors to the Senate inquiry, I was taken in the Pony Club's submission by an extract of a poem from Banjo Patterson's In Droving Days. It's a poem that I think highlights the iconic nature of the Australian equine sector. I think it highlights just why this is a sector that we do need to recognise holds a special place in Australia's hearts and holds a particularly special place to the thousands upon thousands of Australians who voluntarily give their time to love their animals, to help their children love their animals and to participate in this healthy recreation of so many different equine sectors. And the poem finishes with the words, and now he's wandering fat and sleek on the loosened flats by the homestead creek. I dare not ride him for fear he'd fall, but he does a journey to beat them all. For though he scarcely a trot can raise, he can carry me back to droving days. Well, Mr Acting Deputy President, let's not forget the history of those droving days in this country. Let's not forget the mums and dads and children who would get so much pleasure out of the equine sector and let's toss these unreasonable bills out. I think um, Senator Stirl's next on my list. Senator Stirl. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. And I uh, rise to speak on the horse disease response levy bill and associated bills. The purpose of the bills is to impose a levy on the initial registration of horses and for its collection by persons or bodies that register horses in its administration so that the horse industry can repay any amount paid by the Commonwealth on behalf of the horse industry in the event of a disease outbreak. To allow the repayment arrangements via our levy to come into law, it is also necessary to provide for legislation to collect and administer the levy. This is provided for through the Horse Disease Response Levy Bill, a collection bill, sorry, 2008, the collection bill, and through the Horse Disease Response Levy Consequential Amendments Bill 2008, the amendment bill. And Mr Acting Deputy President, the Rudd Labor government is protecting Australia's horse industry and looking ahead to the future. The Australian Horse Industry Council, 
the Australian Harness Racing Council and the Australian Racing Board support the imposition of a horse disease response levy, and the levy rate will be set by regulations under the new Horse Disease Response Levy Act 2008. The, the arrangements provide for our Animal Health Australia, known as AHA, managing the levy received on behalf of the industry, where the main priority is to repay any amount paid by the Commonwealth on behalf of the horse industry in the event of an outbreak of an emergency horse disease. There are no direct financial implications for the Commonwealth, as the intention of the new bill is to facilitate the imposition of a horse disease response levy on the registration of horses payable by owners. I would like uh, now to spend some time discussing the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, commonly known as the ADRA, which is at the core of this issue. The ADRA was launched in March 2002 following a number of concerns about the scope and effectiveness of the then Commonwealth State Cost Sharing Age, uh, Agreement in place since 1955 and which uh, covered only 12 diseases. And Mr. Acting Deputy President, as you know, when there is an outbreak of an exotic disease in any of the animal industries, there needs to be an emergency response to minimise damage to the affected animals and the industry involved. The preferable outcome is eradication of the disease and return of the affected industry to its state prior to the outbreak. The ADRA is a contractual agreement between animal industries and governments and is the only way that industries at risk of disease outbreaks can be certain of a timely and appropriate response to their needs from government. As with all contractual arrangements, there are financial implications and obligations for all parties. The ADRA provides a mechanism for an effective animal industry to call for assistance from governments to provide vital skills and resources to identify, contain, control and eradicate an exotic disease incursion. Under EADRA, governments are obliged to provide and maintain sufficient resources to assist animal industries in their time of need. Without EADRA, no legally binding obligation exists. Now, the outbreak of uh, equine influ influenza EI, in Australia last year, or late the year before, I should say, was absolutely devastating. And despite the coordination efforts of government and industry bodies, and uh, horse and animal health specialists in the Australian horse industry was completely tipped on its ear by the appearance of EI in August 2007. The epidemic made its way to Australia via Japan and lasted some 130 days from August 2007 until the last case was reported in December 2008. Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, as I said, we all remember that. And what a catastrophe that could have been. It was bad enough, Mr Acting Deputy President, if we cast our minds back to probably, the, well, not probably, definitely the first time in our history we were faced with the possibility of not having a, uh, a Melbourne Cup campaign. Not to mention, more importantly, the fiscal damage that was done to those employed in the industry. And unfortunately, through the, uh, through the committee stages, and I'll get to that in a minute, Mr Acting Deputy President, but when we talk about the effects of EI, everyone seems to think, for some strange reasons, that it is the, uh, the, the sport of kings and is therefore only the rich and the privileged that suffered through that EI period. Well, Mr Acting Deputy President, I don't pertain to know a great heap of people employed in the, in the horse industry, but I'm sure there are strappers, trainers, owners, suppliers of veterinary products and the like, and those that are employed on Saturdays or midweeks, whether it be from your great state of Victoria or my even greater state of Western Australia, that are certainly oh, not Senator. in the League of the Kings. So it was absolutely disgraceful that we even got to that stage. And I just cannot believe that someone, someone hasn't been chucked in jail with a key thrown away over that episode. But anyway, Mr Acting Deputy President, to get back to the bills. The passage of these bills would enable the horse industry to become a party to the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, the, Ad the ADRA, something the industry has wanted for many years. By establishing a levy arrangement through these bills, the horse industry would become a signatory to the ADRA and would have certainty for resourcing and responding to emergency horse disease outbreaks. As mentioned earlier, the bills establish a mechanism to apply a levy on the initial registration of horses and provide arrangements for the collection and administration of that levy so that the horse industry could repay the Commonwealth of Australia for underwriting the horse industry's share of costs. 
such a levy, Mr Acting Deputy President, would be payable once on the initial registration of a horse with a recognised breed society or performance organisation. Horses already registered prior to any emergency response would not be liable to pay a levy. And I do want to reiterate that, Mr Acting Deputy President, they would not have to pay the levy. It will only apply to new horse registrations. As the horse industry does not need to repay its share of the cost of the 2007 equine influenza emergency response, these bills establish a zero rate levy. No positive levy rate can be set unless the industry is consulted. However, regulations would prescribe a future levy rate. Regulations, Mr Acting Deputy President, will be developed in consultation with industry to help ensure that they are fair and equitable. Regulations cannot go beyond the scope of the bills and will be disallowable in Parliament. And I think that's very, very important that we get that message out, that they will be disallowable. Nevertheless, drafting instructions and principles underlying the intended operation of the proposed regulations have been provided to the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. And, uh, as you know, Mr Acting Deputy President, that bill was sent off to the committee and the committee did have a number of hearings here in Canberra. And it was, uh, there was a, uh, quite a few groups that came and presented to the committee. And just while I'm on that, Mr Acting Deputy President, the difficulties that we, that we experienced through the committee stage, that when we were first talking about this, and this goes back to the previous government, the Howard government, that started the conversations with the horse industry by those three uh, major groups, thoroughbred and racing and harness racing. And at all stages, I believe in the best interest of the country for Australia, that the previous government had only the best interest for Australia and the horse industry in, foremost in their mind. And, and I, I acknowledge that. But it must and it was absolutely frustrating to have conversations going with the representative body, and, and I think it was at least eight to twelve months, Mr Acting Deputy President, but I will stand corrected if I've got those months wrong. When there was conversations going between the government and this body, that they believed that they were speaking for the majority of the industry. When we go to the committee hearing, when we have those committee hearings here in Canberra, there was a number of other associations from camp draft horses and pony clubs and all that who absolutely came out diametrically opposed, saying the industry didn't represent them, the three major groups of the horse racing industry. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, the frustration I had as the chair of the committee, why did it take that long for someone to come out and say that, the, the, that they weren't being represented, their part? And as I say to you, in all fairness, the previous government, I take my hat off to them. They, I honestly believe they thought that they were dealing with the industry, as we thought they were dealing with the industry. And it was very frustrating when a couple of groups turned up to tip an absolute bucket of vile on that industry or the representatives of that industry to tell us at the committee stage that their voice was not being heard and they didn't speak for them. But as I was saying, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, at present, we're at a stage where the peak bodies involved in the horse industry have a levy system that is at least acceptable and agreeable to all involved to help protect against any the potentially devastating effects of a future exotic disease incursion. Now, Mr. Acting Deputy President, we must create these protections now so that the sector is protected into the future. The worst option for Australia and for the horse industry would be for there to be no levy put in place. It would be dis, uh, dis devastating and neglectful if this parliament ends up leaving the horse industry in the same position it was in at the beginning of EI. And I want to stress that the Senate is opposite. It would be devastating and neglectful. This package of bills will give the horse sector the certainty that other livestock sectors have when responding with government to emergency animal disease incursions. <clears throat> the levy is currently set at zero dollars, as I said, and will only be raised upon an incident or breakout of an epidemic. In 2006, the horse industry had proposed to the Howard government a levy arrangement to protect the horse industry against the impacts of emergency disease outbreaks. Of course, Mr Acting Deputy President, under the previous government arrangements were not put in place to sign up the horse uh, industry to the EADRA and establish the industry's emergency disease preparedness. As a result, at the time of the outbreak of the equine influenza in August 2007, the horse industry was not a signatory to the agreement and was left dangerously exposed. The horse sector remains the only major livestock group not included in the EADRA. <coughs> <Excuse me. clears throat> 
Without cost-sharing arrangements in place, <coughs> in the event of another disease outbreak, the sector could be liable for considerable costs to contain and eradicate any disease which would normally be shared with governments under the ADRA framework. And I urge senators opposite. Is that what you really want to see? Let's keep our fingers crossed that we are not ever faced with such a situation. But what a shocking situation it will be if this bill is knocked back with the assistance of senators opposite and others. It is worth noting, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the former Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, the Hon. Peter McGoran, is now the CEO of Thoroughbred Breeders Australia, who support the passage of the bills. And I just find that absolutely incredible that the senior, former senior minister is on side. Now, if we take it back to the good old days, Senator McGowan, he should have taken his brother out the back and had it sorted out, but unfortunately it hasn't worked. But the opposition opposed these bills in the House and incorporated dissenting reports within the Senate committee report. However, Mr Acting Deputy President, excuse me for a minute. <clears throat> The independent member for uh, New England, Tony Windsor MP, supported the passage of the bills in the House. There needs to be some system to cope with the consequences of an outbreak, and this bill provides for this. It seems reasonable, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Australian taxpayer will expect to be reimbursed for at least part of the cost of an emergency response. Not all, but at least part. The financial security of many Thousands of Australians rely on a strong and secure horse industry, as I had said earlier on. Now, in my home state of Western Australia, Mr Acting Deputy President, the industry employs an estimated 12,000 people, and the Rudd government will not sit back and wait for the outbreak of disease in the horse population. The government will implement the recommendations of the Callanan Report and will act to strengthen our quarantine and biosecurity services. <clears throat> The government will give those people working in the horse industry a solid footing so that they know that if there is another outbreak, they will have governmental protection and not an industry catastrophe. The measures in this bill are appropriate and they are necessary. There is ample capacity within the legislation for the levy schedule to take into account different sectors of the industry. And as I have mentioned, the bill sets the proposed rate of horse disease response levy at zero. I can't stress that enough, Mr Acting Deputy President. As senators uh, are aware, the bill did go to the Senate Standing Committee for Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport for further examination, as I had said, and it was evident to the committee that the general principle on which this legislation is based is soundly consistent with measures applying to all livestock. This legislation represents an insurance measure to ensure that horse owners will have funds to deal with any future outbreak of equine diseases. The committee resolved to support compulsory registration for all horses and believes that this, together with the establishment of a national register, would greatly enhance the ability of animal health agencies to respond in the case of an emergency. The establishment of such a register will, of course, require further consultation and agreement between the states and the territories, and we've not backed away from that through this whole process, Mr Acting Deputy President. A number of submissions and testimonies were made by interested and affected parties over the course of the hearings, and the committee heard a number of concerns of community recreational owners and riders. It is important for all senators to remember that the policy detail of the horse disease response levy are not yet available and should not be condemned or discarded at this time. The bills before us are enabling legislation, and that detail will be provided and, as I said before, will be open for comment and consultation. It is also important, Mr Acting Deputy President, through you that all senators be aware that these bills have the support, once again I must stress, they have the support of a number of industry groups, such as the Australian Racing Board Limited, the Harness Racing Australia and the Australian Horse Industry Council, as well as Thoroughbred Breeders Australia, Riding for the Disabled and the WA Horse Council, just to name a few. I am confident, Mr Acting Deputy President, as is the committee, that the regulations can be framed so as to take account of the wide diversity of horse ownership and riding activity in the community and will also be equitable. Equity issues are important to consider when discussing these bills, as whilst all parties agree with the principle of a broadly based levy, it may be appropriate to exempt some classes of owners, riders and community groups. 
And uh, I just do want to, in summing up, Mr Acting Deputy President, I do really wish to, without uh, uh, sounding like a broken record, but I really do wish to, uh, to stress once more, in regard to performance organisations, the intent is to cover organisations that hold regular events or competitions, such as polo matches, endurance events, camp drafting, equestrian road days and dressage. However, Small community organisations and groups such as some pony clubs and riding for the disabled will likely be excluded from the levy arrangements where these organisations do not conduct regular competition or competitions. And as I had said previously, and I will reiterate, the regulations have not been prepared as detailed consultation with industry has to take place, needs to take place, and it will take place. This will be done following the passage of the bills. The regulations cannot, as I stressed, and I have said before, they cannot go beyond the scope of the bills and will be disallowable in the, par in the parliament. So for fellow senators and senators opposite, this bill has been debated in both houses and has been reviewed by the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, a wonderfully hard-working committee, if I can say so myself, upon, and that's from all members of that committee. Uh, upon review of the submissions made, comments and testimonies received and extensive consultation, it was the committee's recommendation to the Senate that these bills be passed without amendment. And, Mr Acting Deputy President, on that, I do commend these bills to the Senate. Senator Xenophon. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I can indicate my support for the second reading uh, of this bill. And I can also express my gratitude to the information that's been provided uh, by the Minister's office uh, uh, as recently as this afternoon, which I'll refer to shortly. Uh, I won't uh, outline what the purposes of these bills are. I think uh, fellow senators have adequately done that, and I won't waste the Senate's time by reiterating that, other than to say that, to me, the nub of this issue is not that something ought to be done um, to, to protect Australians and to protect the industry from, equite, from EI. And we know from the uh, report, from the inquiry conducted by former High Court Justice, uh, the Honourable uh, Mr Callanan uh, QC, that, uh, that there were some serious flaws that needed to be addressed uh, as a result of what happened um, to, the, uh, to the EI outbreak that was the subject uh, of his inquiry. But it seems to me that the key issue here is whether it is appropriate uh, to give the government uh, what some may see, to give the executive arm of government uh, what some may see is a blank check in the context of being able to raise this levy without sufficient guidelines or safeguards with respect to that. And that is why I would like to formally request, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, that there be a committee stage in relation to this bill so that further questions can be asked, in addition to uh, uh, any response that the minister makes uh, with respect to the second reading contributions in relation to this bill. And I am mindful uh, of the uh, comments made by uh, Senator Birmingham uh, that, uh, that uh, horse riding, recreational horse riding, uh, is, uh, is a very significant activity in my home state of, of South Australia. And, and indeed, I think it would, it would apply to, to really to all states. If I may refer, Mr Acting Deputy President, to the um, uh, to correspondence I received or an email I received from the, uh, uh, the Minister's office this afternoon, and I am grateful for that information. A number of matters uh, were raised, and uh, I think it would be appropriate for me to put on the record my concerns, um, or rather questions arising out of that, uh, uh, those communications. Uh, I note that the drafting instructions and principles underlying the intended operation of the proposed regulations have been provided to the Senate in committee that inquired into this. Uh, and uh, further, that uh, these drafting instructions for the regulations specify that those horse groups which do not hold regular competitions and do not meet the description of a performance organisation or breeding society will be exempt from paying any future levy. Uh, my question to the minister is what is defined, what, what does the government consider uh, is uh, our regular competitions? What is the definition of that? What are the guidelines to, pro to provide some comfort for those uh, who do have uh, uh, horse clubs uh, for recreational horse users as to what the parameters of that will be, both in terms of what does regular mean 
and what's the definition of a competition. If it's a few people getting together uh, around, a, around a paddock uh, occasionally um, um, where uh, there's a barbecue after the event uh, and a couple of bottles of wine, does that, is that defined as a competition? Um, I think it's important that we define as much as possible in the context of this debate, in the context of the committee stage, what a competition uh, is and, and, what, uh, uh, and what regular is meant. I also note that the Minister's Office says that uh, if they don't hold competitions, then they don't have to pay uh, a levy. Uh, and I also note that the, uh, the government's position is that, uh, however they must, in accordance with the legislation, the government's principles for levies consult with industry on these finer details and that, and that this is the government's intention. My question on the concept in relation to the whole issue uh, of, of, uh, of the regulations is that it's intended that there will be consultation. I accept that. Uh, if the minister can provide details as to what the time frame for that consultation is, what the extent of that consultation will be, what the nature of that consultation will be as well, uh, I believe that would be quite useful. Uh, and the organisations in broad terms that will be consulted. There's also the issue uh, of um, there's also the issue that in in the context uh, of this uh, uh, consultation that there be uh, uh, um, that regulations will arise out of that. Is it intended that the regulations will be provided to the Senate before they come into force? Uh, and will the Senate have an opportunity to disallow those regulations uh, um, before, before that, that they're actually uh, uh, in force? And, and I refer to the debate that we had uh, uh, late last year in relation to uh, Minister Albanese's uh, legislation uh, dealing with, uh, uh, with uh, levies and road user charges, where my recollection is that uh, in the context of that legislation there was an opportunity to to disallow, and I may be wrong on this, but my understanding was there was an opportunity to, to disallow before the legislation, before the regulations actually came to force. So there's that uh, perhaps additional safeguard um, uh, with, respect to, with respect to that. The uh, information provided by the minister's office indicates uh, that uh, it's also intended to ex exclude small groups from paying a levy where it would not be efficient uh, to do so. Uh, if the minister could provide details as to what is defined, uh, what, a, what is a small group, uh, and what is meant by efficiency, um, I think the explanation goes on to say, in other words, if they are so small, then it is not worth the administrative cost to actually collect this levy. Um, I think it goes on to say we are intending this to be organisations with less than 10 registrations in a period of three months. Uh, so that means that an organisation that has less than 40 new members in a year will be most likely not to pay a levy. Uh, but again, the, uh, the advice says we are obliged to consult with industry about this before making a final decision. Uh, to what extent does the government say that they will move away or stray from that in the context of this particular, uh, in the context of uh, formulating the regulations? Um, I note uh, that um, that the. Uh, uh, that the minister has committed himself to, to detailed consultation with industry and the regulations, and I accept that. Uh, do I take it from that that industry is also the various recreational horse groups? Uh, because there is an argument uh, that's, uh, that's been well articulated in the Senate inquiry report, uh, particularly the dissenting report. Uh, there were three dissenting reports um, in relation to equity issues um, as to the fairest uh, collection mechanism uh, and whether there are some uh, groups of horse owners that are in a better position to pay, as I believe there would be in terms of uh, uh, racehorses compared to uh, recreational users. So they're my concerns. It's my intention to support the second reading uh, stages of this bill. I do have concerns about the lack of precision uh, in the legislation in terms of how this will actually operate. It's been left up to regulations. Uh, but in the absence of it being spelt out explicitly, if there are undertakings by the government as to how this will be, uh, uh, will be dealt with, as to how um, the, uh, 
the matters raised uh, by the minister's office will be specifically dealt with uh, in the regulations. To have that degree of particularity, that would assist me in uh, determining my position uh, at the end of the committee stage. Senator O'Brien. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. At the outset, uh, consistent with my uh, <coughs> uh, interest return to the Senate, I uh, declare that I own horses. They are thoroughbred mares, uh, and so potentially, at least, I would be impacted by the outcome of this legislation in terms of uh, potentially uh, uh, the uh, operation of any levy mechanism. Can I say that uh, uh, it is important to put this debate into context? This uh, uh, piece of legislation follows upon the worst disease outbreak uh, that the Australian horse industry has ever seen. And um, that uh, outbreak occurred, as has been established by a Royal Commission, by total inadequate uh, quarantine arrangements administered by the previous government, by a quarantine facility uh, that uh, operated uh, with uh, what can only be described as totally inadequate, indeed uh, laughable precautions being taken to prevent the spread of disease uh, uh, in what was supposedly a high security quarantine facility. Uh, it is remarkable that uh, we did not experience an outbreak prior to the one that we experienced in 2007. And it was a matter of coincidence and coincidence only that it occurred because of a thoroughbred uh, introduction of the disease. What needs to be understood is that there were uh, instances uh, drawn to uh, the attention of uh, some people at that time that there had been questionable procedures which operated in relation to uh, horses of other breeds, particularly uh, Arab breeds, introduced into Australia for show and display purposes. Uh, uh, in uh, uh, earlier years. So it isn't accurate to say that the only risk that Australia faced or continues to face in relation to the introduction of disease comes from uh, the uh, shuttle stallion arrangements that have been described, uh, particularly uh, in the dissenting raw, uh, report by opposition senators, as a, as a part justification for the position that they take. The reality is, of course, that uh, um, the shuttling of uh, uh, thoroughbred stallions is a significant part of the risk factor, but only part of it in relation to the introduction of disease. Of course, with any um, um, import procedure that involves live animals, there is a risk, and therefore it is incumbent upon a country like Australia, which has uh, a uh, a very good uh, record of uh, controlling and, and excluding animal diseases uh, from operating for, for Australia operating a set of quarantine arrangements which uh, are uh, rigorously observed and which take into account uh, risk factors uh, which can uh, uh, make extremely unlikely the introduction of those diseases. Right. Uh, can I say, in relation to horse flu, the, the, the evidence is well and truly in that the risk was known, uh, that the government had been alerted to the prospects of uh, a great uh, impact on Australian, uh, the Australian racing and breeding and other horse industries in this country by the introduction of the disease, but in fact they presided over a system which saw us move away from a rigorous quarantine system to one which was haphazard and indeed doomed to failure. The, uh, the evidence of the Royal Commissioners contained in the Royal Commissioners report is a damning indictment of the way that our quarantine system in relation to um, those particular animal, animals, but indeed others, uh, 
uh, was run. Uh, we, we've seen with the uh, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee uh, consistent criticism of uh, uh, the quarantine arrangements that existed under the previous government. Uh, we've seen uh, criticisms which related to um, uh, plant disease being introduced as well as animal disease being introduced. And so it certainly uh, is timely that our quarantine system is under review and it certainly is timely that the government has uh, received a report and has indicated that it will give effect to the recommendations of that report to strengthen the quarantine system so that Australia can be best served by the arrangements that government put in place to protect Australian industries from the predations of disease from other countries. In relation to uh, uh, the measures in this piece of legislation, can I say that uh, uh, the uh, position taken by uh, the opposition and the Greens, uh, uh, frankly, is not one which is consistent with positions taken in relation to legislation that came before this chamber under the previous government, and certainly not from the opposition then government, because on a regular basis, uh, and certainly during the last three years of that government, uh, this uh, chamber would be faced with legislation without seeing the content of regulations which would have a substantial effect on the industry, the subject of the legislation. So here we have the opposition's hypocrisy being revealed that in government they say you, you should trust the government and you should accept the undertakings of a minister as to consultation and you should accept that in, in fact uh, uh, there is the ability to disallow the legislation even when they have the numbers in the chamber. But then in this case where this government will not have the numbers in this chamber and will have to put regulations before the chamber, they're saying well, we shouldn't pass this legislation until we see the, the regulations. I mean, what hypocrisy is that? The fact of the matter is, if this government cannot uh, justify its regulations, then clearly with the position taken uh, by the opposition senators and the Greens in relation to uh, adequate regulatory mechanisms underpinning the legislation, any regulation put before this chamber would be in grave danger if, there hadn't, if the minister hadn't conducted or conducted himself in a way that complied with the undertakings that were given to uh, all parties and the industry in relation to how his, process, his, his role in the regulatory process would be carried out. And indeed, even if the process was carried out, if the form of the regulation had some flaw in it that uh, was identifiable and which both the, uh, the Greens and the opposition were unhappy with. So all of those fail-safes exist in relation to this legislation now, and all the government is saying, let's put in place a piece of legislation which will allow the matter to go forward, which, which will allow the industry to have the benefit of the protections that this uh, uh, emergency animal disease response agreement will have, will allow for the industry, in a broad sense, to make provision to um, uh, pay for the cost of these incursions in the future because it is unfair to taxpayers that we do not do that. And the fact that the previous government did that is not an, a, a, an exoneration of this government not taking on the responsibility of taxpayers and saying, well, every other animal industry that wants the benefit of government is prepared to contribute to the emergency animal disease response agreement. But in this case, we're going to let the horse industry off. I don't think that's equitable to taxpayers. I don't think it's equi equitable to the industries that make the contribution. And as I said, there is an adequate failsafe for both the opposition and the Greens in relation to the regulatory process which would follow this legislation. So what's the problem? Are there groups out there who think uh, they're going to be done over? Or is it, is it the case that there's a, a secret agenda that somehow all of the costs should be shifted to the thoroughbred industry because uh, there's a perception that only the thoroughbred industry brings a risk. That proposition is demonstrably false, and an examination of the records of importation of animals and in horses into this country will show it. Uh, an examination of, of uh, the horses that have been through quarantine facilities will show it. Let's look at uh, the proposition that uh, all newly registered animals 
should, should it, uh, be uh, the subject of levy raising uh, and, and look at uh, some numbers because uh, it was suggested uh, by, uh, uh, in the report of opposition senators that uh, the, uh, the racing sector would be exempt from the levy. Well, the racing sector is not the breeding sector, but they buy from the breeding sector and, uh, in some cases, they pay a lot of money to the breeding sector for the animals that they race. And the breeding sector is the sector that registers thoroughbreds. I had a look at some figures uh, um, recently on, uh, on the numbers of, uh, of animals uh, uh, registered with the Australian Stud Book. That's where the, all thoroughbreds are registered. Um, and on their registration figures, somewhere between uh, 17,700 and 18,700 thoroughbreds have, reg have been registered for each of the last five years. So on the statistics, which are in, uh, imprecise in the opposition's dissenting report, a very significant proportion, I suggest uh, well over a third uh, in all likelihood, of the animals which would be registered would be thoroughbreds, so that at least well over a third of the cost would be borne by the thoroughbred industry. It's a, um, uh, a distraction from reality to talk about whether the racing industry pays or not, because the industry is actually divided into a breeding sector, and it's the breeding sector. It is in the breeding sector, and through the Australian Stud Book, that uh, registration takes place. So um, I'm not sure what the basis of the opposition's concern is, given the uh, very significant numbers of animals that are registered there. I'm not familiar with uh, um, uh, other uh, sectors, such as the standard breed sector, as to how many. Uh, foals are registered, but they, I believe, have uh, similar registration arrangements. There are other breeds that have registration arrangements as well, uh, uh, which uh, uh, would equally benefit from these arrangements and, in terms of equity, ought to make contribution. And there are uh, uh, many owners of, uh, of animals uh, uh, of a variety of breeds who, who uh, uh, use animals for pleasure. Um, possibly members of the Equestrian Federation, uh, various pony clubs, uh, and uh, with an equitable sharing of cost, uh, they would have, I suggest, uh, a, a, an equal right to be considered in any future cases of disease outbreak as to uh, disease mitigation, uh, cost sharing and the like. So if a disease were to break out in, for example, pony clubs rather than the thoroughbred sector, they would be beneficiaries of these sorts of arrangements, uh, um, uh, as it might be said that uh, parts of the thoroughbred sector were uh, recently. But of course, uh, some of the benefits, the benefits which were um, um, uh, given to the uh, thoroughbred sector by the then government, now opposition, but which were supported by the now government, then opposition, um, were uh, based upon economic impact. And I'm not sure that anyone's suggesting that those arrangements shouldn't have been put in place. Uh, it may be that there are suggestions that others should have received benefits that weren't eligible for benefits under those arrangements. But uh, this legislation cannot correct that, and nor should it. This is uh, a piece of legislation which is about creating a mechanism for the horse industry to sign up to the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement and for the matter to be progressed to the point where there is a levy, levy collection mechanism in circumstances where the minister, I believe, has given uh, very proper and adequate undertakings to this chamber and to the industry as to how the development of the um, regulations would proceed and, indeed, as I outlined earlier, in circumstances where were there uh, significant dissatisfaction with those regulations the, uh, the, uh, uh, I understand that the regulations would be subject to disallowance. Given the position of the Greens and the opposition, uh, the, the minister would uh, probably f uh, have reason to fear, if he, uh, if he didn't get strong agreement, that there might be a move to disallow. In all of those circumstances, why oppose the legislation? What is the barrier? Uh, as I say, from the opposition's point of view, this is, this is a matter of hypocrisy given the position that uh, they in government took 
in relation to various pieces of legislation and the regulatory arrangements that followed upon them. And, uh, having read the dissenting, one page of dissenting report by the Greens, um, really it seems like a toss of the coin decision. You, you could, you could uh, uh, read it either way. You know, on the one hand, uh, it's too early to condemn the legislation without the consideration of regulations that would follow. Uh, but then, on the other hand, they're saying, well, maybe it's too early to support the legislation without considering the regulations. I suggest, in the circumstances, that isn't a justification to defeat this legislation. That isn't a reason to send this back to the drawing board. Uh, that isn't a reason to potentially delay the implementation of a mechanism which, as I said earlier, uh, potentially will, will deal equitably with taxpayers, will deal equitably with other industries that are already contributors under the um, Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement and have made their commitment to make such contribution and to the horse industry for their future viability and certainty, where arrangements such as this ultimately will be in the interests of the horse industry. Uh, perhaps numbers will uh, make sure this legislation does not proceed uh, and that, that uh, this matter is further delayed. I hope that's not the case. As I say, I do have an interest uh, uh, in the horse industry. Uh, I do think that it would be better that this legislation passes and the minister is allowed to get on with the job that he's committed to doing to get proper regulations and to get uh, a levy system in place that's uh, got significant support in the industry and is equitable to all. Thank you, Senator O'Brien. Uh, Senator Sherry. Yeah, thank you very much. In, in summing up for the government, in handling the legislation on behalf of the, um, uh, the minister, uh, Mr Berg, from the other place. Um, firstly, thank you to all those who have spoken. I, um, I did listen to part of the debate. I want to commend um, uh, certainly Senator O'Brien and Senator Stirl, uh, whose contributions I did listen to. Um, uh, I think um, the work as outlined by Senator Stirl on the, uh, on the Senate committee and the um, the observation he made that um, all members of the committee on both sides of the parliament, um, Liberal National Party, Labor, uh, who uh, Greens who participated in those hearings um, uh, did a very, very thorough job. Um, but uh, also that uh, the contribution made by Senator O'Brien, who I know has a, uh, and, a and he's obviously mentioned, has a very long term and deep knowledge uh, and participation. Uh, in this sector, uh, and I suspect um, a knowledge that is uh, unsurpassed in this parliament. Um, the purpose of the bills is to give the horse industry the certainty that other livestock industries have when responding uh, with government to emergency horse disease outbreaks. And the proposed levy arrangements for the horse, horse industry are similar to those applying to chicken meat, honey, cattle, dairy, laying chickens. Um, sheep meat, lamb, goat and the pig industries. We're not dealing with a new principle here, um, the principle of um, a, a levy applying to a wide range of, um, of uh, a primary industry uh, in this country has been long established. In fact, I um, uh, know from my former time when we were in government uh, um, and uh, I was a parliamentary sec from 93 to 96. It was not infrequently uh, that the Senate was dealing with levies of this nature, and I point that out because it's a, it's a, uh, the, the levies in particular sectors um, and the principle of a levy and their application has been of very long standing, at least um, uh, 20 years, to my knowledge, and I think importantly supported by both sides of politics, supported by both sides of politics. Regrettably, um, we have a situation where the, the now opposition, the Liberal National Party opposition, have abandoned that approach in principle. Um, uh, now I might just point out in passing, the, the Labor Party went in opposition from 1996 to, um, to uh, 2007. Uh, maintain consistent principle, which was to support uh, levies, to support levies and their necessary increase from time to time. And I do find it somewhat odd that the the now Liberal National Party are opposing 
a long-held princi principle which both sides of politics um, have consistently supported for so long. I do find it somewhat odd the observation uh, that the former primary industry minister in the Liberal National Party, um, um, Mr Peter McGowan, who is now no longer in the parliament, but um, <coughs> uh, again, uh, I observe when he was a minister uh, in the Liberal National Party government, uh, he supported that principle. And I find it, um, and, and as I understand it, since he's, uh, he's left politics and uh, is involved in the uh, horse industry, he supports this levy. He supports this levy. Um, he supports these um, uh, these arrangements. So I do find it uh, uh, somewhat um, uh, strange that the uh, Liberal National Party, um, as soon as they move into opposition, um, uh, abandon the long-held principles uh, that have been um, an approach in this regard uh, that has been long held by both sides of politics, whether in government or opposition. Now I do know and I do acknowledge that the application and development of levies is not an easy job. It's not an easy job because there are diverse, um, there are diverse uh, arrangements in a particular sector. So it's not an easy job. Um, just briefly on reflection, I can recall um, uh, attempts to introduce a levy into the vegetable industry uh, in that period of 93 to 96. And I have to say, uh, having been involved in meeting with an incredible range of, um, of diverse organisations and trying to find also a, a cost-effective way of applying the levy, it was certainly no easy task. Um, I do acknowledge that. It's not an easy job to bring together uh, sometimes a diverse, um, a diverse um, uh, group within a particular industry to apply a levy. Um, it was in 2006 that the horse industry requested the former government, Liberal National Party government, to introduce a statutory levy on the registration of horses as the best means of protecting the industry against the impacts of emergency horse disease outbreaks. A large number of alternative levies have been evaluated by the industry, but were considered to be less equitable than the mechanism selected. So it's not as though this is a this is a rush job. This goes back to 2006. Um, unfortunately, at the time of the outbreak of the equine influenza in August 2007, the industry was still not a signatory to the Emergency Animal Disease Response Agreement, which would have assisted with the industry's emergency disease preparedness. While the intention at the time was that the horse industry and the government would share the costs, and I do want to say that, that I think all levies that I'm aware of involve a cost sharing. It's a cost sharing. The, the, um, it is reasonable to expect um, uh, individuals and participants in a particular industry to, to share part of the cost with government, the broader taxpayer. But it is not un but it is unreasonable to expect the taxpayer, the broad taxpayer, to pay all the costs. So there's a cost sharing, and again, a long-held principle uh, in the approach to uh, to uh, levies um, in this country over the last couple of decades. Since their introduction into Parliament, these bills have been the subject of the inquiry by the Senate Standing Committee on Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport. The committee recommended the passage of these bills. Uh, whilst the Liberal National Opposition and the Australian Greens submitted dissenting reports, the government is confident the regulations under the bills will provide an equitable, effective and efficient levy mechanism that would substantially address these concerns. The process of fa framing these regulations will involve close consultation, they will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny and an important safeguard for all stakeholders. Nevertheless, drafting instructions for the regulations have been provided to the Senate Committee which provide clarity to many of the questions raised during debate, and I intend to add in, re in response to the request by Senator Xenophon uh, and the, um, the contribution, as always, very incisive, informed contribution that he made. Um, I do intend to provide some additional information at the conclusion of my second reading remarks in, a, in an attempt, I hope, to, to ensure that the committee stage of the, um, the, of the uh, discussions is, um, is kept um, within reason. I would point out the Commonwealth doesn't have the constitutional authority to make national horse registration compulsory. However, the chief veterinary officers of the states and territories are examining options to collect data on horse ownership. 
The preferred method is to identify properties that own horses similar to other systems in use for disease control purposes and work with existing horse registration bodies. It's been suggested the commercial horse sector presents a greater risk and should shoulder a heavier levy burden. Now the reality is, the reality is that non-commercial horses pose similar risks of bringing exotic diseases into Australia. Of the 515 horses imported to Australia from countries other than New Zealand in 2007, some 47 per cent were not from the thoroughbred or standard bred sectors. Further, a number of diseases which threaten all horse sectors are either already present in Australia, such as Hendra virus, or could be introduced by the movement of insects or birds. Having to manage these diseases once they become endemic would be a cost to all horse owners and to the wider community. All horses, whether they belong to the commercial or non-commercial sectors of the industry, benefit equally from the containment and eradication of diseases. As the President of the Australian Horse Industry Council, representing many non-commercial horse owners, Mr Barry Smith argues, quote, every horse is susceptible and everyone benefits from an eradication program. Now, these bills provide for a mechanism to impose, collect and appropriate a new levy on the initial registration of horses and provide certainty for resourcing emergency responses to future horse disease outbreaks. I've indicated uh, some two years of development, discussion, and look, if we can do it for the pig industry or the sheep industry or the cattle industry um, and other examples, I'm surely we can do it for, the, um, uh, for uh, horses. Now, if it's passed, the levy will be set at zero. If activated in response to a disease incursion, the levy will be payable only once and appropriated through Animal Health Australia. The horse industry does not need to repay its share of the costs of the 2007 emergency response. The legislation is supported by three peak national representative industries, Australian Horse Industry Council, Harness Racing Australia and the Australian Racing Board. In addition, the bills have the support of the Thoroughbred Breeders Australia, Riding for the Disabled, the Equestrian Federation of Australia, Australian Horse Riding Centres and many other groups. The majority of the horse industry have argued the legislation should be passed in the interest of the broader horse industry, the national interest. I urge all senators to support the bills to provide certainty and protection to all Australians who own horses. Now, Specifically in response to some questions Senator Xenophon raised, um, uh, around the definition of um, what is considered a regular competition. Um, now, obviously, there's consultation going on about this, but the regular competition, regu regular scheduled event, which is advertised by an organisation. Um, uh, the example that Senator Xenoph Xenophon uh, raised, a couple of people getting together, going off horse riding, um, maybe having a race between themselves, having the barbie afterwards and a glass of wine, um, that uh, would not be covered by the levy. It's not a regular scheduled event advertised and conducted by an organisation. Um, to the issues of, uh, of regulations that he touched on, uh, intention to consult, yes. Um, look, I think everyone would accept that um, Minister Burke um, uh, as indicated, the consultation on the details of the regs will occur. It will be thorough. It will be as widespread as possible. In fact, any, any and everyone I'm told that has a view will be consulted and listened to. Any and everyone. The timetable, Senator Xenophon, I'm indicated, likely to be about six months. Likely to be six months, and uh, you know that's I think a, a very reasonable period. The extent of the organisations. Um, as I've said, any and everyone that's got a view on this matter will be consulted with. Um, Thoroughbred Breeders Australia, Riding for the Disabled, Australian Horse Centres, representing some 80 horse riding schools and 40,000 riders across Australia, Equestrian Federation of Australia, the Welsh Pony and Club Society of Australia, West Australian Horse Council, Southern Horse Council, representing a range of groups in WA, Pony Clubs, Queensland Horse Council, and camp, camp drafting. And anyone else, anyone else on the face of Australia that wants to be involved in the consultation will be consulted with and listened to over the coming months. Um, 
And um, I have also sought clarification. Senator Xenophon raised the issue, well, um, the regulations are finalised after this consultation. Um, uh, will, um, uh, will the, uh, the Senate obviously has, or the, or the House for that matter, have an opportunity to disallow the regulations, but would be given assurance that, um, that they would not, the operative date for regulations, um, uh, which could obviously be the date they are approved by the Executive Council, would the Senate have the opportunity to debate and disallow those before they come into effect? And I can give you that assurance, Senator Xenophon. The minister will ensure that um, the operative date will, um, will provide for a period when the parliament, the reps or the Senate is sitting so they can disallow before they take effect to avoid that uh, circumstance. And I know that, that, uh, that um, difficulty can occur. So that's where we are. Um, we believe it is important, um, it is in the national interest uh, to provide certainty and protection if, if we have um, uh, the sorts of uh, uh, or disastrous, it could have been far worse of course, events that occurred in respect to um, um, uh, the uh, equine uh, uh, disease outbreak uh, um, of some, I think, 18 months, two years ago. So I'd urge the Senate to support the legislation. There's still a great deal more work to do, obviously, um, uh, but um, um, as I've indicated on behalf of my Minister Burke and knowing him as I do, um, uh, the intent to consult, the timetable, the thoroughness, the extent of the organisations, the issues, the opportunity for Senate to disallow prior to the regulations uh, coming into effect, all of those assurances I've given on behalf of the government and on behalf of the minister, it will happen. Um, and I know the, the Minister is very, very serious indeed to ensure that all of this will happen, um, and I'd urge the Senate to, uh, to pass this legislation. Um, as I say, in conclusion, the principles, the approach that's being taken is, is, uh, is no different from uh, what's occurred over the last couple of decades. If anything, the, the sorts of circumstances and the need for this levy um, uh, are very, very significant and they're serious, um, and let's hope we don't face um, uh, outbreaks of disease that we saw 18 months ago. So I would urge the Senate to support the legislation and uh, will no doubt have an opportunity, if, if senators wanted, to debate the regulations before they come into effect. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. Horse Disease Response Levy Bill 2008, Horse Disease Response Levy Collection Bill 2008 and Horse Disease Response Levy Consequential Amendments Bill 2008. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Those of that opinion, Senator Xenophon. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, um, I'm grateful to, to the uh, to the minister for his response. Uh, there's one issue I just want to clarify. Uh, my concern all along has been that there is, uh, firstly, uh, not only adequate consultation but adequate scrutiny, uh, a mechanism to to scrutinise uh, any regulations that have been made, and that there is a an opportunity for the disallowance of these regulations. Uh, before they actually come into effect, and given the context of this this bill, that it's about cost recovery in the event of, a, of an outbreak, or cost recovery for for, uh, for an EI outbreak, then I think it's important that there's that safeguard. So I'm grateful to the to uh, to the minister for his response. Uh, I d I do raise uh, uh, an issue, and I may need to get advice from from the clerk's office or from the deputy clerk in relation to this. But if the government makes an undertaking. Uh, that, that the regulations uh, sit on the table for a certain period, and I think we need to determine that. Um, does there need to be an amendment to the legislation to put that into effect, or will the undertaking in itself be sufficient uh, in the context of this particular, uh, these particular regulations? In other words, if um, uh, in, in its current form, my understanding is that the regulations actually 
uh, uh, take, take effect from the time that they're, they're proclaimed or the, the, the time they're enacted uh, under the Legislative Instruments Act uh, doesn't need a statutory modification so that uh, there can be a, a sufficient period to consider the regulations uh, prior to their, uh, their coming into force. Uh, and in terms of an adequate time, uh, time frame, um, does the government have a, a position in relation to that? Uh, I would have thought that a reasonable time frame, and I, I don't know what uh, uh, I look forward to hearing from, my, uh, from Senator Colbeck uh, in relation to his view on this, that something like eight sitting days would give that two-week window uh, in order for uh, uh, there to be appropriate scrutiny by the Senate. Minister. Look, I think we, we have two, um, two options, uh, Senator Xenophon. Um, you can accept the word of the minister that the regulations, I'm, I'm advised, the regulations can be, um, uh, can be worded um, uh, such that they don't take effect until the Senate has a, uh, an opportunity to disallow, or there could be an amendment to the, the primary bill. I would urge you to, to accept the word of the, of the minister. Um, uh, you know, I'd point out there are consequences if, if the minister, having given on the record an undertaking, is breached. There are consequences, and I think we'd all be aware of that. I think um, an obvious breach of, uh, of trust um, uh, you would obviously take into account um, uh, in your dealings uh, with the minister, and I'm very confident that won't happen. The minister's given that assurance, and I'm happy to place it on the record on behalf of the government. Senator Zanderfall. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, if I can make it absolutely clear, this is not a question of uh, not taking the minister's word. It was actually a, a technical procedural question uh, as to whether there was any uh, uh, impediment, uh, drafting impediment, and, and uh, I'm grateful to the minister for clarifying that. So that leaves one final issue uh, for me in relation to this, uh, one final obstacle, one final hurdle, if I can say, uh, in relation to this bill, uh, that in terms of the number of days. Uh, for the Senate to, to consider this as part of the undertaking of the minister, um, does the minister would the minister uh, is, the, is the minister in a position to make an undertaking that eight sitting days would need to elapse before the regulations would come into force from the time they are tabled uh, in the Senate? Minister, um, look in principle, I, uh, eight days seems reasonable. Um, we're not aware, certainly the staff are here, whether there's any technical um, issues around that, but um, uh, we're certainly, um, within, within any technical requirements, um, willing to indicate there will be at least eight days for the Senate to consider to disallow. Sitting days, obviously. Senator Xenophon. Without appearing, Mr. Chair, without appearing to be a pesky suburban solicitor, which is my background, uh, uh, I, I accept in good faith what the minister is saying. But I, I just want to make sure that there isn't some technical impediment that, despite the good faith of the minister, would prevent that undertaking from coming into force. So it's not a question of the minister not acting in good faith. I, I understand that. But uh, is the minister in a position to advise uh, uh, firmly, clearly, that? There will be eight sitting days, and if that's the case, uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, that hurdle has been removed. Minister. Look, I am advised um, by an extraordinary reliable source um, that it is technically possible. Um, my uh, advisers um, um, uh, here presently are not technical drafters from the department, but I'll double, I, I will attempt to confirm the extraordinary reliable Senate staff. Um, uh, but um, uh, yes, I, I can't. Uh, I believe I can't indicate beyond that, but we'll, we'll double check with the, um, the, the drafting uh, section of the, uh, of the AGs. 
The question is, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, just, just a couple of points in respect to, um, to where we're at. And, and I um, uh, respect the, uh, the views put forward by Senator Xenophon, and, uh, and I'm happy with the eight-day uh, period that he's asking for. So if that can be clarified, um, certainly the opposition would appreciate that. But just some questions. Um, unfortunately, um, as appears to be uh, becoming a common trait of the government, uh, there is apparently some deal that's been negotiated with the Greens the, uh, and the Independents, which the op opposition hasn't been uh, let in on. Uh, and my understanding of that, and uh, again because we haven't formally been given advice by the government, uh, it is hearsay that. Uh, one, part of the approach that the government is taking is to narrow the base of uh, the proposed levy by placing a, um, a cap under which the levy won't be charged. My understanding is that, that uh, someone who's a breeder under uh, 20 horses or 20 registrations, perhaps the minister can clarify that for me, um, won't be levied. Uh, under the proposals that are a, p a part of the deal or the secret deal between the Greens and uh, the government and the independents. So uh, we would like some advice as to how far the, the base might be narrowed and uh, what the impact on the potential levy costs to those that are left paying the uh, levy may be. Minister. Yeah, thanks. Look, I, I can say, I suspect Senator Xenophon would want to say it too, that there's no deal or agreement between the independents, the Greens and the government on a sort of minimum threshold figure that you suggested of 20 uh, for a levy period event. There's no deal. I mean, there's been information provided to the Senate committee, as I understand, around the minimum threshold and, and uh, examples of a minimum threshold for practical administrative purposes, for obvious reasons. You know, an event could have um, um, you know, two horses, I suppose, at, at the barest minimum, and is it practical to levy in those circumstances? So um, no, no deal, um, no agreement with the miners or the, or, the, um, or the Greens on this matter. Senator Colbeck. Thanks, Chair. Um, uh, I can only take the Minister's word for it, but that's not what, how it's been put to me, so uh, we can um, uh, only take that as it's been placed. So are we looking at um, the scope of the potential levy remaining as it was initially, uh, or is there some threshold that's going to be put in place? Is, uh, can the minister give, give us some advice as to what that might be? Um, and I just want to make one comment before I go. I, noticed in Senator O'Brien's comments with respect of regulations being available to Senate committees and or the Senate prior to um, passing legislation. And uh, as I did in the previous piece of legislation, I did acknowledge that uh, previous practice has not been to provide legis uh, regulations uh, as part of the legislative process. Uh, a number of members of, of uh, number of senators on both sides of the chamber over a period of time expressed frustration with that. Uh, but I do note that the government has, on occasion, uh, one occasion in particular with the <coughs> PBS cost recovery bill, which is a very similar process to this one, they did decide to provide to the um, to the committee involved the regulations so that they could be considered by, by the committee. So while um, Senator O'Brien did make comment about that uh, in, in a very similar set of circumstances under another piece of legislation, and this is more a comment than anything else, I understand. 
the, the government had, has made uh, the regulations available so that they were, uh, there was time um, and, and there in fact was scrutiny by the Senate committee before it came before the Senate. Minister. Yeah, look, I thank Senator Cobb Beck for his observations. Specifically, I'm advised that around this threshold issue, there was no specific proposal by the department or the government. There was no specific proposal about a minimum uh, threshold. Um, what was given were some examples about um, how uh, an approach would need to be taken to have a minimum threshold. It may be five, it may be ten, it may be twenty. There's been no proposal, um, a specific proposal put on the table. It is a matter still for discussion and negotiation and consultation. Senator Fielding. Thank you, Chair. Uh, interesting discussion, isn't it? Uh, um, there's been a fair bit of uh, debate about uh, independence. Well, I'm family first. I'm not an independent. I actually belong to a party. And uh, the government needs to do a bit more work on this one, I think. Um, there's no way that a family that owns a horse as a pet should be hit. And you can say that you can be covered in the regulations. It's a yes, no answer to those. We should have them. We had this debate about the PBS, and frankly, you need to come to the chamber and show us what you're thinking. You heard the Senate inquiry. You know there's genuine concern out there about the number of horses that someone owns. And genuine mum and dad shouldn't be hit with this particular issue. So I'm happy for you to sort of adjourn the debate and come back next week when you've done a bit more work on it, but there's no way. There's no way mums and dads should be hit with this. You need to address the issue. The question, Senator Colbeck. Thanks, uh, and Senator Fielding. I take your admonishment for. Re re um, Referring to uh, your party as, as independents, I, uh, I accept that uh, you do represent a party and I, uh, I place on record my apologies for, for doing that. Um, and I think uh, Senator Fielding's point and, Senator Sh and the Minister's response actually reinforces the concerns that the opposition's had about this legislation and all the regulations all through the process. Um, uh, and it's been... Um, perhaps informative for us to get to this stage and actually get the opportunity to ask these questions uh, and uh, find that although that the impression has been given that there might be something that is going to provide an exemption, that doesn't necessarily exist. So um, I s agree with Senator Fielding that the government really does need to do some, work, more, some more work on this. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that the Senate and the committee could be very well assisted by the provision of the regulations as they did with the PBS cost recovery bill. The question is, Minister. Yeah, just to indicate, um, uh, we won't be adjourning the debate, uh, Senator Fielding. We won't be adjourning the legislation uh, for the obvious reason that I've indicated that there's at least a six-month consultation period um, to go on the regulations. So we're going to put the bill, it'll be defeated, uh, and there'll be a period of uncertainty. Um, you know, I'm not happy with it, but that's, um, that's uh, your decision and obviously the decision of the, um, the Liberal National Party now opposition. I would point out, Senator Fielding, that the process of consideration of a levy, piece, uh, levy bill and then the development of regulations through very intensive consultation is not new. This is not a new approach we're going through in terms of this particular area. Um, but you know, the Liberal National Party have decided um, uh, to abandon this approach after some 20 years of bipartisan support from both the Labor Party, which was opposition, and now, of course, they're in opposition and somewhat opportunistic uh, approach. Um, we'll put the bill to the vote. It seems to me it'll be defeated. Um, and um, we'll see what we come up with in the months or possibly years ahead. And um, you know, um, if we are not in a position to respond, is there, if there's an outbreak, we're not in a position to respond. Uh, Senator Xenophon. Oh, Steve, did you want to go? Oh, Senator Fielding. Uh, Senator yeah, thank you, to uh, Chair. You. Well, look, uh, I don't know how what you what you say to that. I mean, I haven't heard too many of the governments. Uh, Senators really worried about the mums and dads being slugged by this, frankly. And I, I just tend to think there, 
that the regulations for this one, like the PBS, should be tabled. I, I think go through your process, do it as quickly as you can, come up with some draft sort of numbers, and let's let's have a look at it. Let's have a decent debate about it. So, you know, it's it, it's really on your head whether you get this through or not. Senator Xenophon. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, firstly, I think Senator Colbeck uh, talked about some deals done with the Greens and. Uh, 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 and other crossbenchers, I think you refer to us as, as independents, and uh, I think Senator Fielding quite rightly uh, uh, corrected him in relation to that. Can I just assure uh, Senator Colbeck that there has been no deal, there has been no horse trading, any sort of trading whatsoever in relation to this? Well, you know, there, there's some, there's some, there's some, you know, some vague allegation that there has been some deal done. There has been no deal done. I've been entirely transparent in the whole process. Uh, yeah, in relation to. Uh, <laughs> In relation to, in relation to this, I've been entirely transparent. My concern principally has been the appropriate scrutiny of any regulations, um, uh, and that uh, the minister has indicated, uh, in broad terms, that um, that subject to I think some some technical advice, that these regulations will not come into force for a period of eight sitting days. However, I note that the caveat which the minister, in good faith, put to that uh, undertaking, my concern is that it isn't an unequivocal undertaking uh, for, the, for the quite reasonable reasons the minister outlined in terms of uh, getting appropriate advice. It would be my preference that progress be reported uh, pending that specific advice in relation to uh, that undertaking. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll set up and to reiterate my position, I will support uh, this bill, provided that there is an unequivocal undertaking in those terms about the regulations not coming into force for a period of at least eight sitting days of the Senate in order to allow for appropriate scrutiny of those regulations uh, once they have been uh, prepared. Senator Xenophon, uh, were you asking that the uh, bills be, uh, progress be reported because that question has to be put if you have um, I, uh, uh, I, I perhaps I've foreshadowed it rather than simply asking for it at this stage uh, chair and, and thank you for for uh, seeking clarification from me uh, I guess it depends on whether the minister's in a position to um, go further than what he put earlier uh, again accepting I accept what he says in good faith but I also note his uh, caveat about the technical advice, and I accept that, and, I, and I, uh, uh, I accept the circumstances in which there has been a caveat to that advice. Um, if the undertaking is unequivocal, that is my position in order to support the government in relation to this bill. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Minister. Y yes, look, I just indicate um, um, the government's not in a position to agree um, the, uh, with your request, Senator Xenophon. Um, uh, this bill has been around since February last year. February last year. Um, <laughs> a year ago. No, no, I know you weren't here again, but you've been here since J July last year. Um, <laughs> there's been a fair amount of, um, of um, discussion. I mean, the, the well, I, I consider it an extraordinary amount of discussion. We've taken up some time in the chamber today. Um, uh, and uh, if we agreed to your request, and I think, um, and we would have sought out that technical issue and give you a further assurance, it's obviously not going to satisfy Senator Fielding. Uh, so um, uh, we're not inclined to agree to the request. We think, uh, as I say, the matter's been around for a year. Um, you can only consult so far. That's the reality of the world, and the reality of the world is people are not satisfied with the consultation so far. Senator Xenophon. Th thank you, Chair. Can I, can I just make it clear? I, I understand what the minister is saying about the, le the level of consultation. I'm happy with what the minister has said in terms of there being consultation. Uh, the only uh, stumbling block for me was this issue of an undertaking. Um, I've made my position clear, and I accept that if subject to any technical, uh, uh, te technical advice, in a sense, uh, and if the minister gives an undertaking in unequivocal terms, then the government has my support. Uh, that is why uh, I'll, I will move now that uh, progress uh, be reported in order to allow for that, uh, for that to occur. 
The question is that the committee report progress. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. The noes have it. The question is that the bills be agreed to without amendments or requests. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The report from the Committee of the Whole. The Committee has considered that the Horse Disease Response Levy Bill 2008 and two related bills be agreed to. Uh, agreed to them without amendments or requests. The committee be adopted. The question is uh, that that uh, motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. I move the bills be read a third time. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Ayes have it. The revision required. Ring the bells.
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the bills be read a third time. Those of that opinion, uh, the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator O'Brien, teller for the ayes, and Senator Bushby, teller for the noes. Order. The result of the division being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. It being 6.50 p.m. or just past, uh, we move to the consideration of government documents on today's notice paper, or today's red. Would senators uh, not wishing to partake in the consideration of government documents uh, please leave the chamber quietly? The documents will be considered uh, in number order on uh, page five of today's Senate Red. Do I have anyone wishing to consider document number one? Document number two? Document number three? Document number four? Document number five? Document number six? Document number seven. Document number eight. Document number nine. There being no documents uh, to consider, uh, we, I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Wortley. Sorry, Senator, I couldn't see with all those senators in front of you. So, Senator Wortley. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. <laughs> Acting Deputy President, I rise today to speak on the importance of wetlands to our nation. Hailing from our nation's thirstiest state, South Australia, drought, heat and the closing peril that is climate change are never far from my mind. Even over the past week or so, my home state has endured record temperatures 
and yet another unrelenting heat wave. Such heat waves seem commonplace in South Australia these days. Each year they are more extreme, more unforgiving. Scorching an already arid land, wiping out crops, gardens and threatening wildlife, and even putting human lives at risk. As I left South Australia during this most recent hot spell to come to Canberra for this parliamentary sitting, I was struck by the fact I was flying over such a parched land on World Wetlands Day. This day is celebrated each year on 2 February to mark the anniversary of the signing of the Convention on Wetlands of International Importance in Ramsar, Iran in 1971. World Wetlands Day was first celebrated in 1997. Since then, government agencies, non-government organisations and community groups have recognised it by working to raise awareness of wetland benefits and to promote the conservation of wetlands. We know that sustainable river basin management is extremely important to maintain the functions and ecosystems services of a wetland. And World Wetlands Day aims to raise awareness about ways in which communities can support river health and how the action of those upstream affect those downstream. Mr Acting Deputy President, Australia was one of the first nations to sign the Ramsar Convention and designated the world's first wetland of international importance, the Coburg, Coburg Peninsula Aboriginal Land and Wildlife Sanctuary in the Northern Territory in 1974. Today, Australia has 65 wetlands classified as being of international importance and covering an area of approximately 7.5 million hectares. We have come to understand that wetlands are vital to the health of our environment. They provide a habitat for plants and animals, and they may have cultural significance and provide recreational environment. They help control flooding by absorbing water during heavy rainfall and slowly releasing it back into the ecosystem. And they can help stop erosion through the plants they host. They also help to purify water quality by processing nutrients, any suspended materials and pollutants. Not surprisingly, therefore, the Rudd Labor government is committed to the protection of these precious resources. Among our pledges to this cause is a $400,000 rolling review program under development for Australia's Ramsar estate. Also, more than $10 million has been committed for 2008-2009 towards wetland projects through the Caring for Our Country initiative. Around Australia, 16 open grant projects worth more than $3.6 million and 76 community coast care projects valued at more than 6.5 million have benefited from this money. Unfortunately, Acting Deputy President, our predecessors were not so committed to the survival and expansion of our nation's wetlands. In fact, a report that reviewed the management of Australia's Ramsar wetlands, the Ramsar Snapshot Study Report, by the previous government is a tale of woe, of inaction and poor administration. The Ramsar Snapshot Study Report looks at the management and status of the 65 Australian Ramsar sites up to the end of 2007, and the results make for disheartening reading. The Environment Minister, Peter Garrett, has rightfully called this document a damning indictment of the former government. He said, and I quote, This study shows just how much the Howard government and Malcolm Turnbull, as Environment Minister, took their eye off the ball when it came to the management and protection of our internationally recognised wetlands, including the Coorong. Page after page highlights the serious ecological and management issues and challenges regarding Australia's Ramsar Convention administration the failures of the past 
and suggests a number of areas where implementation of the Ramsar Convention in Australia can be improved. Deficiency after deficiency is noted, and many of the report's recommendations are listed as absolute priorities. Since receiving the report last year, the Department of Environment, Water, Heritage and the Arts has been working with state and territories through a wetlands task force to address the, ports, the report's important recommendations. This show of leadership from the Commonwealth is crucial, as its principal role regarding wetlands is in coordination and management funding, while also liaising with the Ramsar Secretariat. Under the Ramsar Management Planning Program, the Australian government is providing more than 4.5 million over four years to develop and update documentation, including management plans, ecological descriptions and information sheets. Of course, water management and use is a key threat to a number of wetland sites. So, as part of the government's $12.9 billion Water for the Future plan, we are buying water allocations from willing sellers to put back into the environment. Funding has also been allotted to the Living Murray Initiative to boost environmental flows and improvements at River Murray locations, including six Ramsar sites. So, while the former government denied, delayed and deferred, the Rudd government has embraced this report as a cornerstone on which we can build protection for our precious wetlands and meet our obligations as a party to the Ramsar Convention. Many challenges remain as we aim to better manage our wetlands in the face of dangerous and debilitating climate change and drought. But we have already taken important steps down that path through our investment into the restoration of the health of our river, rivers and waterways. We are committed to work for a more effective, efficient and targeted approach to the conservation of our wetlands. We are not afraid of the hard work needed because we know this is too important to our environment and to our future. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Tonight I seek to air and give public exposure to a social phenomenon in our society which deserves our support as a community. I speak of the growing trend of grandparents raising their grandchildren. In my home state of Tasmania, 7 per cent of primary carers of children are in fact grandparents. In recent times I came across two ladies in this situation. They were kind enough to share their stories with me over a cup of coffee at the kitchen table. From that discussion, we agreed to have a further meeting with others in the same situation. That meeting was held at my office just before Christmas. I was delighted that my colleague, Senator Stephen Parry, was able to spend the time to hear these grandparents' stories as well. When I say grandparents, it was in fact seven grandmothers, six of whom were looking after a child of their daughter and, in just one case, it was the child of a son. The shocking statistic is that all seven children of these grandmothers couldn't look after their children because of substance abuse. So, as an aside, can I say to those who would go soft on drugs, look not only at the so-called personal freedom and civil liberties arguments, but look further afield, and the social devastation and consequences will overwhelm you into changing your attitude. For the person concerned who can't bring up their own flesh and blood, there must be a great sense of personal ineptitude and guilt. For the child who grows up thinking and believing their parents were unfit or unwilling to look after them, the impact on personality, on personal development, social interaction and general health and well-being must be profound. And of course, then there are the grandparents who pick up the pieces at great personal sacrifice, but done out of love and commitment. These grandmothers who thought their child-rearing days were behind them and they could move to the phase of spoiling their grandchildren and then handing them back are robbed of them. There is also the wider family issue of how siblings interact 
and the other children interact with their parents because of the time, money and effort put into one sibling and their child or children as opposed to the other children and grandchildren. In brief, the social consequences are immense and the pressure on the grandparents enormous. Right or wrong, the fact is that the burden seems to fall disproportionately on the grandmother, often alienating and upsetting the grandfather, leading sometimes to marital breakdown after decades of marriage or bouts of depression. In the midst of this personal, family and social turmoil, I ask, what support do we give these grandparents? The unfortunate answer is pretty well, not much. My call this evening in a non-partisan request is for all of us to do better as a community in providing support for these champions. The first issue is usually the cost of legal representation. If you are a pensioner who owns your own home or a self-funded retiree, you could well end up with a legal bill of $30,000 because you won't qualify for legal aid. And here is the perverse nature of how we transact this business. The child, and in the cases that Senator Parry and I saw, all drug impacted got legal aid. And because of their unsatisfactory interaction with their lawyers, often adjournments are sought. They don't turn up or they make ridiculous claims, all of which mean costly legal delays which financially bleed the grandparents. And the legal proceedings these grandparents involve themselves in is for one simple purpose, the best interests of their grandchild, their grandchild's safety and stability of home environment, to mention two. We expect the grandparents to pay for their legal costs and fund as a community the drug-impacted parent. That is neither fair nor just nor within the best interests of the child. And for the seven grandmothers, the issues also brought police involvement in their actual homes. And for all of them, it was their first time ever with horrendous consequences of, and feeling of public embarrassment and humiliation, especially amongst neighbours. If the grandmother gains an order, what I understand is for the status of a kinship carer in my home state of Tasmania, the grandparent is rewarded with a princely sum of $2 to help with the grandchild's expenses. That's $2 per day. If, on the other hand, the grandparents were to refuse to take on the grandchild, the grandchild becomes a ward of the state, a result which has a great impact on society at large and, overwhelmingly, not in the best interests of the child. Yet if this same grandparent were to foster care another child, or indeed their own grandchild, the taxpayer would pay out literally hundreds of dollars per week to assist with the costs of raising the child. So we have a built-in disincentive for grandparents to look after their grandchildren, not only through the legal aid system, but through the social security support payments as well. Now I understand in that mendicant state that is New South Wales, there is a glimmer of good government, as I am advised that grandparents are actually paid as foster carers. I say, well done. And for those grandparents not of age pension age who might be receiving other welfare payments, the welfare to work rules kick in. Now, I'm a strong supporter of welfare to work and the philosophy that underpins that scheme. If you can work and be gainfully employed, you should not be a burden to your fellow Australians. But it does become quite counterproductive for society if we exempt foster carers from the responsibilities of welfare to work because of their good work in caring for children in need, but don't exempt grandparents looking after their own grandchildren doing essentially exactly the same task, in fact, might I add, a much harder task due to the emotional trauma. I have sought to highlight just some of the problems these wonderful grandmothers face in trying to do the best and right thing by their grandchildren. I don't pretend to have the answers, but some support should be considered in the following areas. Counselling sessions for grandparents to deal with their often dysfunctional grandchildren who suffer from an array of issues, including attachment disorder. Legal aid being offered to grandparents or legal aid being severely restricted to the other party to ensure legal costs don't escalate and get out of control and financially crippling the grandparents. 
Any support provided for grandchildren should not be impacted by an ordinary means test on the grandparents, which does not apply if the children in their care were unrelated foster children. Grandparents should be exempted, like foster carers, from welfare to work obligations. Grandparents should automatically be considered as foster carers for the purposes of benefits. Centrelink should have designated officers who have a genuine understanding of grandparents' issues, and provision of some organised holiday camps not only by way of respite for their grandparents but for the children themselves to learn they are not alone in this world in living with their grandparents. Again, I say thank you to the seven grandmothers who were so willing and, hope, uh, and open in sharing their stories with Senator Parry and myself, and who also assisted me in constructing uh, tonight's speech. I hope my contribution this evening will add to the public support that these people need and deserve. I trust in due course we might be able to get a response to ensure that these wonderful grandparents are properly supported and sustained by society, not only for their sake but for the sake of the grandchildren, and to ensure that any cycles that might otherwise develop can be broken and early intervention can ensure that these grandchildren are given the very best possible start in life. I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Betts. Senator Stirl. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I, I only have a short time, but I do want to utilise this time to actually brag about the wonderful visit that I paid last week to the uh, Apprenticeship and Trade College for Southern Perth in, of course, Western Australia. I was accompanied on that visit by the Hon. Alana McTinnon, MLA member for Armidale. And it was a good news visit, it really was. And there, when we got there, we were met by Mr Rod Slater, who is the chairman of the uh, of the college, Perth South, and Mr. Trevor Williams, the principal. And the visit for our, for our, or oh, the reason for our visit, Mr. Acting Deputy President, is that the uh, government under uh, Ms. Gillard had, uh, or the Deputy Prime Minister, had actually committed to keeping the former Australian Technical College open, and converting it now to be known as the Apprenticeship and Trade College South Perth, which has a campus in Armidale, of course, and also in Maddington, in the federal seat of Hasluck. Before I go any further, Mr Acting Deputy President, I do really want to spend the short time that I have allotted to me to talk about the wonderful young students that uh, Ms McTean and the member for, MLA, uh, the member for uh, Armidale and myself met. They're at that stage, there, was five young, there were five young men, as you realise uh, a lot of them are still on holidays. With the funding, extra funding and commitment from the federal government, it, will now, it has now guaranteed of a full and healthy life. I think it's catering for some 363 students. The beauty of this college is that uh, it is also going to become a registered training organisation and it's offering certificate three-level courses in skills shortage areas including automotive building and construction, metal and engineering and electrotechnology. And the college also plans to commence operations as a group training organisation. <clears throat> now just a quick uh, demographic view of Armidale. Armidale is in the foothills of Western Australia. It is a very uh, very solid working class area, but it is distance from Perth. To have this college, uh, this, this, tra this uh, trade college, now guaranteed of a full life in their brand new building is a wonderful story. But uh, the five students that we did meet, Mr Acting Deputy President, were five very fine young men who certainly told their representative members of parliament what they thought on all things ranging from the skill shortage to their apprenticeship to why didn't they have a skate park in the town of Armidale, of which the member for Armidale said, well, you'll have to talk to the new government. It was on our list at the last election, so we hope that it still gets delivered. So, but as with well, Senator Ronson, I'll take that because when we talk about skills and training, I know it's very touchy for your side of the chamber over there because you did sit there with your hands tied firmly behind your back for all those years of boom and were caught asleep at the wheel. And fortunately, we won't be doing the same as your lot. Now, these five students that I met, Mr. Acting Deputy President, I will name them. Uh, fine young Australians, Andrew Spence from Kelmscott, who is studying bricklaying, and Stephen McCarr from Armidale, also studying bricklaying. Uh, the boys were very proudly took uh, uh, Miss McTinnon and myself out the back to show us their walls that they had constructed. And I said, well, I couldn't leave here, boys. Being half Italian, you better give me a spirit level and I'll see how well you've done. 
because concrete's in, uh, in our breeding. And certainly those walls were perfect. I have to confess, I said to the boys, how do you do that? Because every time I do one, I've got the lumpy concrete and makes one end of the wall stick up higher than the other. Um, then I, uh, we met with uh, Rhys Elliott from Mount Nasuru, which is a suburb around Armidale, and uh, he's studying steel framing. These other two fine young Australians, Kenan Beaumont from Lockridge. Now, just for those who don't know, Lockridge is a suburb some hour and a half away from Armidale, who trains and buses every day to go to the college because of the opportunity that, uh, that he is um, given to, to do his uh, certificate three up there. Uh, he's doing steel framing, and Jordan Manderson from Brookdale studying cabinet making. Now, Mr. Acting Deputy President, some of the projects that we were shown, apart from the brick walls, was a very fine cubby house. And this cubby house, I kid you not, is uh, probably the size of a one-bedroom, one-bathroom flat in, um, in uh, uh, Canberra. And quite clearly, this sort of project, you, would, you could not believe that this project was put together by students in their first year. It was absolutely amazing to the point where I know that the minister, uh, sorry, the minister, she was the minister, the member for Armidale uh, was actually trying to do a barter job and buy it off them for her grandchildren, where I made the statement that I'm glad that, or I wish that Cubby House was around when I was a young bloke in my early years of marriage because I probably would have spent more time living in that when my wife uh, decided that uh, that's probably where I would have been better living for a few months. But anyway, it was a fine, it was a fine visit. It was a great announcement from the federal government. The federal government has to be congratulated. Like I said, we will do everything we can. We will never, ever, ever, ever sit on our hands and watch this or preside over the greatest school shortage in Australia's short history. That won't happen. Uh, we've made that very clear. Oh, well, Mr Acting Deputy President, I really, really thank the senators opposite for their interjections, because I will start naming some of you fine senators over there who were part of the last government who sat on your collective hands and presided over the greatest school shortage in history, Senator Bernardi from South Australia. Yes, great. You should be very proud. I'm proud of what our government's doing. I'm proud of the announcement. I'm proud for the people of Armidale and all those students who have the opportunity to go to this to this training centre to learn their skills, and they're actually being paid a training wage as well. It is fantastic. And when they come out of there, they will have their first year of their apprenticeship. They will be job ready. The uh, training centre will also be, as I said, a registered training organisation, host employers. They won't be just thrown out in the scrap heap, fooling people that everyone who lives in Perth that the streets are painted with gold or covered in gold. Go west, young man, and you'll be rich, but we're not going to spend as a government any money in training. We'll never do that. So on that, Mr Acting Deputy President, I commend them. I commend Mr Slater as the chairman. I commend Trevor Williams as the principal. They were so very, very proud of the uh, Rudd Labor government's uh, announcement to keep them going and to uh, do everything they could to continue the growth in skills training. It was so well. Senator Ronaldson, you, Senator Ronaldson, are probably the last one that will want to have a crack at me when I'm talking about skills training because you were not in the first term of your parliamentary career with the Howard government when you sat there and followed every vote that took away skills training or didn't contribute to any skills training. So, Senator Ronaldson from Victoria, be very mindful of who you're having a crack at and why you might be having a crack. It was quite poor interjection. But, Mr Acting Deputy President, I really would like to sit there and say that uh, um, collectively between the member for Armidale and myself, who were consistently and continually um, uh, lobbying for the continuation of this college and uncertainty for this college, but one has to own up and confess that the hard work was actually done by that fine member for Hazlitt. Ms Sharon Jackson, and I can say very clearly, Jack and I go back, if I may say that, a long, long way. You would not find a greater uh, a convicted person convicted. for young workers and convicted. young Australians than Ms Jackson, the member for Hasluck. And I've got to tell you, if any of you lot, through you, Mr Acting Deputy President, had one ounce of dignity in true, your yeah. veins when it comes to training or employees, you could stand up there, you could take bragging rights, but unfortunately you don't. None of you, not one of you. So the best thing you can do is sit back, acknowledge what has been done, that fine member for Hasluck, who, who is so welcomed back. Thank goodness we got Sharon Jackson back as the member for Hasluck because in her short term, in her second short term, 
What a wonderful job she has done on behalf of her constituents in the seat of Hasluck. So well done, Ms. Jackson. Congratulations. And if we had a few more, <coughs> a few more hard-working, diligent members mm, like uh, the member for Hasluck, when your lot were in uh, were in government, Mr. Acting Deputy President, not your lot, that lot. We wouldn't have had to sit back and witness the greatest debacle in schools training at the, through all those boom years in Western Australia. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Senator Bernardi. I rise tonight to, uh, to pass comment on um, a recent article appearing in the monthly magazine by uh, Mr Kevin Rudd entitled The Global Financial Crisis. Now, Mr Rudd, I think, um, uh, is clearly acting out uh, a scene from Joseph's Technicolor dream coat because he has a coat that has changed colours in accordance with his political philosophy as it's accorded over the time. Because if we remember that Mr Rudd firstly described himself as an old-fashioned Christian socialist when his coat was bright red and he was happy to be known as a Christian socialist, but in order to win government he decided to turn it into a deep blue coat and say he was an economic conservative. And right now he's in that, that no man's land of social democrats, so his coat is somewhat pink. But in this, this rather eclectic um, uh, article, which I'm sure Mr Rudd uh, wasn't responsible for himself, otherwise he wouldn't quite contradict himself so many times, he's really taken an amazing array of views and different perspectives. In his railing against capitalism and his, his creation of a, of a new political philosophy called neoliberalism, which uh, he's been unable to explain in any coherent manner, he has absolutely attacked the operation of the free market. Now, he's done this in any number of ways by justifying, by justifying that it's failed and is responsible for the current economic crisis that not only Australia but many parts of the world are confronted with now. And there is no denying there is an economic crisis. However, the conclusions that Mr Rudd has drawn are completely false because he has said, he has said that it is the intervention in his essay that is the intervention of the US Federal Reserve Bank that into uh, propping up and supporting investors after previous crises that have allowed it to build. Now, Mr. Rudd, according to Mr. Rudd's logic, the intervention by government then was wrong. It was wrong, and it is responsible for the problems that we face now. How is that then an, a, a, an attack on the free market, on letting markets work themselves out and work out excesses in the system with a minimum of pain? I agree with Mr. Rudd. It's not often I can say that, but I agree with him that the intervention by government into the operation of the free market sustained bubbles that were caused, uh, that were the, the, the uh, product of irrational exuberance or overenthusiasm. But it was government intervention that actually sustained this and put off what I call Financial Reckoning Day. And had we dealt with Financial Reckoning Day at the time of these bubbles, or of these parts of irrational exuberance, then we wouldn't be confronted with the monumental problem that we have today. It is not a failure of the free market. It is an endorsement of the fact that governments should actually stay out of inter interfering with, uh, with when markets get completely out of kilter. They need to have a regulatory framework, like we have in Australia, which is sufficient and adequate, and that's why Australia has prospered for 16 years until, um, until coincidentally, the Rudd government has come to power. But Mr Rudd has got even more conflicts there. On one hand, he's, claimed, he's quoting George Soros as the font of some wisdom by saying the current crisis um, is the culmination of a 30-year domination of economic policy. And he says that the salient feature of the current financial crisis is that it was not caused by some external shock. That's Mr. Soros that's saying that. And yet later on in his essay, later on in his essay, Mr. Rudd attacks those who are allowed to have unfettered um, attack on, on uh, say, a currency. Now, Mr. Rudd may have forgotten that Mr. Soros made over a billion dollars, a billion dollars when a billion dollars was a real serious amount of money made a billion dollars speculating against the, the collapse of the British pound. He made a billion dollars out of that. But now he's the expert that Mr Rudd wants to quote. It's an appalling, an appalling display of a man that doesn't know really what he is and actually what he believes in. It is a shame to see a Prime Minister 
desperate, so desperate to, to give himself some economic credibility that while the rest of Australia is considering how they're going to go work through this trouble, Mr Rudd is talking about a global new world order in which, in which you know, government is going to play the role and subvert the individual. Mr Rudd further obviously hasn't done um, quite as much research as he should because he, he talks about a new Keynesian economics. And, and John Maynard Keynes, for, for those who are not familiar with Mr Keynes, was an economist um, in the 20s and 30s who uh, was widely discredited um, because uh, his, his theories um, of money, supply and credit um, haven't worked particularly effectively. Now, Mr Rudd, Mr. Rudd quotes uh, uh, in his essay says that uh, Keynes and I quote, himself a successful speculator. Now I take a bit of difficulty with that because Mr Keynes uh, himself, um, I'm advised by my research, actually uh, lost nearly everything um, on a couple of occasions through speculating in the financial markets. And further, his advice uh, led to some of his friends actually going broke as well. Now, if, if, Mr. Rudd, if Mr Rudd is going to take advice from, from someone who made a billion dollars from speculating, against, uh, speculating in a market that Mr Rudd doesn't endorse, and then he's going to take advice from someone who not only went broke a couple of times himself but, but um, uh, uh, ensured that his friends went broke. I question the wisdom of this bloke, of this man, this man who is actually leading our government now. Um, further, further, Mr Rudd comes back to the regulatory, the regulatory framework that is in place. Now there is no question, no question at all, that in some markets and in some economies, uh, the regulatory framework has not, has, been, has not been as robust and as strong as it has been here in Australia. And the regulatory framework that we have in Australia is a credit to the previous government, I have to say. And I think we have to acknowledge that APRA has worked very effectively. Our banks are in a very solid position, um, and, uh, and we are not facing quite the same level of crises that, say, America has. But in the same token, Mr Rudd refuses to pay credit to the 16 years of, of prosperity. That was uh, a large part of that was driven under the Howard government. But he's prepared to pay credit to Mr Keating and Mr Hawke's government, which ran from 1983 to 1996. But in the same breath, in the same breath, Mr Rudd, in his essay, attacks and says there are so many examples of where unfettered capitalism has failed, and he gives the 1987 stock market crash as an example. Gee, whose watch did that fall under? If Mr Rudd wants to be consistent, let him condemn the Hawke and Keating governments for the 1987 stock market crash. It's preposterous. It's preposterous to say that the neo-capitalism or neo-liberalism is responsible for all this, and yet Hawke and Keating got it right. What about the what about the uh, the Mexican peso crisis of I think 1992? Mr. Rudd mentions that as well. Whose watch was that under? Whose watch was it under? It was under Mr. Keating's. And yet somehow Mr. Keating is absolved of any blame. The Gulf War even gets a mention in Mr. Rudd's treaties on what's wrong with the world. I mean, this is a preposterous, a ridiculous. And it's a humiliating attempt by Mr Rudd to define himself as some global player in the economic stage. Quite frankly, quite frankly, this is a guy that is bereft of ideas. He is happy to throw money, he is happy to throw money everywhere which way he can in the hope of staving off, staving off a problem that this country faces, and yet, and yet he's given no consideration, no consideration to targeting those funds effectively. This is a great disappointment for the people of Australia, and I think I speak for many of them, because Mr Rudd is preoccupied with trying to elevate his standing in the global community. He's been hanging by the phone waiting for a phone call from Mr Obama, which you know, uh, coincidentally appeared in the press, I suppose, the day he got it. This is a man that, that is more intent, more intent on trying to demonstrate his intellectual prowess, but unfortunately it's come unstuck for him because of his com conflicts. It's humiliating, it's disappointing, and it's very, a very sad day for the, for the uh, Australian uh, population. Senator uh, Barnett. Yes, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
There's no better day than today to announce to the Senate the recent launch of the www.laborwaste.com website. This was recently launched by the Hon. Malcolm Turnbull, Federal Opposition Leader in Launceston. Why do I say today is such an important day? Well, today, yes, we have announced our opposition to the uh, Federal Labor Government's $42 billion expenditure package. Because, because it's wrong, it's a dud, and they're throwing confetti around like never seen before. They're throwing money around like confetti like never seen before. Uh, the Prime Minister wanted uh, us to approve this within 48 hours. That's uh, about a billion dollars an hour for consideration of this legislation. It's poorly targeted, ill thought through and irresponsible. So, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, in regard to this website, I thank the leader, Malcolm Turnbull, for spending time uh, with us in Tasmania to make this happen. This followed a meeting um, regarding important issues with the Launceston City Council. Now, the Labor Waste Committee is an important part of the coalition's commitment to holding the Rudd Labor government to account uh, for the way it spends and manages taxpayers' money. Uh, as Mr Turnbull said, now more than ever, every single dollar of government spending must be used as effectively and efficiently as possible and directed towards maximising jobs and economic growth. We will be targeting um, labour waste, inefficiency and mismanagement. And we will find that out. Already we've found out and identified examples which include the $13 million grocery choice website, which to date, that's right, Senator Williams, an absolute dud, absolute dud, a total waste of taxpayers' money. Um, and uh, they have been found out, and uh, we will find you out. This website, labourwaste.com, it provides examples of labour waste and opportunity for members of the community to tip off examples of uh, government waste inefficiency and mismanagement. And I'm very pleased to be joined uh, with by members of the committee, Senators uh, Michaela Cash, Senator Mitch Fifield, uh, Mr Alex Hawke MP, Paul Neville MP and Senator Scott Ryan. And we will be working very hard um, in terms of identifying uh, that labour waste. Some of the other examples include uh, the Rudd hypocrisy on staff rises, highlighted by Senator Michael Ronaldson very recently, where the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd secretly gave pay rises to two of his own key staff members, including his chief of staff, while at the same time calling on workers to defer their own requests for pay rises in a staggering case of double standards. It seems that what's good for the goose isn't good enough for the gander. So, You've seen the taxpayers footing the uh, Garno publishing uh, costs. The Department of Climate Change was forced to pay $65,000 in taxpayers' funds to purchase copies of the Garno report after the Rudd government awarded the publishing contract to publishing to uh, Cambridge University Press. Despite copies of the report being for sale in bookshops, the taxpayer will receive nothing from the agreement. And then you've seen the uh, computers in schools fiasco. The cost of Labor's computers in schools programs blown out 66 per cent. Uh, but even with this $800 million increase, Labor will still fail to put a computer on every desk. And there's more examples. The $28 million to advertise and administer the economic stimulus package prior to Christmas. What a disgrace. The Rudd government spending $146,000 per day on climate change advertising. And then, of course, you've got the 168 reviews, committees and inquiries uh, that have been undertaken to date, and no doubt there's many more. So www.laborwaste.com, we will find you out, and this, we will hold you accountable, the Rudd Labor government. This Senate stands adjourned until tomorrow at 9.30 a.m.